though I have reason to hope our casualties in battle will not exceed 5,000 men. Two after the Battle of Sharpsburg, on September 21, he wrote more fully, as follows, a great many men belonging to the army never entered Maryland at all, many returned after getting there, while others who crossed the river kept aloof. The stream has not lessened since crossing the Potomac, though the cavalry has been constantly employed in endeavoring to arrest it. Some immediate legislation, in my opinion, is required, and the most summary punishment should be authorized. It ought to be construed into desertion in face of the enemy, and thus brought under the rules and articles of war. To give you an idea of its extent, in some brigades, I will mention that on the morning after the Battle of the 17th, Gen. Evans reported to me on the field, where he was holding the front position, that he had but 120 of his brigade present, and that the next brigade to his, that of Gen. Garnett, consisted of but 100 men. Gen. Pendleton reported that the brigades of Gens, Lawton and Armistead, left to guard the ford at Shepherdstown, together contained but 600 men. This is a woeful condition of affairs. Lawton's brigade had been the largest in the army, and it had carried into action at Gaines Mill, on June 27 3,500 men. It has seemed incredible to many writers that the small forces mentioned in many of the official reports, as engaged at Sharpsburg, could be correctly stated, but I am satisfied from my own observations at the time that the following estimate by Colonel Walter H. Taylor, Gen. Lee's adjutant, is essentially correct. Col. Taylor, in his book Four Years with Lee, writes, the following recapitulation is established upon indisputable and contemporaneous authority, being nothing less than the testimony of the commanding officers, as shown by their official reports made at the time. I cannot verify the estimate made for the cavalry and artillery, viz. 8,000 but I am sure it is rather excessive than the reverse. This would make Gen. Lee's entire strength 35,255. It must be noted, also, that the Federal equipment was far superior to that of the Confederates. Not only was their artillery more numerous and with a greater proportion of 20-pound rifles and 12-pounder guns, as against 10-pounder rifles and 6-pounder guns of the Confederates, and with better qualities of projectiles and fuses, but their infantry was almost entirely supplied with rifled muskets, while the Confederate infantry carried about 30% of smooth bore muskets. Per contra, there is a single item, but it is an important one. Not only did McClellan bring upon the field his 87,176 well equipped men, against Lee's 35,255 ragged and poorly equipped, but he brought himself also. Perhaps the anticipation of that fact encouraged Lee to risk the odds, and if so, the event justified his judgment. McClellan not only fought his battle in detail, engaging not more than two of his six corps simultaneously, but he held two of them out of the battle almost entirely. Comma Porter's Fifth Corps with 19,586 men, and Franklin's Sixth with 12,300. The total casualties, in these two corps, 31,886 strong, were but 109 in the Fifth Corps and 439 in the 60th, comma less than were experienced in many single brigades. So when the proper deduction is made from the federal forces for McClellan's presence, and a fair allowance for the disadvantage of the federals in having to take the offensive, all that would otherwise seem incredible about the battle disappears, and it is seen to be both natural and reasonable that the game should result in a draw. For the fighting was of about 47,000 federals attacking 35,000 confederates, under Lee, Jackson, and Longstreet, in a fairly good defensive position. Next to the comparative forces of the combatants, the most important feature of the situation was the topography of the battlefield which Lee had chosen. It was a fairly good one for defense as positions go in a well settled agricultural country, but it was by no means as strong as it is often said to be. The line was somewhat over three miles long, from its left flank on the Potomac to its right at Burnside's Bridge across the Antietam. 
its left flank had an excellent position for defense against cavalry, and it was held by Stuart's cavalry and artillery successfully against the Federal cavalry which was opposed to it. Thence, running southeast about a mile, generally behind fences and across open ground, it crossed the Hagerstown Pike, and became parallel to it and about a quarter of a mile in front of it. At this point the Antietam is about a mile away to the eastward, winding its way a little west of south. After holding these courses for about a mile and a half the turnpike reaches Sharpsburg, the line of battle here being a fourth of a mile in front of the village, and a half mile in rear of the river. Here the pike and the line turn more to the east and unite at Burnside's bridge about a mile away. This bridge is over two miles above the junction of the Antietam with the Potomac. This flank was the weakest part of the line, for the river below was crossable by infantry at several points, and the flank was, therefore, practically in the air. A strong feature of our center was that the Antietam cut in half the ground over which the enemy must maneuver, and would more or less embarrass any infantry attack upon it, but, per contra, there were two ugly features. 1. The country is a rolling one and the hills near the stream are often quite steep, thus giving the enemy fairly close approach under cover. 2. Our whole line except the cavalry on the left was within range of the enemy's rifle guns planted along the high ridges east of the Antietam, beyond the effective range of our guns. Thence, perfectly safe themselves, they practiced upon us at leisure all day. Hunt, the Federal Chief of Artillery, describes the location of ten heavy batteries of the reserve artillery, and says, they overlooked the enemy and swept most of the ground between them and our troops. They were well served, especially the guns of Benjamin's battery. Their field of fire was extensive, and they were usefully employed all day and so constantly that the supply of ammunition for the twenty pounders ran short. As to how our artillery fared in opposition, we may judge from a remark made to me two months later by Col. S. D. Lee, upon my being transferred to the artillery service. Pray that you may never see another Sharpsburg. Sharpsburg was artillery hell. D. H. Hill, in his report, says that he had nearly fifty guns available, and writes, positions were selected for as many of these guns as could be used, but all the ground in my front was commanded by the long-range artillery of the Yankees, on the other side of the Antietam, which concentrated their fire upon every gun that opened and soon disabled it. Whatever the advantages or disadvantages of the field, there was one feature of it which should have been conclusive against giving battle the. That feature was the Potomac River. We were backed up against it, within two miles, and there was no bridge and but a single ford accessible, and that a bad one, rocky and deep. On the Maryland side, a mile of hilltops, some of them beyond the Antietam, offered sites for rifled guns to rake the ford and entirely cut off any retreat, should we meet with a reverse. This single feature of the field should have been conclusive against giving battle the. I believe that Lee would never have done so had he ever before crossed the ford in person. Briefly, the most sanguine hope which Lee could reasonably entertain, with his inferior force, was to fight a drawn battle, and then safely withdraw what was left of his army. Against it he risked its utter destruction, which would have been the speedy end of the Confederacy. Ropes, the best critic and the best informed writer upon the war, comments as follows upon the situation at this time. One this decision to stand and fight at Sharpsburg, which Gen. Lee took on the evening of September 14th, just after, his troops had been driven from the South Mountain Passes, is, beyond controversy, one of the boldest and most hazardous decisions in his whole military career. In truth, it is so bold and so hazardous that one is bewildered that he should even have thought seriously of making it. Nearly the whole force which he had on the north bank of the Potomac had been engaged that afternoon, in an unsuccessful attempt to hold a defensive position, and it had been badly beaten. Of his two principal lieutenants, one, Longstreet, was opposed to this perilous course. Jackson, however, was, as we know, in favor of making a stand at Sharpsburg. 
from a careful study of all the reports upon both sides, not only of the text but between the lines, I believe that the course of Lee was largely influenced by the hope, and that of McClellan by the fear, of events whose improbability surpassed that of an earthquake. To McClellan they evidently seemed, however, easily possible. So much so, that in explaining why he did not renew the battle on September 18, he was not ashamed to give frank expression to his fear as follows. At that critical juncture, I should have had a narrow view of the condition of the country, had I been willing to hazard another battle with less than an absolute assurance of success. At that moment, Virginia lost, Washington menaced, Maryland invaded, the national cause could afford no risk of defeat. One battle lost and almost all would have been lost. Lee's army might then have marched as it pleased on Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, or New York. If McClellan entertained such fears at the close of the battle, must it not have been these fears which made his coming to the battle so slow and deliberate as to allow Lee even superfluous time to make his escape if he wished? Considering the rare opportunity which chance had given him for brilliant and decisive work, he displayed little ambition to be at it, and his conduct was more suggestive of providing a bridge for a flying enemy. Lee's helps were by no means so exaggerated as McClellan's fears. He counted upon no hope from Maryland, until his own army should have demonstrated its ability to maintain itself within the state. He hardly hoped for more than to detain the enemy upon the northern frontier until the approach of winter should render his advance into Virginia difficult, if not impracticable. But he did entertain hopes of a decisive victory here on a field more remote from a safe place of refuge for the enemy than his victories of the Seven Days and of Two D Manassas had been. The hope would have been reasonable had his army been larger and his armament better but under all the circumstances and conditions it was as improbable of realization as the chance of an earthquake would have been. He did, indeed, win a complete victory over all the infantry which the enemy engaged, but their position was more favorable to prevent his making a counter-stroke than was his to resist their attack. Their heavy guns across the anti atam gave him protection, just as at Fredericksburg the Federal artillery on the Stafford Heights, afterward in two battles, safely covered the federal infantry on the opposite shore. Briefly, Lee took a great risk for no chance of gain except the killing of some thousands of his enemy with the loss of, perhaps, two-thirds as many of his own men. That was a losing game for the Confederacy. Its supply of men was limited, that of the enemy was not. That was not war. Yet now, who would have it otherwise? History must be history and could not afford to lose this battle from its records. For the nation is immortal and will forever prize and cherish the record made that day by both sides, as actors in the boldest and the bloodiest battle ever fought upon this continent. Longstreet and D. H. Hill, after their night march from Bunsboro, took line of battle in front of Sharpsburg early on the morning of September 15. During the morning, the news of the surrender of Harper's Ferry was received, and gave a different complexion to the whole situation. Until that time Lee had contemplated crossing the river at Shepherdstown, and he had directed Jackson to move to that vicinity to cover the crossing, but Jackson replied that he could bring his divisions over to Sharpsburg, upon which he was ordered to do so. One on the morning of the 15th McClellan in person started in pursuit of Lee from Turner's Gap with four corps, comma the first, two D, fifth, and twelve th, comma comprising thirty-three brigades of infantry. After a march of about seven miles he found Lee, with the fourteen brigades under Longstreet and D. H. Hill, in line of battle in front of Sharpsburg about noon. They scarcely numbered ten thousand infantry, and McClellan must have known that all the remainder of Lee's army was concentrated about Harper's Ferry. He could never wish for a fairer chance to crush an adversary, but he did nothing that afternoon or the next morning. During the 16th he was joined by the 9th Corps, and at 7.30 p.m. he ordered two divisions of the 6th Corps from Pleasant Valley, under Franklin, to join him next day, while the 3D division under Couch was ordered to occupy Maryland Heights, for what useful purpose it is hard to divine. Meanwhile, his plan of battle had been formed. 
it was to send the 1st, 2d, and 12th Corps, over 30,000 men, across the anti atam above the Confederate lines, to turn their left flank, while the 9th Corps under Burnside, about 10,000, should attack their right at Burnside Bridge as soon as things looked favorable above. The 5th and 6th Corps, Porter and Franklin, would be in reserve opposite our center with 31,339 infantry and artillery besides a considerable force of cavalry and horse artillery. The plan was not a good one, involving as it did a piecemeal beginning. The three corps to attack the Confederate left should have been under one commander, and should have moved together. Instead, the first corps, under Hooker, was started about 2 p.m. on the 16th, the 12th corps under Mansfield, not until 11.30 p.m. the 2d Corps, under Sumner, was ordered to be ready to march an hour before daylight. It was ready, but received no orders. After daylight, the battle having opened and the firing become heavy, Sumner rode to McClellan's headquarters to ask for orders, and waited an hour or more without being able to see him. Orders to advance finally reached him at 7.30 a.m. The sun had risen at 5.45 and Hooker had become engaged soon after daylight, probably about 5 o'clock. Sumner had some distance to march, and was only able to get into action after 10 a.m. By this time, as we shall see, Hooker and Mansfield had been wrecked, and Sumner's wreck soon followed. When Lee formed his line on the 16th, Jackson's two divisions held the left between the Hagerstown Pike and Stewart's cavalry, which held a road nearer the river. Hood's two brigades had their left upon the pike, and on their right D. H. Hill's division formed a curve by which the line swept around parallel to the pike. Longstreet, with Jones's division and Evans's brigade, extended the line to the Burnside Bridge. Walker's division was in reserve behind the extreme right flank. McClellan's, Anderson's, and A. P. Hill's divisions had not yet arrived. Some artillery dueling across the anti atam took place, but the first infantry affair occurred late in the afternoon, when Hooker's corps came in contact with Hood's pickets. Hooker's orders were to attack. It is hard to believe that McClellan deliberately sent a single corps so far away from prompt support to attack Lee's whole army in position, and had daylight lasted, Hooker would probably have been overwhelmed that afternoon. McClellan had ridden with Hooker in the beginning of his march, and Hooker had called his attention to the hazard of sending him so far upon such a serious errand. It was probably this remonstrance of Hooker's which moved McClellan to send Mansfield at 11.30 p.m. and to order Sumner to be ready to move an hour before daylight. The time of these orders is much more suggestive of a gradually developed plan than of one formulated beforehand, and it resulted in four extensive combats instead of in one great battle. The engagement in the afternoon between Hood and Hooker's advance was quite sharp, Hood advancing Law's brigade to the support of his skirmishers and driving back until dark the enemy's advance. In this affair Col. Liddell of 11th Miss. And Col. McNeil of the 1st Pa. Bucktail, Rifles both distinguished and promising officers, fell mortally wounded. The fighting ceased at dark, and pickets were established on each side, in such close proximity that they could hear each other's voices. About nine the light rain began to fall and continued most of the night. When all was quiet Hood's brigades were withdrawn to cook rations, they having been without food, but one half ration of meat, for three days. Their positions were filled by Lawton's and Trimble's brigades, of Lawton's division, which were in reserve near Jackson's line, with Hayes's brigade in support. At early dawn the fight was renewed, and Hooker's three fine divisions advanced in columns of brigades in line. Doubleday on the right, Ricketts on the left, and Meade in reserve close behind Comma ten brigades with ten batteries. The fighting even before sunrise had become very severe. In his official report, Hooker gives the following incident, We had not proceeded far before I discovered that a heavy force of the enemy had taken possession of a cornfield, I have since learned about a thirty-acre field, in my immediate front, and from the sun's rays falling on their bayonets projecting above the corn, 
could see that the field was filled with the enemy with arms in their hands, standing apparently at a support arms. Instructions were immediately given for the assemblage of all my spare batteries near at hand, of which, I think, there were five or six, to spring into battery on the right of this field and to open with canister at once. In the time I am writing every stalk of corn in the northern and greater part of the field was cut as closely as could have been done with a knife, and the slain lay in rows, precisely as they had stood in their ranks a few moments before. It was never my fortune to witness a more bloody, dismal battlefield. Those that escaped fled in the opposite direction from our advance, and sought refuge behind the trees, fences, and stern ledges nearly on a line with the Dunker Church, as there was no resisting this torrent of death dealing missives. This attack fell principally upon Lawton's and Hayes's brigades extending from the Hagerstown Pike through the cornfield to the right. Trimble's brigade, on their right, connected with D. H. Hill's division. Hayes's brigade had also just been brought up in rear of Lawton's as a support. Across the pike, Doubleday's division had, at the same time, made a furious attack upon the old Jackson division under J. R. Jones. This division, though of four brigades, was one of the smallest in the army, Jones reporting that it went into action with only 1,600 men. Its position, on the extreme left, was exposed to the view of, and enfiladed and taken in reverse by, the enemy's rifle batteries, across the anti atom at a range of about 3,000 yards. Hooker's troops were well handled, both his infantry and artillery and the full fighting power of his whole corps was soon brought into play and skillfully applied. The Confederate resistance was desperate, and the slaughter upon both sides great. Lawton and J. R. Jones were both borne off wounded within an hour. Jones was succeeded by Stark of Louisiana, who soon after fell pierced by three balls and survived but a few moments. Col. Douglas, commanding Lawton's brigade, was killed, and five out of six regimental commanders, the brigade losing 554 killed and wounded out of 1,150. Hayes's brigade lost 323 out of 550, including all of his staff and every regimental commander. In Trimble's brigade, Col. Walker, commanding the brigade, was wounded, with one of his staff, and the brigade lost 3 out of 4 regimental commanders and 228 men out of 700 present. Early's, the remaining brigade of Ewell's division, had been sent about dawn to the extreme left, as a support to Stuart's cavalry, which occupied a position whence our artillery could annoy the flank of Hooker's attack. When Lawton was wounded, Early and his brigade were sent for. Leaving the 13th V, numbering less than 100 men, with Stuart, at his request, Early started back toward the position where he had left the other brigades of the division, but soon came upon Coles, Grigsby and Stafford with about 300 men, who were the remnant of J. R. Jones's division. He learned that Lawton and Hayes had also been driven back with great losses, and that only a handful were left, who were probably not in condition to go into action again. The ten brigades of Hooker had carried the whole line held in their front by the seven brigades which they had struck, with such losses of men and officers, as practically to put the Confederate brigades out of action for the day and to make a great gap in Lee's line from Early's brigade on the left to D. H. Hill's line upon the right. In this gap was Hooker's corps, badly shaken by the desperate resistance which it had overcome, but with the 12th corps just arriving to its support. Not far in their front were Hood's two unfortunate brigades who had not yet gotten their last night's suppers. When the fighting ceased the night before, Hood, moved by the hunger of his men, had gone to Lee and asked for two brigades to take his place in the line of battle for the night, that he might have time to cook. Lee had answered that he would gladly send them, but that he had none available. He suggested, however, that Hood should see Jackson. Hood rode a long time in search of Jackson, and at last found him alone, asleep on the ground at the root of a tree. Jackson at once gave the orders which had put Lawton's and Trimble's brigades in the place of Hood and Law and also sent Hayes in support of Lawton, but he had exacted from Hood a promise that he would come instantly, 
when called to support the line. Hu then rode to find his wagons and bring up the rations, but the darkness caused such delay that it was already dawn, and the sound of battle was heard in front before many of the men had time to do more than to prepare their dough. No meat had been issued for several days, and only reduced rations of flour. Soon afterward, a staff officer of Lawton's dashed up with the message, Gen. Lawton's compliments, and will you come at once to his support? Two arms was instantly sounded, and the lines formed and marched to the front, leaving the half cooked dough in camp. Near the Dunker Church they passed Lawton, being borne to the rear on a litter, and here Hood found Hayes with about forty men, whom he had rallied, but all out of ammunition. He suggested to Hayes to withdraw and collect his men, and replenish ammunition. He then launched his two brigades, about two thousand men, under Wofford and Law, through the bloody cornfield, already thickly strewn with dead and dying. Hood's brigades had made the successful charge at Gaines Mill, which broke through Porter's entrenched line, but he wrote in his report that here he witnessed the most terrific clash of arms, by far that has occurred during the war. Hooker was wounded, and the enemy was driven back so far as to be forced to abandon some of his guns. Meanwhile, Early's brigade on his left, in the long body of woods called the West Woods, on the left of the Hagerstown Pike, was able to hold the enemy at bay and to protect Stuart's flank. When Early left with Stuart but one small regiment of infantry, Stuart withdrew from his advanced position to a hill a little nearer our line. Here he had thirteen pieces of artillery, and was able to greatly annoy the Federal infantry near the Hagerstown Pike. On Hood's right the battle had been held by three brigades, which D. H. Hill had had near at hand and in reserve, comma Colquitts, Ripley's, and Garland's, the last now under McRae. On Hood's left, Lee had sent Walker's two brigades and the Georgia Brigade of G.T. Anderson, of D.R. Jones's division, which he had withdrawn from his right flank, opposite the Burnside Bridge. Mansfield's XII Corps had reinforced Hooker just in time to save the I Corps from being routed by the counter stroke. Given so heavily by Hood and his reinforcements, Hooker's corps had now lost 2,590 men and was practically put out of action. Meade succeeded to the command of the corps, when Hooker was wounded, and he withdrew from the field to a commanding ridge about a mile in rear, where he endeavoured to collect the remnants, and on which he now established a battery of thirty guns. In his official report, McClellan says that the first corps, was for the time much scattered and somewhat demoralised, and that there were but 6,729 men present on the 18th, whereas, on the morning of the 22d, there were 13,093 present for duty in the same corps, showing that previous to and during the battle, 6,364 men were separated from their commands. The defeat of Hooker's Corps may be considered as ending the first affair of the day, but the ending of that, and the beginning of the second, with Mansfield's Twelfth Corps, somewhat overlapped each other in occurrence. Mansfield had but two divisions, Williams's with two brigades and Green's with three. These troops had composed Banks's army in the valley and under Pope. The fight which now followed can scarcely be told in detail. It was one continuous exchange of heavy musketry and artillery at quarters sometimes as near as fifty yards or less sometimes in woods and sometimes in the open ground, sometimes receding and again advancing. Action and reaction, in such affairs, are usually not very unequal, and six of the nine Confederate brigades now conducting it, McRae, Ripley, Colquitt, Law, Wofford, and Early, had exhausted a part of their strength upon Hooker. After nearly two hours of this heavy fighting, with ammunition nearly gone and supplied principally with cartridges obtained from the dead and wounded, comma, with ranks reduced to skeletons, comma, the gap which Hooker had originally opened again yawned, even more widely, and Green's division had entered it and was in possession of the Dunker Church and the portion of the woods near it. Dot, but the Twelfth Corps had now, itself, lost all of its aggressiveness, and was glad to pause and await reinforcement. Mansfield had been killed early in the action, 
and his corps now under Williams had sustained a loss of 1746 men out of 8,000. Williams's division had suffered so severely that it was withdrawn to the rear to rest and replenish ammunition. Here may be said to end in a draw the second affair. The combatants upon both sides were worn out to frazzles, and the firing had ceased entirely. The remnant of Hood's division was also withdrawn to replenish ammunition. The Tex. Brigade under Wofford had lost 548 men out of 864 carried into action. The 1st Tex. Regiment had lost 45 killed, 141 wounded, and 12 missing from 227. Law's Brigade had lost 454 dot but this truce was of short duration. From the northwest heavy masses of blue, and from the south long lines of grey, were marching rapidly toward the fields, already so thickly strewn with killed and wounded. A third encounter equally desperate and bloody was now to take place over the bodies of slain and wounded, friends and foes. At 7.20 am Sumner had, at last, received his needlessly delayed orders to advance. If his nine brigades of veterans had been put into action along with Mansfield's five, they would have made decisive work upon Lee's left flank, and have opened the road to Porter's corps to attack his centre. Here McClellan threw away another one of his many chances for a decisive victory, though it was by no means his last dot the march of Sumner's columns could be seen from commanding points upon the Confederate lines and movement was also seen in Porter's corps, suggestive of preparation for assault, several of his battalions crossing the Bunsboro Bridge and coming to the support of his cavalry and horse artillery. Meanwhile, Lee was sending to the front his last reserves, McClellan's and R. H. Anderson's divisions, which had marched from Harper's Ferry at 3 p.m. on the 16th, and arrived near Sharpsburg soon after sunrise. These troops had had hard marching in withdrawing from Pleasant Valley and passing through Sharpsburg, and, on arrival, were allowed a rest of about an hour. By that time it was seen that Sumner's attack was imminent, and they were ordered to the front. Ah! H. Anderson's six brigades, about 3,600 strong, were sent to D. H. Hill's division. But Armistead's brigade was presently withdrawn and added to McClellan's division. McClellan's four brigades, about 3,000 strong, were directed to the woods behind the Dunker Church, under the guidance of Hood, who was acquainted with the ground. At the time of this lull in the firing, it was, perhaps, a little after nine o'clock. Sumner had been impatient at the three hours' delay imposed upon his corps, and, as he listened to the tremendous musketry and artillery of the two first combats, he doubtless recalled the field of Seven Pines, where he had arrived in time to save the battle. His corps had not fought at two D Manassas, and consequently it was large, numbering in its nine brigades over 17,000 men. It came upon the field led by Sedgwick's three brigades in column of brigade front. Sumner rode with this division. French's and Richardson's divisions followed in echelon to the left and rear. Before the Committee on the Conduct of the War, Sumner afterward testified as follows, On going upon the field I found that Hooker's corps had been dispersed and routed. I passed him some distance in the rear where he had been carried wounded, but I saw nothing of his corps at all, as I was advancing with my command on the field. There were some troops lying down on the left which I took to belong to Mansfield's command. In the meantime Mansfield had been killed, and a portion of his corps, formerly Banks's, had been thrown into confusion. The troops of the 12th Corps which Sumner saw lying down were the remains of Green's division, about the Dunker Church, and it were better for Sumner had they not held ground so far in front of their general line. For Sumner did not realize that he was now within the Confederate lines and he continued his advance into the woods, leaving the church and Green's forces on his left. The formation of his division was in too close order to be safely brought under fire. He should have taken greater intervals between his brigades. It is said that they were only between 50 and 100 feet apart. One in this formation he pushed through the rather open woods with occasional rocky ledges, and passed, without being aware of it, 
Early's brigade upon his right with the remnants of Jones's division under Grigsby and Stafford, and on his left, he passed the remnants of Walker's two brigades, who were holding in front of Green's troops about the church. Early, himself unseen by reason of a ridge between them, moved down parallel to Sedgwick's march, leaving Grisby and Stafford behind, to hold his rear against some troops in echelon behind Sedgwick's right, who seemed disposed to follow. As soon as Early passed the ridge which had concealed him, he opened fire upon the flank of Sedgwick's column. This was in such close formation that it could not deploy an opposing front. Just at this time the head of the column emerged from the woods on the far side, and found itself presenting its left front angle to McClellan's division, which was deploying from column into line of battle within close range. Sedgwick had practically marched into an ambuscade. McClellan opened fire quickly from a front of a brigade and a half. The remaining brigades came into line at double quick and soon poured a terrific fire, taking Sedgwick's column so obliquely that it could not be effectively replied to. At the same time the remnants of Walker's two brigades lined up against the left flank of the column, now almost helpless between converging fires. It has rarely happened that heavy losses have been incurred more rapidly. Sedgwick himself was wounded, with Dana, one of his brigadiers, and the losses of the division were 2,210. It is stated by ropes that Sedgwick's loss was all suffered in a very few minutes. In endeavouring to meet the flank fires, the rear brigade was ordered to face about. Fortunately, this order was understood by the brigade to mean or rearward march which was soon begun, and was hastily followed by the other brigades. The Confederates followed in pursuit, and once more the tide of battle swept across the ghastly cornfield, and the adjacent open ground between the Dunkard or Westwood, and an Eastwood about 700 yards east of its northern end. Some of the brigades of D.H. Hill's left joined in the counter-stroke, and the Federals were driven to the shelter of their strong line of artillery in front of the Northwood, which bounded the open fields to the Northwood. McClellan pushed his assault much too far, for his numbers were too light to hope for any great result, and the favorable ground enabled the enemy's artillery to punish severely all open exposures. Thus, McClellan lost 1,103 out of 2,893 carried into action in his four brigades, Gershaws, Semses, Barksdales, and Cobb apostrophe s, comma, an average of 39%. These losses occurred mostly in the pursuit after Sedgwick, and mostly befell within two hours. At the same time that Sedgwick was driven back, Green's men about the Dunker Church were also forced back to the Federal guns, leaving the Confederate line practically the same that it had been in the morning, although now held only by scattered fragments and almost entirely destitute of artillery. In each of these three affairs the division batteries had been effectively fought against the enemy's infantry, but gradually they had nearly all been put out of action. As an illustration of their experiences, and of the condition of our line at this time, McClellan, in his report, says, Captain Reed's battery had been placed in position on the right of the woods which we had entered, and did most excellent service, but it was exposed to such a severe fire gen. Kershaw ordered it back, after losing 14 officers and men and 16 horses. Another battery, Captain Carlton's, which I had ordered into position in the woods in front of Gen. Ransom's brigade, was so severely cut up in a short time by the direct and crossfire of numerous batteries, that I ordered it to retire. This finished the third affair of the day though there were still upon the field Sumner's two other large divisions to be reckoned with, equal in strength to the whole of the Twelfth Corps, and, in addition, that could be seen across the Antietam, but moving to support the attack upon our left, the Sixth Corps under Franklin. It was plain that a fourth and even more terrible struggle was to come, but it befell principally over new ground bordering the scene of the previous fighting upon the east, and extending southward. Here the division of D.H. Hill held the salient east of the Hagerstown Pike where our line of battle changed direction and became parallel to the pike. The ground was open and moderately rolling and had but one good feature for defense. This was a sunken road, an excellent thing when it has the right direction, 
perpendicular to the enemy's line of approach, but a dangerous trap if the enemy can obtain an enfilading position. The salient outline here involved this danger dot in the second affair of the day, as has been told, d. h. Hill had sent three of his five brigades forward to support the flank of Hood's attack, and these brigades, Colquitt's, Ripley's, and Garland's, had remained holding advanced ground about the Roulette House, a few hundred yards in front of the sunken road before referred to. Here they had already suffered severe losses. When Sedgwick's division was driven back and hardly pressed, Sumner had sent word to French and Richardson to attack, in order to make a diversion. From his position in Echelon, on Sedgwick's left and rear, French soon came into collision with D. H. Hill's advanced brigades. These made a stubborn defense for a while, but their front was narrow and on its exposed right flank was Garland's brigade, which, on the 14th, had been rooted and badly cut up at Turner's Gap. Hill report, Garland's brigade, Col. McRae commanding, had been much demoralized by the fight on South Mountain, but the men advanced with alacrity, secured a good position, and were fighting bravely when Captain Thompson, 5th and C, cried out, they are flanking us. This cry spread like an electric shock along the ranks bringing up vivid recollections of the flank fire at South Mountain. In a moment they broke and fled to the rear, Col. McRae, though wounded, remained on the field all day and succeeded in gathering up some stragglers and personally rendered much efficient service. The 23 DNC of this brigade was brought off by the gallant Lieutenant Col. Johnston and posted by my orders in the old road already described. Ripley's brigade had united with walkers and fallen back with it behind the ridge to the left of this road and near to it. We had now lost all the ground wrested from the enemy, and were occupying the position held in the morning, but three of my brigades had been broken and much demoralized, and all of the artillery had been withdrawn from my front. Out of ten field officers in Colquitt's brigade, which had fought after the giving way of Garland's brigade until its ranks were nearly mingled with the enemy's, four were killed and six wounded. Hill now had left in the sunken road only two of his original five brigades, G. B. Anderson, comparatively fresh, and Rhodes, who had been severely engaged at Bunsboro, losing one third of his force. Here Hill received the united attacks of both French's and Richardson's divisions and for some time successfully repulsed them. He was aided by R. H. Anderson's division, some three or four thousand men, Hill report, which had taken position in his rear. Anderson was soon severely wounded, and no one seems to have exercised active command of the division after he left the field, nor are any reports published of the division or any of its brigades or regiments, except the casualties. These, in the five brigades of Wilcox, Muon, Pryor, Featherstone, and Wright, amounted to 1,430 killed, wounded, and missing come over one third of the force engaged. Swinton describes the conflict at this period, as follows, the action here was of a very animated nature, for Hill, being reinforced by the division of Anderson, assumed a vigorous offensive, and endeavored to seize a piece of high ground on the Union left with the view of turning that flank. This maneuver was, however, frustrated by the skill and promptitude of Col. Cross of the 5th N.H., called Wells Brigade, who, detecting the danger, moved his regiments toward the menaced point. Between his command and the Confederate force there then ensued a spirited contest, each endeavoring to reach the high ground and both delivering their fire as they marched in parallel lines by the flank. The effort to flank on the right was handsomely checked by Brooke, French, and Barlow, the latter of whom changing front, with his two regiments, obliquely to the right, poured in a rapid fire, compelling the surrender of three hundred prisoners with two standards. When this fighting had lasted perhaps an hour, the Federals had gradually brought in the whole of French's and Richardson's divisions, and extended their lines. At last they reached a position from which a portion of the sunken lane could be enfiladed. This being reported to Rhodes by the Lieutenant Col. of the 6th Alabama, he was directed to throw his right wing back and out of the road. 
Rhodes report. Instead of executing the order he moved briskly to the rear of the regiment and gave the command, 6th Alabama about face, forward march. Major Hobson of the 5th, seeing this, asked if the order was intended for the whole brigade. He said, yes, and thereupon the 5th and the other troops on their left retreated. I did not see their retrograde movement until it was too late to rally them, and for this reason, just as I was moving on I heard a shot strike Lieutenant Bunny, aide, who was immediately behind me. Wheeling around, I found him falling, and that he had been struck in the face. He found that he could walk, after I raised him. As I turned to the brigade I was struck heavily by a piece of shell on the thigh. At first I thought that the wound was serious, but, finding upon examination that it was slight, I turned toward the brigade, when I discovered it, without visible cause to me, retreating in confusion. I hastened to intercept it at the Hargistown Road. I found though that with the exception of a few men, not more than forty in all, the brigade had disappeared from this portion of the field. This small number, together with some Mississippians and North Carolinians, about 150 in all, I rallied and stationed behind a small ridge leading from the Hagerstown Road. When, by this misunderstanding between Rhodes and Lieutenant Cole Lightfoot, Rhodes's brigade abandoned this sunken road comma ever since known as the Bloody Lane, Lee's army was ruined and the end of the Confederacy was in sight. Even the rank and file in the Fifth Corps, looking on from across the Antietam, saw and appreciated the situation. Now is the time was a general comment. McClellan, from his headquarters at the Fry House, looked on, but he did not come and he issued no order. The gap left by Rhodes was speedily filled by the encouraged Federals, and now the whole lane was enfiladed, and the slaughter which took place in it strewed it with dead and wounded, probably as thickly as has ever been seen in this country. G. B. Anderson's brigade, next on the left, attempted to stay the tide, but Anderson was killed, and, in the rout which followed, the supporting troops of R. H. Anderson's division were involved, and only small squads of stragglers could be rallied at scattered points in the rear. The Confederates had, however, exacted severe penalties from French and Richardson. Neither suffered to quite the extent that Sedgwick had done though each of them lost heavily and Sumner himself had much of his ardor cooled. Richardson lost 1,165, and was himself mortally wounded. French lost 1,750. But the danger to the Confederates now lay in the presence on the field of Franklin, with Slocum's and Smith's divisions of the 6th Corps of about 6,000 each, fine troops and well commanded. Franklin, too was anxious to attack. Already he had sent one brigade, Irwin's, to the relief of Green, when he was pursued out of the Dunkard Woods, and this brigade found work enough to do to suffer 342 casualties. Another brigade, Hancock's, though not seriously engaged, formed as support to two of Gen. Sumner's batteries, then severely pressed by the enemy drove away his skirmishers who had already advanced close to the batteries, and occupied some buildings and fences in front of his position. This brigade was the means of saving the two batteries. But, just as Franklin was about to attack, Sumner met him, and, being the ranking officer, he ordered the attack postponed. Meanwhile, however, under the personal direction of Richardson himself and of Barlow commanding two regiments in Caldwell's brigade, the battle was kept up by the troops already engaged, who were encouraged by their recent success and were quite disposed to follow it up. But there were no fighters in the Confederate army capable of more desperate and pertinacious defense than Longstreet and D. H. Hill. The latter's official report thus briefly summarizes what followed, Col. Bennett of the 14th, and Major Sellers of the 30th N.C. Regiment rallied a portion of their men. There were no troops near to hold the center except a few hundred rallied from various brigades. The Yankees crossed the old road which we had occupied in the morning and occupied a cornfield and orchard in advance of it. They had now got within a few hundred yards of the hill which commanded Sharpsburg, and Aria. Affairs looked very critical. 
I found a battery concealed in a cornfield, and ordered it to move out and open upon the Yankee columns. This proved to be Boyce's SC battery. It moved out most gallantly, although exposed to a direct and reverse fire from the long-range artillery across the entire tam. A caisson exploded, but the battery unlimbered, and with grape and canister drove the enemy back. Boyce fired 70 rounds of canister, and lost 19 men and 15 horses. I was now satisfied that the Yankees were so demoralized that a single regiment of fresh men could drive the whole of them in our front across the entire tam. I got up about 200 men who said they would advance to the attack if I would lead them. We met, however, with a warm reception, and the little command was broken and dispersed. Major Hobson and Lieutenant I. M. Goff of the 5th Alabama acquitted themselves handsomely in this charge. Colonel Alfred Iverson, 20th N.C., Col. D. H. Christie, 23 D. N.C., Captain Garrett, 5th N.C., Judge. J. M. Taylor and Lieutenant Isaac E. Pierce of the same regiment had gathered up about 200 men, and I sent them to the right to attack the Yankees in flank. They drove them back a short distance, but were in turn repulsed. These two attacks, however, had a most happy effect. The Yankees were completely deceived by their boldness, and induced to believe that there was a large force in our center. They made no further attempt to pierce our center. These details give an instructive lesson in the value of pertinacity. Longstreet with his staff helped man two guns of the Washington artillery and materially aided in the result. While Richardson's advance was still being pushed, Pleasanton advanced about three brigades of cavalry and four batteries across the Antietam, by the Boonsboro Bridge. The batteries crowned the hills upon our side and opened fire, supported by the cavalry, and by a regiment of regulars deployed as skirmishers. Presently the line was reinforced by three more batteries of the 5th Corps and Buchanan's brigade of regulars. These troops felt of our line quite heavily, the pressure coming upon Evans's brigade and parts of the brigades of Wilcox, Featherstone, and Pryor of R. H. Anderson's division, and G. T. Anderson of D. R. Jones's division. D. H. Hill, himself on foot, having had three horses killed under him during the morning, and carrying a musket, led some of these troops which he had rallied. S. D. Lee's battalion of artillery was also now back upon the field with ammunition replenished, and this demonstration was presently driven back under cover of the hills bordering the Antietam. Pleasanton, who appreciated the opportunity, called for reinforcements, but McClellan had started on a visit to his right flank and had ordered two brigades of regulars of the 5th Corps to follow him. The absence of these brigades prevented Porter from complying with Pleasanton's request. So his demonstration was abandoned, and his troops and artillery were withdrawn, having suffered something over 100 casualties. When McClellan reached the field on his right, he conferred with Sumner and Franklin. The latter urged a renewal of the attack, but Sumner advised against it and McClellan took his advice. Franklin was ordered simply to stand on the defensive. The two brigades of regulars brought over from the center were marched back. Thus, McClellan's expedition to the right at a critical time saved the shattered Confederate lines from two assaults by fresh troops, on their left and on their center, just at the time when Burnside was beginning to get in serious work upon their right. The battle was now practically finished upon the Federal right and center and finished in a draw. We may now turn to their left. Dot in his final report, dated August 4, 1863, McClellan writes that he sent an order to Burnside to carry the bridge in front of him at 8 a.m., but in his preliminary report, October 15, 1862, he says the order was communicated at 10 a.m. Burnside's report, dated September 30th, gives the same hour. Gen. Cox who had charge of the initial operations, in his report, dated September 23rd, gives the hour as 9 a.m., and all the circumstantial evidence bears this out as correct. The immediate defense of the bridge was made by tombs with the 2d, 20th, and 56th Georgia regiments, about 600 men, supported by Richardson's, 
Spechelmann's, and Eubanks batteries. His infantry was partially covered by a thin wood. But the ground, sloping toward the stream, gave little shelter from the enemy's fire. Burnside's corps comprised four divisions of two brigades each, averaging about 1,500 men to each brigade. Rodman's division was sent to the extreme left, to make its attack upon a ford a half mile below the bridge, where a re-entrant angle gave the Federals a strong attack. There was here only a Confederate picket. The other Federal divisions were under cover opposite the bridge, with abundant artillery on the hills. When the orders to attack were received, the artillery fire, of which there had been some all the morning, was redoubled, and skirmishers were pushed forward close to the stream. Crook's brigade was directed to approach as nearly as possible, unobserved, and then to make a dash for the bridge. But Crook missed his direction, and when he came near the stream he found himself somewhat above the bridge, and under such a heavy fire that he could not approach closer. He took what cover he could get and opened fear on the Confederate position. So the first Federal effort was a failure. A second effort was soon organized to be made by Sturgis's division. Sturgis sent two regiments from Nagel's brigade, covered by the fire of the rest of this brigade and of Ferrero's brigade. Their hot reception by Toombs's Georgians checked the advance before they could reach the bridge, and the second effort was also a failure. Meanwhile, more urgent orders from McClellan were coming to Burnside, and being reiterated by him to his subordinates as the battle app on the Federal right grew more desperate. Of course, Toombs's three regiments and three batteries, fighting without entrenchments, and in the open country along the Antietam, could not hope to do more than merely to delay four divisions with eight or ten batteries. By this time the enemy had discovered all our weak points, and their own strong ones, and Toombs's ammunition was getting low, for he could not replenish under the enemy's fire. Moreover, Rodman's division had already driven off the picket force at the ford below and Toombs knew that it would soon appear in his rear. He had, however, not only saved three precious hours, but he had put up a fight which had so exhausted, both the energy and ammunition of his adversary, as to entail upon them the loss of three hours more, before they would be across the bridge and prepared to begin their attack on our right dot during all these six hours, a. p. Hill would be marching rapidly. It was said that on this march he stimulated laggards with the point of his dress sword. For his third attack, Cox took two regiments, marching by the flank, side by side. The regiment on the right was left in front, and the one on the left was right in front. Crook, too, organized five companies of the 28th Zero. To cross at a ford opposite his position, a short distance above the bridge. About 1 p.m. the charge was made. Toombs knew that his game was played, and all that remained to make it a perfect success was to safely withdraw his men. He did this with combined skill and good luck. He gave the enemy a farewell volley, ran safely to the rear, replenished his ammunition, got together parts of his brigade which had been detached, and took an active part in the final assault of the day which drove the enemy to cover in the valley of the Antietam. Rodman had gotten over, practically without opposition, before the charge upon the bridge, and Crook had carried the ford above the bridge, at the same time with the charge. The losses on either side in this affair are not given, but the total killed and wounded for the whole day, in the three Georgia regiments, was 217, about 38 percent. But they had saved the day, for, while the Federals were crossing the Antietam, A. P. Hill forded the Potomac. Having crossed the bridge, Burnside's first task was to secure his possession of it, against any counterstroke, by bringing over a number of batteries. With these, he crowned the adjacent heights, while his infantry deployed under their crests. Meanwhile, came urgent orders from McClellan to press his advance. But the three brigades of Nagel, Ferrero, and Crook, which had been engaged, reported their ammunition as nearly exhausted. Sturgis also reported Nagel and Ferrero as too exhausted physically to be fit for an immediate advance. On this Wilcox's division, 
with an ammunition train, was ordered across the creek, and Wilcox relieved Sturgis in the advance. These arrangements just consumed the time remaining in which an advance could have been opposed only with four of Jones's brigades, under Drayton, Garnett, Walker, and Kemper, and the fragments of earlier battles which could be rallied in the rear. Wilcox's division formed the right wing of the line of battle, and Rodman's the left, Cox's division gave Crook's brigade to support Wilcox, and Scammon's to support Rodman, while Sturgis in reserve held the heights near the bridge. At 4 p.m. the advance was made in handsome style, somewhat to the right oblique, so as to envelop the village of Sharpsburg. In front of this village it struck Jones's four brigades, which had been held all day unengaged, but exposed to the enemy's rifle fire across the Antietam. Though now scarcely numbering 2,000 men, they made a desperate fight, as the casualties upon both sides attest but the long federal lines gradually overlapped their narrow fronts and the federal progress, though slow, was sure. The Confederates hurried to oppose them with all the artillery and the fragments of infantry which could be drawn from their left, many of those going being already wounded. Before the advancing troops of A.P. Hill appeared upon the scene, the leading Federals had crossed the brook running east from the town into the Antietam, and were well up on the slope of Cemetery Hill while others occupied the eastern part of the village. It had been about 3 p.m., when A.P. Hill coming up from the ford with his five brigades, had first reported in person to Lee. Getting information as to localities from D.R. Jones, he formed three brigades on the right of Jones and advanced to the attack. The other two brigades, Pender and Brock and Braw, were placed on his extreme right looking to a road coming from across the Antietam at its mouth. One of his batteries, under McIntosh, which had been sent ahead to the relief of Jones, had been left unsupported as Jones was driven back. The guns had fired canister until the enemy's line was within sixty yards, when the limbers and caissons were withdrawn, leaving the guns in the hands of the enemy. Meantime, in the enemy's oblique advance a gap had opened between Wilcox on the right and Rodman on the left, now become the rear. In fact, the movement had converted the line into a formation of brigades in echelon, and the interval between Wilcox and Rodman had widened as Wilcox, over less exposed ground, had advanced more rapidly. Now, having gained a foothold on the edge of Sharpsburg, he had stopped his advance to bring up his ammunition wagons. Rodman had found the enemy extending to his left and was passing, on his extreme left, some fields of high corn, which cut off his view upon that flank. The four Confederate brigades advanced to the attack in the order from the left, Tombs, Archer, Branch, and Gregg, comma, not in a continuous line, but with intervals of from 100 to 300 yards between them, which enabled them to overlap both of the Federal flanks. Gregg's brigade on the right, having replenished their tattered wardrobes from the blue Federal uniforms captured at Harper's Ferry, were at first mistaken for friends and approached to close quarters through the high corn before they opened fire. The weight of the attack fell upon the three brigades under Rodman, say 4,500 men. The Confederates probably numbered 2,700, but the attack was furious, and, enveloping both flanks, it was successful from the first. Rodman was killed early in its progress. Among the Confederates, Branch was killed and Gregg wounded. McIntosh's guns were recaptured, and the whole Federal fine, although resisting, was forced back toward the Antietam. Cox at once ordered forward Sturgis's division, to support the line, and also sent orders to Wilcox to withdraw his three brigades from the vicinity of Sharpsburg to the place where his division had formed, under cover near the river. With the assistance of Sturgis the Confederate pursuit was finally checked, but not until all the ground over which the enemy had advanced had been recovered, and the approach of night had at last put an end to the battle. As darkness enveloped the scene, the Confederates, worn and exhausted by eight days of marching and fighting, dropped down where they stood to sleep and could scarcely be roused even to eat the cooked rations brought up from their camps in the rear. When all was quiet, the division commanders met where Lee had taken his position on the road near the village. 
and made their separate reports of the condition of their commands. Without exception, all reported heavy losses and the men exhausted, and all considered it necessary to withdraw from the field during the night. Lee, alone, was in no wise moved. He had read McClellan's inmost soul and knew he was not to be feared. Without a word of explanation or asking advice from either Jackson or Longstreet or anyone else, he directed all to collect their stragglers, strengthen their lines, and be prepared to renew the battle in the morning. When the morning dawned, disclosing the opposing skirmishers in easy range, and the hostile guns nowhere out of range, but no shot being fired on either side, the Confederates drew long breaths of relief. Many men already half understood McClellan, but Lee alone had read him thoroughly and speculated boldly upon the knowledge. Indeed, when the advancing hours of the forenoon had made it certain that McClellan did not intend to attack that day, Lee recurred to a proposed plan of the day before to turn McClellan's right, and he abandoned it reluctantly only after careful reconnaissance by Col. S. D. Lee, on learning of the peculiar strength and heavy preparation of the enemy at that point. Now there was nothing left to do but to recross into Virginia. That afternoon the orders were given and the trains were started. Soon after dark the movement of the troops began, and when the sun was two hours high on the morning of the 19th, everything was safely across. Gen. Walker, in an account of the battle in battles and leaders of the Civil War, writes, detained in superintending the removal of a number of the wounded of my division, I was among the last to cross the Potomac. As I rode into the river I passed Gen. Lee sitting on his horse in the stream, watching the crossing of wagons and artillery. Returning my greeting, he inquired as to what was still behind. There was nothing but the wagons containing my wounded, and a battery of artillery, and I told him so. Thank God, I heard him say, as I rode on. In offering battle on the 18th Lee had everything to lose and nothing to gain, McClellan, on the contrary, in accepting battle, would have had everything to gain both for himself and his cause, and nothing to lose. He had 24,000 men who had not been seriously engaged, and 12,000 more near enough to come into the battle before noon. Couch's division, 6,000 strong, recalled from its useless expedition to Maryland Heights, rejoined the army early in the morning on the 18th, and Meade's division, 6,000 strong, arrived by 11 a.m. It is strange but true that, with 36,000 fresh men at hand, neither McClellan nor any of his six corps commanders, except Franklin, approved the idea of an attack. Ropes says that Franklin alone, recognized the importance of the high ground held by Stuart and desired to begin by driving him and his artillery from it. This point was indeed one of the key points of Lee's line, but the dominant feature of the whole situation was the fact that Lee was fighting with his back to a river, which he could not have crossed under fire. McClellan fought with a safe retreat assured to him, in case of disaster, by the anti atam in his front and the powerful artillery on the hills behind it. The battlefield is unique, among the fields of the war, in offering all the prizes to the Federals and all the risks to the Confederates. To McClellan it was the opportunity of a lifetime. One other feature of this battle is worthy of special note as unique. McClellan concentrated his powerful cavalry and horse artillery force, not upon either flank, and especially not upon his left flank where were great opportunities for it, but at his center, where it would have been in the way of his infantry, and where the ground was much cut up with fences and cultivation. On his right it might have been able to drive Stuart from his commanding hill. On his left, from which direction he should have expected Jackson's troops, it might have crossed the bridge over the anti atam near its mouth. Where it was, it was superfluous. When, on the morning of the 19th, it was discovered that Lee had retreated, a brigade of cavalry was ordered in pursuit and was soon followed by Porter's corps. I have before, in the account of the Battle of Malvern Hill, spoken of our reserve artillery under the command of Pendleton, and not attached to any division. It had been left in Richmond, when Lee with Jackson and Longstreet advanced against Pope. After McClellan was withdrawn from the James, it marched with D. H. Hill's division, 
and joined the army in Maryland on September 8. On the 10th and 11th it marched to Hagerstown, with Longstreet's corps, and on the 14th returned with it to Bunsboro. That night, when the army was put in motion for Sharpsburg, Pendleton was ordered to take the reserve artillery across the Potomac at Williamsport, and distribute it to guard the fords of the Potomac at that point, and below to Shepherdstown. Hence it happened that on the morning of the 19th the hills on the Virginia side of Boatler's Ford were being held by 15 light rifle guns, and 19 smoothbores of Pendleton's reserve, while 10 other smoothbores were held close by Dot in his advance to the river Pleasanton's cavalry picked up 167 stragglers, one abandoned gun, and one color. When he approached the river he was opened upon by Pendleton's artillery. Gibson's Tidball's, and Robertson's batteries of horse artillery, 18 guns, went into action and replied so effectively as to silence most of the Confederate guns and also to run off all camps and wagon trains in sight near the river. After two hours of this, the Federal cavalry and its artillery were relieved by the arrival of the V Corps, by which the affair was kept up until night. The canal bank along the river on the Maryland side served the purpose of a parapet, and enabled the enemy to aid their artillery fire with a heavy fire of musketry against the Confederate guns and sharpshooters on the Virginia side, where there was but little cover. During the afternoon this combined fire compelled the abandonment of several guns. Seeing this, the 4th Michigan forded the stream and took possession of four of them. After dark this regiment was withdrawn, but early on the 20th Porter started to cross the two divisions of Morrill and Sykes, and a brigade of cavalry. Meanwhile, Pendleton during the night had found Lee and reported, and Lee had ordered Jackson to send back his nearest division. This was A.P. Hills. Fortunately, Hill moved early, and, forming in two lines of battle, he approached the ford before Porter had gotten more than a half of his men across. Porter, informed that a large force was approaching, decided to withdraw, and did so with but little loss. One regiment, however, the 118th Pa, was thrown into confusion and driven over a steep descent and across the river under fire, losing 269 men. The total losses reported by the Federals for this affair were 363. A. P. Hill reported 30 killed and 231 wounded. Pendleton reported 3 killed and 4 wounded of his reserve artillery. I have already told of my being sent on the 16th to Harper's Ferry to remove the captured ordnance stores and to bring what was available for use to Sharpsburg. I sent to Winchester 49 field pieces and 24 mountain howitzers, and quite a lot of artillery ammunition not suitable for our calibers. Of what was suitable the supply was small, except of canister. There was also a fair amount of small arm ammunition. Much of it had been brought from the depots, and unloaded along Miles's entrenchments, ready for use. While gathering this in the afternoon from Bolivar Heights, I could see the smoke of the conflict and the incessant bursting in the air of shells and shrapnel over the field where Burnside made his advance and was beaten back by A.P. Hill. I could not tell how the fight was going, but at that time no Confederate expected anything less than victory. I was until late at night dispatching wagons to Winchester, and to the ford near the battlefield. I finished the work next morning, and returned to the vicinity of the ford in the afternoon. Here I found orders to await the army, which would recross the river that night, and here the next morning we received a liberal shelling from the enemy's horse batteries across the river which perforated some of our wagons, but did no other harm. The Confederate casualties by brigades are given below from the war records as far as they appear. Also, in a second table, the Federal casualties are distributed among the different actions. Confederate casualties. Maryland Campaign Federal Casualties. Maryland Campaign casualties among general and field officers were unusually heavy. Among the Federals commanding corps were Eno and Mansfield killed, and Hooker wounded. Commanding divisions or brigades were, killed, Richardson, Rodman, Goodrich, and Miles. Among the wounded were Hatch, Hartsuff, Sedgwick, Crawford, 
Dana, Weber, Wainwright, Gallagher, Barlow, and Tyndale. Among the Confederate generals were Guild, Garland, G. B. Anderson, Branch, Stark, and Douglas. Among the wounded were Lawton, R. H. Anderson, Wright, Ripley, J. R. Jones, and McRae. 10R28, 606.2 His losses at 2nd Manassas were actually 9,112.1 ropes, 2, 349.1 ropes, 2, 348.1 When troops are in masses, only the outside men can fire. The outside men are comparatively few, and hence the mass is weak for either offense or defense, until it can deploy into lines from which every individual can fire freely to the front. Hence troops, once broken, become almost helpless, and unable to defend themselves. As lines can only fire efficiently squarely to the front, or very nearly so, they also are helpless against fire coming from the flanks. Flank fire, too, is naturally of the most concentrated and fatal character, and troops exposed to it are quickly broken and helpless. Chapter XIV Fall of 1862 Political Situation Lincoln orders advance. A Confederate raid? Lincoln dissatisfied. Condition of Confederates. Reorganization. Lee moves to Culpeper. McClellan succeeded by Burnside. Plan of campaign changed. Burnside's strength. Lee's strength. Sumner at Falmouth. Non arrival of pontoons. Surrendered and mounded. Earthworks erected. Jackson arrives. Burnside's plan. Mayor's Hill. Building the bridges. The bombardment. The crossing made. December 12th. The plan changed. Jackson's line. Franklin advances. Gibbon supports Meade. Meade strikes Gregg. The counterstroke. Jackson's proposed attack. Casualties. On the Federal right. The formations. French and Hancock charge. Howard charges. Sturgis charges. Sunken road reinforced. Griffin's charge. Humphreys's first charge. Humphreys's second charge. Humphreys's report. Tyler's report. Getty's charge. Hawkins's account. A federal conference. December 14th, sharp shooting. December 15th, Burnside retreats. Flag of truce. Casualties. New plans. The mud march. Burnside relieved. After the Battle of Sharpsburg, rest, reorganization, and supplies were badly needed by both armies, and, as the initiative was now McClellan's, he determined not to move until he was thoroughly prepared. Lincoln had two months before drawn up his Emancipation Proclamation and was waiting for a victory to produce a favorable state of feeling for its issuance. Sharpsburg was now claimed as a victory, and, on September 22, the proclamation was issued freeing all slaves in any state which should be in rebellion on the coming January 1st. This was supposed to be a war measure, though nothing could have been more void of effect than it proved. McClellan did not approve of the proclamation, and he let his sentiments on the subject be known, although he issued a very proper order to the army, deprecating political discussion. His attitude, however, alienated him from the administration and the party in power in Washington. A few days after the battle, Lincoln had visited the army, and, on parting from McClellan, had expressed himself as entirely satisfied, and had told McClellan that he should not be forced to advance until he was ready. But when two weeks had passed, during which great quantities of supplies of all kinds were rushed to the army by every channel, McClellan on October 7 received instructions to cross the Potomac and give battle to the enemy, or drive him south. The army must move now while the roads are good. On receipt of this, McClellan conferred with his chief quartermaster, who thought that sufficient supplies would be on hand within three days. Meanwhile, on October 10 a fresh trouble arose. Stuart with 1800 cavalry and Pelham's battery had been sent by Lee upon a raid fording the Potomac, some fifteen miles above Williamsport, 
at dawn on the 10th, by dark Stuart reached Chambersburg, where he burned a machine shop, many loaded cars, and a supplely depot, paroled 285 sick and wounded Federals, and gathered about 500 horses. Next morning he moved to Emmitsburg, and thence below the mouth of the Monocacy, where he recrossed the Potomac, on the forenoon of the 12th. The distance travelled had been 126 miles, of which the last 80 from Chambersburg were accomplished without a halt. An epidemic of foot and mouth disease was prevailing at this time among the enemy's cavalry, comma 1, and the desperate efforts to intercept Stuart, made with reduced forces, put much of it out of condition for active service until they could get some rest and several thousand fresh horses. Pleasanton had made a march of 55 miles in 24 hours, part of the distance across the mountains by very bad roads, and a Varel's brigade had travelled 200 miles in four days. Stuart's loss was but one man wounded, and his conduct of the expedition was excellent. Yet the raid risked a great deal in proportion to the results accomplished. It might easily have happened that the whole command should be captured. But the incident contributed largely to McClellan's delay, and to the growing dissatisfaction of the government with his conduct. To Mr. Lincoln had allowed McClellan to decide whether his advance should be up the Shenandoah Valley, or east of the Blue Ridge, but expressed a preference for the latter route. McClellan, however, had decided to take the valley route, for fear of Lee's advancing into MD. And Pa. If it was left uncovered, both Lincoln and Halleck thought his fears groundless and his caution excessive. Neither of them believed the Confederate Army to be as immense as McClellan reported, and both knew that if the Federals needed supplies the Confederates needed them much more. In Lincoln's practical style, he often made pertinent suggestions to McClellan and would sometimes mingle with them a touch of sarcasm. He wrote that if Lee should cut in between the Army of the Potomac and Washington, McClellan would have nothing to do but to attack him in the rear. Soon after Stuart's raid, he suggested that if the enemy had more occupation south of the river, his cavalry would not be so likely to make raids north of it. And on October 25, he telegraphed McClellan in reply to a dispatch about sore-tongued and fatigued horses, Will you pardon me for asking what the horses of your army have done, since the Battle of Antietam, that fatigues anything? On October 26, McClellan put his army in motion, 19 days after his receipt of the President's order. By this time he was willing to adopt the line of advance east of the Blue Ridge, as the stage of water in the Potomac River now made all fords impracticable. The crossing was made at Berlin, about 10 miles below Harper's Ferry. Pontoon bridges were laid and the army crossed over rather leisurely, the last of it, Franklin's Corps, on November 1st and 2nd. We will now return to the Confederates, who, since Sharpsburg, have been resting and recuperating between Winchester and Bunker Hill. Our base of supplies was now Staunton, more than 100 miles distant, but over fairly good roads. Our trains were actively at work, bringing ammunition, food, and clothing and gradually our condition approached the normal. But the supply, even of wagons, was limited, and, as late as October 20, 55 were wanted for the reserve ordnance train of Longstreet's Corps, and 41 for that of Jackson. Meanwhile, as important as recruitment, a thorough reorganization took place, and at last we became an army rather than a collection of brigades, divisions, and batteries. In October Longstreet and Jackson were made lieutenant generals, and major generals and brigadiers were promoted and our 1st and 2d army corps were formed, following the example of the Federals nearly a year before. The formation of our batteries into battalions was also carried forward, but rather slowly. A large proportion of our guns were but 6 pr. and 12 pr. howitzers, which the enemy had now discarded as too light. There are no returns showing our different varieties of small arms, but that we still had men armed with flintlocks is shown by the return of 13 picked up on the field after the Battle of Fredericksburg. The organization, when completed, stood as follows. 
the strength being given from the returns of November 20, 1862. Organization of Army of Northern VA, November, 1862. On October 27, Lee moved with Longstreet's Corps and Pendleton's Reserve RT. Toward the eastern slope of the Blue Ridge. My reserve ordnance train moved on the 29th via Nineveh, Front Royal, Chester Gap, Gaines's Crossroads, and Sperryville, and encamped at Culpeper on November 4. Lee, in person, had already arrived there. A few days after, I was placed in command of the battalion of artillery which had been commanded by Col. S. D. Lee who was now promoted Brigadier General and sent to Vicksburg. My successor as Chief of Ordnance was Colonel Briscoe G. Baldwin, who served with great success until the surrender at Appomattox. Meanwhile, an important event was on foot. We have seen the lack of cordiality between McClellan and the President, and the growth of mistrust of the latter's intention to prosecute the active offensive campaign desired. On October 27 he had telegraphed the President urging the necessity of filling the old regiments with drafted men before taking them into action again. The tone of his letters had long been unsatisfactory, and this expression kindled into flame the growing suspicion that he was simply preparing new excuses for delay. Immediately on reading the message Lincoln showed himself ready to meet the issue by wiring back colon now I ask a distinct answer to the question. Is it your purpose not to go into action again until the men now being drafted in the states are incorporated into the old regiments? McClellan read between the lines the threat conveyed, and backed squarely down. He promptly explained that the offensive dispatch was the inadvertence of an aide, and promised to push forward as rapidly as possible and endeavor to meet the enemy. Indeed, the Confederates noted, during the next week, the unwanted vigor of his advance. There were constant sharp skirmishes, and the enemy got possession of the two lower gaps in the Blue Ridge, Snickers and Ashby's, and held the outlet of Manassas Gap. McClellan's headquarters were advanced to Rectortone. His cavalry occupied Warrenton, and it was evident that he would soon cross the Rappahannock. Then, suddenly, his activity ceased, and from November 9th to the 17th, the Federal Army laid quietly in its camps. His back down had come too late. He had been removed from the command on November 7, and Burnside substituted in his place. McClellan's promises of October 27 might have satisfied President Lincoln, but there were strong influences now determined upon a change, and which wanted not only the head of McClellan, but that of Porter. On November 5, the president wrote an order authorizing Halleck, in his own discretion, to relieve McClellan and to place Burnside in command of the army. Porter was also to be relieved from the command of the V Corps, and to be succeeded by Hooker. On the same date these formal orders were prepared and signed by Halleck, but they were not promulgated for two days. The designation of Burnside to succeed McClellan was a great surprise to old army circles, both in the Federal and Confederate armies, and was, perhaps, an unpleasant one to Burnside himself. He was popular, but not greatly esteemed as a general. He had commanded a brigade at the first battle of Bull Run, but had in no way risen above, even if he reached, the average of the brigade commanders. He had later had the luck to command the expedition to the NC Sounds, where his overwhelming force easily overcame the slight resistance that it met. This gained him the prestige, in newspapers and political circles, of successful independent command as commander of a corps. He was one of the four next in line for promotion, Burnside, Hooker, Sumner, and Franklin. The older officers dreaded Hooker's appointment. By many he was thought utterly unfit, though a brave man and a hard fighter. Moved by the wishes of his friends, Burnside was brought to accept the command rather than see it go to Hooker. McClellan was not unprepared for the blow and he met it gracefully and did all in his power to commend his successor to the confidence of the army. He had not, however, anticipated that he was to be relegated to private life, but had supposed that he would be transferred to some command in the West. But no other command was ever offered him. A few days later Burnside submitted to the President his plan for the campaign, and it was approved, though reluctantly. 
McClellan's plan had been to interpose between Lee's divided forces. Already he was not far from such a position. From Longstreet's court to Jackson's was over 40 miles by the roads across the mountains, and McClellan's forces were within 20 miles of either. But Lee could have delayed a march upon either, and, by falling back, might unite his two corps, behind the Robertson River, before accepting battle. This had been Lee's plan, if the threat of Jackson's position upon the Federal flank should fail to prevent their advance. Burnside's organization was as follows: Colon Burnside began his campaign with a blunder. He adopted Richmond as his objective, instead of Lee's army. The latter was within a day's march of him, and its wings were separated by two days' march. Here was an opportunity for a skillful commander, but Burnside decided to make Fredericksburg a base, and to move thence upon Richmond. On November 15, he turned his back upon Lee and marched for Fredericksburg. Meanwhile, he had made some important changes in his organization by the formation of three grand divisions out of his six corps in order to lessen the routine duties of his office. One besides the troops shown above, the right grand division comprised two brigades of cavalry and a battery, and each of the others, one brigade of cavalry and a battery. There was also an artillery reserve of twelve batteries, an engineer brigade with a pontoon train, and an escort and a provost guard of infantry and cavalry. On December 10, the return of the army showed present for duty, as follows colon the artillery comprised 374 guns. Besides these troops there were two corps, the 11th, with 15,562 present for duty, under Sigel, and the 12th, with 12,162, under Slocum, which Burnside called his reserve grand division. These troops, under command of Sigel were on the march to Fredericksburg, but they did not arrive until after the battle. Besides these, there were 51,970 holding the line of the Potomac above Washington, and the fortified lines about the city and Alexandria, with 284 guns of position, and 120 field pieces. Thus, all together, they were available for use against Lee and to protect the capital. 198,546 men and about 900 guns. On the same day, December 10, Lee's return showed his present for duty, by divisions, as follows colon adding Pendleton's reserve artillery, 718, Stuart's cavalry, 9,146, and 41 general staff, we have Lee's aggregate, 78,483, and about 250 guns. This was practically the largest army which Lee ever had in the field. Possibly, during the seven days, more troops were near Richmond, but, being organized only in divisions, or in independent brigades and batteries, and thus less easy to handle, they constituted a much less powerful army. As before stated, on November 15, Burnside commenced his movement upon Fredericksburg. Sumner's Grand Division leading the way. Already his cavalry had made reconnaissances which had attracted attention, and Lee, on the 15th, had sent a regiment of cavalry, one of infantry, and a battery to reinforce four companies of infantry and a battery already at Fredericksburg. Orders were also sent to destroy the railroad from Fredericksburg to Aquia Creek. On the 17th it was learned that gunboats and transports had entered Aquia Creek, on which W. H. F. Lee's brigade of cavalry was dispatched in that direction, and Stuart was ordered to force a crossing of the Rappahannock and reconnoitre toward Warrenton. This was done on the 18th, and the enemy's general movement was discovered. A part of Longstreet's corps was put in motion on the 18th and the remainder followed next day. Sumner's corps arrived at Falmouth on the 17th, and an artillery duel ensued, across the river, rashly provoked by the Confederates, who had orders to oppose any force attempting to cross. It really came near inducing the enemy to cross, though under orders from Burnside not to do so. For under the superior metal of the Federals, the Confederate gunners were driven from their guns. There was a ford in the vicinity and the temptation was strong to come over for them, 
but the existence of orders prevented its being done. For Burnside had feared that Lee would overwhelm any small force which should cross before he was prepared to support it. Lincoln and Halleck, indeed, had only consented to the movement via Fredericksburg with the understanding that the army should possess itself of the heights opposite the town by crossing the river above and coming down. Burnside had deliberately changed this plan, after starting on the march. After the battle, his personal responsibility for the change result was brought home to him unpleasantly. Swinton asserts that Burnside, did not favor operating against Richmond by the overland route, but had his mind turned toward a repetition of McClellan's movement to the peninsula, and in determining to march to Fredericksburg he cherished the hope of being able to win to there upon an easy base of supplies, and in the spring embarking his army for the James River. The three weeks delay between his arrival and his crossing the river suggests the lack of definite plans. At first the delay was attributed to the non-arrival of pontoon trains. These trains had been ordered on November 6 from Rectortone to Washington City. This order failed to reach Berlin until the 12th. Sumner was anxious to cross, and asked Burnside if he might do so without waiting for pontoons, if he could find a ford. He had found the ford before he made the request, but Burnside's inclinations were adverse to a battle and he could not be beguiled. So the small Confederate force held the town until the 20th, when Longstreet arrived with McClellan's division, and was followed the next day by the remainder of the corps. On the 21st, Sumner sent a formal demand for the surrender of the town, basing it upon the statement that his troops had been fired upon from under cover of the houses and that mills and manufactories in the town were furnishing provisions and clothing to the enemy. He demanded an answer by 5 p.m., and said that if the surrender was not immediate at 9 next morning, he would shell the town, the intermediate 16 hours being allowed for the removal of women and children. This note, only received by the mayor at 4.40 p.m., was referred to Longstreet who authorized a reply to be made that the city would not be used for the purposes complained of, but that the Federals could only occupy the town by force of arms. Mayor Slaughter pointed out that the civil authorities had not been responsible for the firing which had been done, and, further, that during the night it would be impossible to remove the non-combatants. During the night Sumner sent word that in consideration of the pledges made, and, in view of the short time remaining for the removal of women and children, the batteries would not open as had been proposed. But the letter left it to be inferred that the purpose to shell was only postponed, and Lee, who had now arrived, advised the citizens to vacate the town. This advice was followed by the greater part of the population. It was pitiable to see the refugees endeavoring to remove their possessions and encamping in the woods and fields, for miles around. During the unusually cold weather which soon followed. This incident is responsible for the existence of most of the earthworks, which, at the time of the battle, contributed largely to the repulse of the enemy's assaults upon Mare's Hill. Great sympathy, of course, was felt for the citizens, and Lee, immediately after his arrival, ordered batteries to be erected, from which the enemy's positions, upon the hills commanding the town from the north, could be replied to by our rifled guns, in case of their shelling the town. Lee at first had not intended to give battle at Fredericksburg, but had proposed after delaying the enemy to fall back behind the North Anna River, and to deliver his battle there. Both he and Jackson objected to the position at Fredericksburg that the river, with the commanding positions on the north bank, could always afford a safe retreat to a beaten enemy, as the anti atam had done at Sharpsburg. This was undoubtedly true, as was soon afterward proved when the battle took place. At the North Hanna the enemy, if defeated, might be successfully pursued and some fruits of victory be gathered. But the position at Fredericksburg soon began to show its good points, and as the country behind the Rappahannock was able to supply some subsistence which would otherwise be lost, it was decided to give battle at Fredericksburg. Against Jackson's protest. Burnside's pontoons arrived on November 25th. By this time, a few earthworks showed upon the Confederate hills, and led him to delay, and to reconnoitre the river for a flank movement. 
Above Fredericksburg the country was hilly and wooded. The river was narrow, and there were several fords. These features would have made a crossing easy to accomplish by a surprise. Below the town the river widened, and the country opened. Yet Burnside adopted that flank for his movement, and began his preparations to cross at Skinker's Neck, twelve miles below Fredericksburg, where the river was over one thousand feet wide. Lee discovered his preparations, and as Jackson's corps had arrived from the valley about November 29, it was moved to the right, and observed the river as far as Port Royal, eighteen miles below. Jackson had not left Winchester until November 22, five days after Sumner's arrival at Falmouth. His troops had marched 150 miles in ten days, but Lee and Jackson had both presumed largely on Burnside's want of enterprise in allowing, for even a few days, 150 miles to separate the two corps. Lee had given no express orders to Jackson, but as late as November 19, had written him to remain in the valley as long as his presence embarrassed the enemy, hut to keep in view that the two corps must be united in order to give battle. The Federal Army was supplied with balloons. McClellan had used them on the peninsula, but during Pope's campaign, and in MD, they had not been seen, although the open character of the country would have often exposed and embarrassed the most important movements of the Confederates, had balloonists been on the lookout. Now, the balloons reconnoitering the country about Skinker's Neck, discovered Jackson's camps, and Burnside knew that his designs were disclosed. The discovery suggested an alternate piece of strategy. If he could cross at Fredericksburg, and rapidly push a force around Lee's right at Hamilton's crossing, he might interpose between the forces about Skinker's Neck and those in front of Fredericksburg. The pressure upon him to fight was great and on December 10 the orders were issued for a crossing that night. The program was as follows colon two bridges were to be thrown across the river at the upper end of the town, one bridge at the lower end, and two about a mile below the town. Where the bridges were in pairs, one was for the use of artillery and one for infantry. The pontoon trains were to arrive opposite the chosen sites at 3 a.m., and unload the boats and material. By daylight this was to be finished and the boats placed in the river. The bridges were then to be built in from two to three hours. In length they would be from 400 to 440 feet. The weather was unusually cold, the thermometer being 24 degrees above zero. The ice in the river was about an inch thick. The bridges would be concealed from Confederate fire by the town. On the north bank. 179 federal guns were put in position during the night, to cover the crossing, and it was believed that they could instantly silence any musketry fire from the opposite bank. There had been ample time for the construction of formidable earthworks and abattis, had Lee originally intended to receive battle there. Probably 30 pits had been made, each for a single gun, but in few places had any protection for infantry been provided except upon the river bank in front of the town. This portion of the line was under charge of McClure's, who had carefully located every sharpshooter with reference to his protection and his communications. Elsewhere there was little preparation of any sort. There was, however, one natural feature which proved of great value. The Confederate line occupied a range of low hills nearly parallel to the river and a few hundred yards back from the town. The telegraph road, sunken from three to five feet below the surface, skirted the bottom of these hills for about 800 yards, until it reached the valley of Hazel Run, into which it turned. This sunken road was made part of the line of battle for McClellan's infantry. It not only formed a parapet invisible to the enemy until its defenders rose to fire over it, but it afforded ample space for several ranks to load and fire, and still have room behind them for free communication along the line. In easy canister range, nine guns on the hills above could fire over the heads of the infantry. This position was known as Mare's Hill. The crossing had been expected for some days, and orders given for two signal guns, whenever it was attempted. On the 10th, Burnside's army was ordered to cook three days' rations and the news was quickly conveyed to Lee, being shouted across the river to one of our pickets. At 2 a.m., 
the pickets reported that pontoon trains could be heard on the opposite bank, and at 4.30 a.m. the building of the bridges commenced. The signal guns were fired about 5 a.m., and the different brigades and batteries, already alert, quickly took positions in the early dawn. The day was calm and clear except for a peculiar smoky haze or dry fog which now prevailed in the forenoons for several days. In the early hours it limited vision to a range of scarcely 100 yards, but, as the sun rose higher, it faded and disappeared by noon. The sharpshooters along the riverfront had reserved their fire until after the discharge of the signal guns. They then opened upon the bridge builders, who could now be dimly seen, and soon drove them off the bridges with some loss. A heavy fire of infantry and artillery was opened in reply, upon the Confederate rifle pits, under which they became silent. After a half hour's fire, the bridge builders made a fresh attempt but their appearance provoked fresh volleys from Barksdale, whose brigade was holding the city, and again the bridges were cleared. Several efforts of this sort were made during the morning, all resulting similarly, and the casualties in the engineer brigade, which had the work in charge, ran up to near fifty dot at the site selected for Franklin's crossing about a mile below the city, there was no opposition, for there was no shelter for even a Confederate skirmish line. The bridges here were finished by 11 a.m. Franklin, however, was ordered not to cross until the resistance at the town had been overcome. Here, by 11 a.m., the engineer brigade had abandoned the task of building bridges under fire. When this state of affairs was reported to Burnside, he ordered every gun in range of the city to fire 50 rounds into it. Probably 100 guns responded and the spectacle which was now presented from the Confederate hilltops was one of the most magnificent and impressive in the whole course of the war. The city, except its steeples, was still veiled in the mist which had settled in the valleys. Above it and in it incessantly showed the round white clouds of bursting shells, and out of its midst there soon rose three or four columns of dense black smoke from houses set on fire by the explosions. The atmosphere was so perfectly calm and still that the smoke rose vertically in great pillars for several hundred feet before spreading outward in black sheets. The opposite bank of the river, for two miles to the right and left, was crowned at frequent intervals with blazing batteries, canopied in clouds of white smoke. Beyond these, the dark blue masses of over 100,000 infantry in compact columns, and numberless parks of white-topped wagons and ambulances massed in orderly ranks, all awaited the completion of the bridges. The earth shook with the thunder of the guns, and, high above all, a thousand feet in the air, hung two immense balloons. The scene gave impressive ideas of the disciplined power of a great army, and of the vast resources of the nation which had sent it forth. Under cover of this storm of shell, the Federal bridge builders again ventured upon their bridges and tried to extend them, but the artillery fire had been at random into the town, and not carefully aimed at the locations of the sharpshooters. Consequently, these had not been much affected, and presently the faint cracks of their rifles could be heard, between the reports of the guns. The contrast in sound was great, but the rifle fire was so effective that, again, the bridges were deserted. Indeed, the promiscuous fire of bombardment seldom accomplishes any result. Carnot, in his defense of strong places, says that they are resorted to when effective means are lacking. No citizen was reported injured, though many left the town only after firing began in the morning, and some remained during the whole occupation by the Federals. Presently, Gen. Hunt, chief of artillery, suggested an expedient. There were ten pontoon boats in the water along the north shore. On the southern shore the sharpshooters, a little back from the high brink of the river, could only see the farther half of its width. Hunt proposed that troops should make a rush and fill the boats. These should then be rowed rapidly across to the shelter of the opposite shore, where the men could disembark under cover. A lodgment once made, other troops could follow until a force was accumulated which could capture the rifle pits. This sensible course, which should have been the one first adopted in the morning, under cover of the fog, was now tried. Four regiments, the 7th Michigan, 
the 19th and 20th Mass, and the 89th NY, volunteered for the crossing. The first boats suffered some casualties, but were soon safe under shelter of the bank. Other installments followed, and the Confederates, appreciating that their game was up, and that the bridges below the town were already available, began to withdraw. The Pontoniers now returned to their work, and the bridges were completed. Some skirmishing took place in the streets, and a few were cut off and captured. But the defense had practically gained the entire day. For although a division of the 6th Corps crossed in the afternoon, it was subsequently recalled, all but one brigade, left to guard the bridgeheads during the night. This delay robbed Burnside's strategy of its only merit. It had been his help to find Lee's army somewhat dispersed, as indeed it had been, d. h. Hill's and Early's divisions having been at Skinker's Neck and Port Royal, 12 to 22 miles away but they were recalled on the 12th and reached the field on the morning of the 13th after hard marching. The casualties suffered by the Confederates engaged in this defense were 224 killed and wounded and 105 missing. Of the Federal losses, separate reports were made only of the Engineer Brigade, engaged upon the bridge work. This lost 50 killed and wounded and Hancock reported the loss of 150 in two regiments which had supported the engineers. The night was quite cold, the thermometer falling to 26 degrees. While this is not extreme for this latitude and season, it caused great suffering among the troops from the south, generally thinly clad, and for some months far from railroad transportation. Especially was this the case on the picket lines where fires were forbidden. Kershaw reported it a night of such intense cold as to cause the death of one man, and to disable temporarily others. The whole of the 12th was occupied in crossing two grand divisions. Sumner crossed the 2D and the 9th Corps by the upper bridges and occupied the town. Franklin crossed the 1st and 6th Corps by the lower bridges and occupied the plain as far out as the Bowling Green Road, a half mile from the river and the same distance in front of the wooded range of hills occupied by Jackson's Corps. Much has been said of the strength of the Confederate position upon the hills overlooking the plateau of the valley, with its sunken road in front of Mare's Hill. The Federal position was even a stronger one, against any attack by the Confederates. The dominating hills and plateaus of the North Bank, with its concave bend at Falmouth and unlimited positions for artillery, protected by the wet ditch, as it were, of the river in front, practically constituted a fortress, with the plains of the south bank as its glassy. The Bowling Green Road, along their middle, running between high banks on each side, made a powerful advanced work, and the low bluffs near the river made a second line. The Confederate line, also concave in its general shape and dominating the plains between, was strong against assaults in front but neither flank was secure against being turned. Its right especially was in the air at Hamilton's crossing, and Burnside planned to attack this flank. Franklin's Grand Division had been strengthened for that purpose by three divisions assigned to his support. One of them, Burns's, of the Ninth Corps, was already across the Rappahannock and on the left of Sumner, separated from Franklin's right only by Deep Run, across which bridges had been laid. The other two were Sickles's and Burney's divisions of the 3D Corps, of Hooker's Grand Division, which was still upon the north side, but close to the bridges, in readiness to cross. With these troops, Franklin had nearly 60,000 men. During the afternoon of the 12th, Franklin had urged that these two divisions should be brought over during the night, and that preparations should be made for an advance at daylight. Burnside promised to order it but the order was not given until the next morning. He apparently lacked confidence in himself and shrank back from his own plans as the moment of execution drew near. Franklin had been informed that Burnside would give the final order which should put his force in motion. About 7 a.m. on the 13th an order came, but it was not at all the order expected. It made no reference to the plans of the day before but ordered Franklin to keep his whole command in position for a rapid movement down the old Richmond Road. Then he was to send out, at once, 
a division, at least, to seize, if possible, the height near Captain Hamilton's on this side of the Massapanax, taking care to keep it well supported and its line of retreat open. The order went on to tell Franklin what Sumner was to be doing at the same time. He was also to send a division or more up the plank road to its intersection with the telegraph road, where they will divide with the view of seizing the heights on both of these roads. Then the order set forth what he hoped to accomplish. Holding these two heights, he hopes will compel the enemy to evacuate the whole ridge between them. It is enough to say that this change from a single attack with full force upon our right, to two weak and isolated attacks on the right and left, lost the battle. Being ordered to send at least a division, Franklin designated the 1st Corps under Reynolds for the attack upon the height at Hamilton's Crossing. Meade's division was to lead, closely followed and supported by Gibbon, Doubleday's was to protect the left flank of the advance, which was threatened by Stuart's artillery. Franklin would have also sent a portion of the 6th Corps, but it had been placed in position for the attack first planned, and time would have been lost by a change. The Confederate right flank was not well prepared to stand the coming shock in view of the long warning it had had. The fact was that Jackson's troops had been in observation of the river below, and had only arrived upon the field on the 12th. Previously, this flank had been held only by Hood's division, and during its stay, little probability of attack had been foreseen. Consequently, Hood made but two works of preparation. On the edge of the woods, overlooking the railroad, a trench had been dug long enough to hold a brigade and a half, and through the thick wood five hundred yards in the rear, a road had been cleared, affording communication behind the general line which occupied the wooded hills. On the 12th A. P. Hill was placed in front to cover about a mile and a half of line with his six brigades. On the extreme right he posted fourteen guns, and supported them with half of Brock and Braw's brigade. No other position for artillery offered along the front until the left of the division was reached. Here twelve guns were advanced north of the railroad, and twenty-one more were placed upon a low, open hill, south of the road some two hundred yards to the left and rear, supported by Pender's brigade. The wooded hills between these positions were held by the four remaining brigades, but no two of them connected with each other. On the right, the other half of Brock and Braw's and Archer's brigade occupied the trenches which had been built by Hood. Archer's left rested on a swampy portion of the wood overgrown with underbrush, and it had carelessly been assumed to be impassable. Major Jon Bork, a German officer on Stuart's staff, had suggested felling it, but it was not thought worthwhile. On the far side of this swamp, Lane's brigade took up the line, the gap between it and Archer's being about 500 yards. Beyond Lane was another considerable gap to his left and rear, where Pender's brigade was supporting the 12 and 21 guns before referred to. Behind Lane, about 400 yards, was Thomas's brigade. The remaining brigade of the division, Gregg's, was placed in the military road opposite the swamp and gap between Archer and Lane. If we call this disposition of Hill's troops one of two lines, a third line was formed by the divisions of Early and Tallier Furrow, Early on the right, a short distance in rear, and a fourth one by the division of D. H. Hill in rear of that. Burnside was losing one of the advantages of his superior force by concentrating it upon too short a front. He was hemmed in on the left by Massapanax Creek, and was confined to a front attack. With only a mile and a half to defend and with about 30,000 infantry in hand, covered by the woods from accurate artillery fire, Jackson was very strong. With this understanding of the positions and forces the result might have been predicted. The faulty disposition of A.P. Hill's division, with two gaps in his front line, would surely allow to the enemy a temporary success but the strong reserves close at hand were enough to restore the battle, and even induce a counterstroke. The counterstroke, however, must be driven back with loss when it ventures out into the plain. With this foregone result of the game set forth, we may now briefly describe the moves by which it was played on the left, before taking up the independent battle to be fought out during the whole afternoon by the Federal right. During the night of the 12th, the ground was frozen, 
and the movements of artillery could be plainly heard through the fog, even before dawn brought the music of bands and commands of officers all strangely muffled but clearly audible in the still air. We were now about to measure our strength with the largest and best equipped army that had ever stood upon a battlefield in America. But our own army was better organized and stronger than ever before, and now, finding itself concentrated at exactly the right moment, it was as confident and elated as if the victory had already been won. About 10 a.m., the gradual clearing of the mist began to reveal the plain, and the Federal skirmishers and guns began to feel for our positions. Our own guns took little or no part in this preliminary firing, saving themselves for the approach of the hostile infantry. This was not long delayed, Meade's division of three brigades taking the lead, supported by Gibbon's division, a little in rear on its right flank, and double days on its left. Some delay ensued in their crossing the Bowling Green Road, owing to the hedges and ditches lining it, which had to be made passable for the artillery and here the Confederates first took the aggressive. From across the Massapunax the gallant Pelham, as he was called by Lee in his report to Richmond for the day, opened an enfilading fire upon the Federal lines with two guns which he had advanced within easy range. Meade replied with twelve guns, and one of Doubleday's batteries assisted. Pelham frequently changed his position, but kept up his fire for nearly an hour until ordered by Jackson to withdraw one gun having been disabled. The advance was now resumed until within easy range, when a furious cannonade was opened upon the Confederate line, and maintained for nearly an hour. To this our guns made little reply, but both the artillery and infantry, concealed in the woods, suffered a good many casualties. It was now about 11.30 a.m., and Meade's infantry again advanced and were soon within 800 yards of the Confederate batteries. These opened with the 47 guns in position upon the two flanks, and eight more sent out from Pendleton's reserve to Pelham. Under this fire the Federal advance was checked, and portions of the line, which received the brunt of it, were driven back. Meanwhile, fresh guns were added to the Federal line. The artillery duel raged for over an hour, when the Confederate fire ceased, the enemy's infantry being no longer in sight and the Confederate guns low in ammunition. Upon this check, Gibbon's division was sent to Meade's support and formed in column of brigades on Meade's right flank. Meade had two brigades in his front line, and his remaining brigade in a second line in close support. Doubleday's division was moved up nearer behind Meade's left, and engaged with Stuart's skirmishers and artillery across the Massapunax. Burney's and Newton's divisions of the 3D and 6th Corps were also sent forward to the Bowling Green Road to support the attack, which Meade, at 1 p.m., was about to renew with Gibbon on his right. So the assault had a front of three brigades, and was three lines deep behind the right brigade, two lines deep behind the center brigade, and only one line deep on the left. The Confederate artillery fire at once reopened, but in weaker force than before owing to its losses and expenditures, and the attacking forces were soon within musket range. Crashes of infantry now swelled the roar to the proportions of a great battle, mingling with a similar tumult which had now broken out in front of Fredericksburg. The battle was now on in its full force at two points, nearly five miles apart. Franklin's part in it was of the shortest duration and will be first told. Gibbon's division on Meade's right overlapped the left flank of Lane's brigade, and came in front of the 33 guns on A.P. Hill's left. The 12 in advance had to be withdrawn to escape capture, but Gibbon's three brigades were able to do no more than to fight their way up to the railroad with the loss of 1,267 men the two foremost brigades being successively broken and reinforced by the brigade following. On Meade's extreme left, his 3D brigade, under Gen. C. F. Jackson, found the artillery fire from the 14-gun battery on Hill's right so effective that it abandoned the direct advance, and, inclining to the right, it moved behind Meade's other brigades and took part in their fight which has now to be described. The marshy woods before referred to, which filled the wide gap between Archer and Lane, extended in a long triangle to the front across the railroad. 
the March of Meade's division brought its right brigade into this wood, where the men found themselves free from the Confederate artillery fire. Not only were they hidden from view, but they were too far to the left for the guns on the right flank, and too far to the right for the guns on the left flank. It was this immunity from fire which brought C.F. Jackson's brigade into the woods, and thus formed Meade's division into a column of three brigades. This column, without firing a shot or meeting a picket, made its way entirely through the woods, until it fell upon Archer's left flank and Lane's right flank, turning each, and capturing about 300 prisoners. Archer's men were so taken by surprise that some of his troops were caught with their arms stacked. Two regiments were quickly routed, and it was said that they were fired on as they retreated by their own comrades, who believed them to be deserting their posts without cause. But the other regiments of Archer's brigade held firmly, repulsing the enemy by the help of the troops on their right. Lane's brigade, attacked in front by Gibbon's division and its right flank turned by Meade's through the unoccupied gap, was forced back in the woods, until Thomas's brigade came to its support. This soon restored the line. Of Meade's three brigades, the leading one was drawn into these separate fights upon each flank, while the second brigade continued to push forward. In this way it advanced unseen and unmolested for 500 yards, when it came upon the brigade of Gregg at rest in the so-called military road. Meade immediately opened a hot fire. Gregg could not realize that a federal brigade could be so far within our lines. He rushed in front of Orr's regiment, beating up the muskets of men who were firing and calling out that they were firing on friends, until he fell mortally wounded. This was the culmination of the Federal attack, and its collapse came quickly. Orr's regiment was broken, but the rest of the brigade stood firm, and changed front to meet the Federal advance. The latter were already in confusion when Lawton's brigade came to reinforce Craig and the enemy was driven back rapidly. Hoke's brigade was also sent to the assistance of Archer, and Early's brigade to support Lane and Thomas. The whole Federal advance was driven from the woods and pursued out into the plain. The troops of Archer, Lane, and Thomas, or portions of them, joined in the counter-stroke, and the whole of both Meade's and Gibbon's divisions were involved and carried along with the retreat but there was no adequate debauchment from the dense woods for rapid advance, and when the Confederates, disorganized by the pursuit, met the fresh troops of the enemy, the advance was checked, and, unpursued, it fell back to the line of the railroad. Indeed, the whole advance beyond the railroad had been unwise. Its only result would surely be the loss of the most daring of the pursuers and the loss of such men from a brigade is like the loss of temper from a blade. One, the Federals made no further effort on their left during the day, and distant sharpshooting, with intermittent artillery, was now the only activity until near sundown, which occurred about 4.45. Burnside, at 1 p.m., had sent orders to Franklin to attack with the 6th Corps on the right of Gibbon and at 2 p.m. had repeated the order urgently and explicitly. But about this time Meade and Gibbon were driven back, and pursued, and put so completely out of action that fresh divisions had to replace them. When his left had been made secure, Franklin thought it too late to organize a fresh attack. Jackson had noted within the Federal lines movements of troops and artillery with which they were preparing themselves to resist further attack. He had misinterpreted them and supposed them to be preparations for a renewed assault. His appetite for battle had not been satisfied, and seeing the heavy force at the enemy's disposal, he could not believe that they would be content with an affair of only two or three divisions. He accordingly waited to receive the expected assault, and finally, when it did not materialize, he determined to take the offensive himself. Apparently, he did not yet fully appreciate that the enemy's position was practically a citadel. But he fortunately discovered it in time. While his assault was being prepared, he had indulged in some preliminary cannonading, which had put the enemy fully on the alert. In his official report, he writes, in order to guard against disaster the infantry was to be preceded by artillery, and the movement postponed until later in the evening, so that, if compelled to retire, it would be under the cover of night. 
Owing to unexpected delays the movement could not be gotten ready until late in the evening. The first gun had hardly moved forward from the wood 100 yards when the enemy's artillery reopened, and so completely swept our front as to satisfy me that the proposed movement should be abandoned. A. P. Hill's division, which bore the brunt of the fighting on the 13th, out of 11,000, lost 2,122 men. Early's, which came to his support, lost 932 out of 7,500. The other divisions lost less than 200 each, principally from the heavy artillery fire which the enemy threw into the woods. Meade's division, out of 5,000, lost 1853, and Gibbon lost 1,267. So the casualties of the two fighting divisions on each side were nearly balanced the Confederate loss being 3,054 out of about 18,500 engaged, and the Federal, 3,120 out of about 10,000 engaged. We will now take up affairs at Fredericksburg. In his plans on the 12th, Burnside had not proposed a direct attack from the town, but on the 13th, as already told, had directed Sumner to prepare to assault Mayor's Hill with at least two divisions but he was not to advance until Burnside gave the order. At first he proposed to give it only when Franklin had gotten possession of the hill at Hamilton's crossing, but about 10.30, becoming impatient, he delayed no longer. The selection of the point of attack immediately opposite the town was perhaps influenced by the shelter afforded the troops within the town. But it was a fatal mistake. The most obvious, and the proper attack for the Federal right, was one turning the Confederate left along the very edge of the river above Falmouth, supported by artillery on the north bank which could enfilade and take in reverse the Confederate left flank. This attack is indicated by the concave north bank of the river, and it offered the easiest proposition to the Federals of the whole topography. Sumner's Grand Division numbered about 27,000 on the field. Hooker's Grand Division had not yet been brought across the river except the two divisions supporting Franklin. The other four, Whipple of the 3D Corps, and Griffin, Sykes, and Humphreys of the 5th, were held near the upper bridges, and were all brought across during the day. They numbered about 26,000. Burnside's position during the battle was at the Phillips House, on a commanding hill a mile north of the river. Lee made his headquarters on a hill, since called Lee's Hill overlooking Hazel Run and the eastern half of the field in front of the town. 2.30 pr. Parrot rifles were located in pits on this hill, and were used with good effect upon the enemy advancing from the lower part of the town, until one exploded at its 39th round, and the other at its 54th. Here Lee and Longstreet stood during most of the fighting, and it is told that, on one of the federal repulses from Mayor's Hill, Lee put his hand upon Longstreet's arm and said, It is well that war is so terrible, or we would grow too fond of it. Sumner's advance from the town began about noon. With skirmishers in front, French moved his brigades by parallel streets, and, crossing on bridges the little canal, about twenty feet wide and four feet deep, some three hundred yards from the town, they formed successively for the attack in a considerable sheltered area. Between the canal and the low bluff of a plateau which extended to the front some 400 to 500 yards from the sunken road at the foot of Mare's Hill. The three brigades of French formed in the order Kimball, Andrews, Palmer. In close support came Hancock with Zook, Meagher, and Caldwell. Howard's division was also brought out from the town as a further support. There was no special difficulty in coming from the town and getting under cover in the sheltered area above described, although it was done under fire of our artillery. The real trouble would lie in advancing about 400 yards across the plateau to the sunken road. There was no intervening abattis or ditch, but there were some small houses, gardens, and fences, affording some shelter, but breaking the continuity of the ranks. These two divisions numbered about 9,000 men. The front line of the Confederate defense was held by three Georgia regiments in the sunken Telegraph Road, the 18th, 24th, and Phillips Legion of Cobb's Brigade. 
the 24th NC of Ransoms held an infantry trench, which extended from the telegraph to the plank road dot on the crest of the hill above the road were 412 PR. Guns, 212 PR. Howitzers, and 310 PR. Rifles, comprising the three batteries of the New Orleans Washington artillery under Col. Walton. On the left of the plank road were four guns of Moran's battery, in pits, and, at Stansbury's house, Parker's battery of Alexander's battalion, with four guns, found positions during the afternoon to fire upon the enemy's right flank. His left flank was also partially exposed to the fire of the two parrots on Lee's Hill. The infantry in the sunken road and ditch numbered at the commencement of the action only about 2,000, but in support behind Mare's Hill were about 7,000 more, most of whom were brought into action later. As each of the six brigades at short intervals was advanced over the crest of the plateau, it met the Confederate fire. Kimball's brigade led, and no brigade during the day advanced farther, and but few as far. But he was wounded and his brigade repulsed with a loss of 520 men within 20 minutes. Andrew's brigade followed, and was likewise driven back with the loss of 342. Palmer, who came next, lost 291. The whole loss of the division, including its artillery which fired from the edge of the town, was 1160. About this time Ransom, seeing preparations for further attack, reinforced his line by Cook's brigade. The 27th, NC took position in the sunken road, and the 15th, 46th, and 48th occupied the crest of the hill, giving a second tier of infantry fire. The remnants of French's division, extending to right and left, took shelter in slight undulations and kept up fire both at the Confederate guns and infantry. Hancock's division soon followed French's and with a similar experience, but more prolonged and bloody. His leading brigade, Zooks, lost 527. The second, Meagers, lost 545, and the third, Caldwell's, lost 952. The loss of the division was 2032. The battle at this point had developed into a fearful example of successive attacks by small forces, the same vicious game which had lost 2D Manassas and Sharpsburg. But Burnside was now obstinate, and was ordering in fresh troops upon each of his two battlefields. The turn of Howard's division came next. He had been at first directed to attack upon his right of the plank road and was preparing to do so, when Hancock called for supports, and Howard was diverted to the same field. His leading brigade, Owens, did not push its assault so far as to be broken by the Confederate fire, but laid down where it could find a little cover. It was able here to hold its position until relieved after nightfall. His losses were 258. Howard's second brigade was Hall's which was sent upon its charge somewhat to the right of the ground covered by the preceding charges. He was broken, rallied, charged again, and was again driven back, when he also found shelter, halted his command, and held on until night, having lost 515 men. Howard's 3rd Brigade was Sully's, which was kept in reserve, and two regiments sent to reinforce Owens, and one to Hall. The losses in this brigade reached 122. Howard's entire loss was 914. Couch's whole corps had now been practically wrecked with a loss of 4,114 men, in fighting eight separate battles with his nine brigades, against a force not half his size, all within four hours. Next to the left of Couch's corps was the 9th, under Wilcox. Sturgis's division of two brigades was on its right, occupying the lower portion of the city. Next came Getty's division of two brigades under cover of the bluffs at the mouth of Hazel Run. Burns's division of three brigades on the left connected with Franklin at Deep Run, and was under his orders. During the day Burns went across Deep Run to Franklin's support. When French's division was advanced, Sturgis was ordered to support it upon its left. He threw forward Dickinson's battery and Ferrero's brigade. 
the battery received a heavy fire from guns on a near Lee's hill, and was soon disabled and withdrawn, Dickinson being killed. Ferrero advanced from the lower part of the city to the left of the ground over which French and Hancock had fought. He did not have the canal to cross, as it terminated near the railroad. He met a severe fire, however, and finding depressions of ground in which his troops could get cover, his brigade occupied them for the rest of the day and fired from 60 to 200 rounds per man at the Confederate lines and batteries. Sturgis's second brigade, under Nagel, about an hour later, was ordered to support Sturgis's on the left. After some delay in crossing ravines, this brigade also found cover somewhat to Ferrero's rear, which had occupied and joined in the fire upon the Confederate lines until dark. Ferrero's casualties were 491 and Nagel's 500. About 3 p.m., Ferrero having asked for reinforcements, and Griffin's division having reported as support to the 9th Corps, Barnes's brigade, of that division, was sent in over the same ground that Ferrero had traversed. This brigade also made a gallant advance, but finally took cover with the loss of 500. Meanwhile, Whipple's division of the 3D Corps, of two brigades, which had been placed at the upper end of the town to guard the right flank, having no enemy close in front, sent Carroll's brigade to support Sturgis. Griffin placed Schweitzer's brigade on the right of Carroll, and sent forward the two brigades supporting them with Stockton's brigade, the last of his division. This charge of Griffin's was the eleventh separate effort made up to this time. But the infantry fire met was now being constantly increased, the telegraph road affording the opportunity. Cobb had been killed and Cook, soon after, severely wounded early in the affair. On the latter event, Kershaw with his brigade was ordered up, and about the same time, Ransom brought up the remaining three regiments of his brigade. Some of these troops doubled upon those already in the sunken road, until there were six ranks. These were effectively handled by Kershaw in person. Others took the best partial cover they could find about the top and slopes of the hill, whence their fire contributed to that from the sunken road. The the six ranks fired successive volleys from each rank, with only a few seconds intervals. A regiment from Jenkins's brigade was also advanced down the right bank of Hazel Run, reinforcing a company of sharpshooters which had been doing fine service all day upon the enemy's flanks. Under this increased fire, Griffin's charge differed but little in its results from those immediately preceding it. The men advanced as far as they could find some partial protection and there they laid down. Carroll's brigade here lost 118, Schweitzer's 222, and Stockton's 201. It was now nearly four o'clock and there came a comparative lull in the conflict. But Hooker was under orders to attack with his whole force, and he had yet attacked Humphreys's and Sykes's divisions of the 5th Corps. Even before Griffin's charge, Hooker had looked at the field and become so convinced that the Confederate line could not be carried, that he had sent an aide to Burnside to say that he advised against attack. The answer came that the attack must be made. Hooker, however, considered it a duty to his troops to make a fuller explanation, and endeavored to dissuade Burnside from what he was sure would be a hopeless effort. Burnside still insisted that the position must be carried before night. Hooker, accordingly returned and began to prepare for the attack by advancing as many batteries as could be located on the edge of the town, and even sending two, Hazards and Franks, across the canal, where they opened with a range of less than 300 yards. While these preparations were going on, the troops holding the hollows and undulations in front, where they had found shelter when the charges had been repulsed, reported that the Confederates were withdrawing from their positions. This report was quickly spread and reached Couch, who said to Humphreys, Hancock reports the enemy is falling back. Now is the time for you to go in. One Humphreys's division was composed of two brigades, Alabashes and Tylers, and it went into action 4,500 strong. It was already under urgent orders to attack. Alabash's brigade was in front, and Tylers in motion to get upon its right flank. Now. Without waiting for Tyler, Humphreys ordered Labush to advance, and, throwing themselves in front, 
he and Labosh led the charge. In about 200 yards they reached the continuous line now formed of the fragments of the preceding charges, lying down where they could find cover. Here, in spite of all their efforts, Alabash's troops also laid down and began to fire. Humphreys could now see the Confederate line, and appreciated that it was so covered that fire against it was of little effect. With some difficulty and delay he succeeded in checking the fire of his men, got them on their feet and again started to advance. Up to this point his line had had partial cover, but now for 150 yards there was none. They advanced for 50 yards and then broke, apart stopping with the line of remnants, and the remainder were rallied near the canal. Tyler's brigade after a little delay was formed in a double line of battle on the left of Labash's position. It had first moved to the right, but there met enfilading fire of artillery, and it was withdrawn to the left. Humphreys joined it and ordered the charge to be made with the bayonet alone, and that the men should pass directly over the line of those lying down. Meanwhile, as sundown approached, Burnside's orders had grown urgent that the position should be carried before dark. Getty's division of the 9th Corps, two brigades, from the left on Hazel Run, was ordered to assault, but no steps were taken to have it simultaneous with that of Humphreys. Had there been time, Humphreys, from his experience with Labush, would have preferred to first clear his path of the line of men lying down, already spoken of. Not only were they physically much in the way, but even more were they a moral obstacle. A repulsed line, which is not ready to join in a fresh assault, does not at all like a new line to pass over it, for it seems a reflection upon their courage. They are apt to do all they can to discourage and obstruct the newcomers, and the latter cannot fail to appreciate that, an advance, leaving a large force behind, is very liable to receive fire from the rear, intended to go over their heads, but likely to land a good many bullets in their backs. And, even if this does not happen, a false alarm of fire from the rear, is almost sure to occur. Under the conditions confronting him, Humphreys's charge was utterly hopeless, and should never have been made. But it illustrated a high type of disciplined valor, and, but for the men lying down, might have crossed bayonets with the Confederates. The six ranks of seasoned veterans in the road, however, could scarcely have been overcome by those who had arrived dot with all its officers in front, led by Humphreys and Tyler, and with a loud hurrah, which was a signal to our guns on the hill to put in rapid work from full chests of canister. Tyler's brigade now made a rapid advance under what, in his official report, Humphreys called the heaviest fire yet opened, which poured upon it from the moment it first rose from the ravine. They came in two lines, quite close together, and without firing a shot. A more beautiful charge is not recorded in the annals of the Army of the Potomac. Its experiences, as told in the official reports both of Humphreys and Tyler, are instructive. Humphreys writes, as the brigade reached the masses of men referred to, every effort was made by the latter to prevent our advance. They called to our men not to go forward, and some attempted to prevent by force their doing so. The effect upon my command was what I apprehended. The line was somewhat disordered, and, in part, was forced to fall into a column, but still advanced rapidly. The fire of the enemy's musketry and artillery furious as it was before, now became still hotter. The stone wall was a sheet of flame that enveloped the head and flanks of the column. Officers and men were falling rapidly, and the head of the column was at length brought to a stand when close up to the wall. Up to this time not a shot had been fired by the column, but now some firing began. It lasted but a minute, when, in spite of all our efforts, the column turned and began to retire slowly. I attempted to rally the brigade behind the natural embankment, so often mentioned, but the united efforts of Jen, Tyler, myself, our staffs, and the other officers could not arrest the retiring mass. My efforts were the less effective, since I was again dismounted, my second horse having been killed under me. Our loss in both brigades was heavy, exceeding 1,000 in killed and wounded, including in the number officers of high rank. The greater part of the loss occurred during the brief time they were charging and retiring, 
which scarcely occupied more than 10 or 15 minutes for each brigade. Tyler's report says, the brigade moved forward, in as good order as the muddy condition of the ground on the left of my line would admit, until we came upon a body of officers and men lying flat upon the ground in front of the brick house, and along the slight elevation on its right and left. Upon our approach the officers commanded halt, flourishing their swords as they lay, while a number of their men tried to intimidate our troops by crying out that we would be slaughtered, etc. An effort was made to get them out of the way, but failed, and we marched over them. When we were within a very short distance of the enemy's line, a fire was opened on our ear, wounding a few of my most valuable officers, and, I regret to say, killing some of our men. Instantaneously the cry ran along our lines that we were being fired into from the rear. The column halted, receiving at the same time a terrible fire from the enemy. Orders for the moment were forgotten, and a fire from our whole line was immediately returned. Another cry passed along the line, that we were being fired upon from the rear, when our brave men, after giving the enemy several volleys, fell back. Besides suffering from the infantry fire of their own men in the rear, the Federal column, or portions of it, also believed that the Federal artillery above Falmouth, which kept up a constant long range fire with their heavy rifles upon the Confederate position, had mistaken localities and was landing its projectiles in the Federal ranks. Coucherites of this charge of Humphreys's division, as follows. In the Century magazine, the musketry fire was very heavy and the artillery fire was simply terrible. I sent word several times to our artillery on the right of Falmouth that they were firing into us and were tearing our men to pieces. I thought they had made a mistake in the range, but I learned later that the fire came from the guns of the enemy on their extreme left. This fire came from Parker's battery, of my battalion, located near the Stansbury House. The losses in Alabash's brigade were officially reported as 562, and those in Tyler's as 454. The attacks by these brigades were the 12th and 13th separate charges of the day, and there was still one to follow. Getty's division, comprising Hawkins's and Harlan's brigades, received orders to attack about the same time that Humphreys was arranging his attack. Being near the mouth of Hazel Run, they had farther to advance before reaching the field, and only arrived upon it after Tyler was repulsed. They had not been engaged during the day, but had suffered some casualties from premature explosions of Federal shell fired from the hills across the river. Hawkins's brigade led, advancing by right of companies as far as the railroad, where the brigade line was reformed and a fresh start taken, directed at the southern extremity of Mare's Hill. Harlan's brigade was to follow in similar formation. In view of the lateness of the hour, this charge was even more hopeless than any of the preceding. Hawkins had protested against it before starting, but the orders were explicit. By the time that the division crossed the railroad, it was so dark that distinct vision was limited to a few hundred feet. The first portion of the march was unobserved by the Confederates, and the line rapidly advanced until it came to marshy ground through which ran a ditch to Hazel Run. Here they opened fire, and their position was defined to the Confederates by the flashes of their muskets, and infantry and artillery replied from Mare's Hill, from across Hazel Run, and from guns upon Lee's Hill. They crossed the ditch, however, and had advanced quite close to the sunken road, when suddenly the infantry in it opened fire, and, at the same time, fire was opened upon them from the right and rear by the line of Federals lying down, in front of whom their advance from the left had brought them. Hawkins thus describes the scene, when the brigade arrived at this cut, ditch, it received an enfilading fire from the enemy's artillery and infantry, but, notwithstanding, the plateau on the other side was gained, the left of the line advancing till within about ten yards of a stone wall behind which a heavy infantry force of the enemy was concealed, which opened an increased artillery and infantry fire, and, in addition to this, the brigade received the fire of the 83 d par. Volunteers and of the 20th Me. Volunteers who were on the left of Gen. Couch's line, which our right had overlapped. This firing from all quarters, 
and from all directions, I should think, lasted about seven minutes, when I succeeded in stopping it and then discovered that the greatest confusion existed. Everybody, from the smallest drummer boy up, seemed to be shouting to the full of his capacity. After considerable exertion, comparative quiet and order were restored, and the command reformed along the canal cut, ditch. I then reported to you for further orders, and you ordered the command withdrawn, and placed in its former position in the town. Getty not only showed good judgment in withdrawing Hawkins's brigade on the first opportunity, but he had done even better with Harlan's brigade, for he halted it near the railroad, and did not permit it to participate in the charge. Sykes's division was also held in reserve on the edge of the town, behind Humphreys, and at 11 p.m. was sent across the canal, where it relieved the remnants of all of the brigades which had made their advances from that quarter. The Confederate fire soon ceased when the flashes of the enemy's guns no longer gave targets. The losses in Hawkins's brigade had been 255, in Harlan's they were 41. Among the Confederates, no one conceived that the battle was over, for less than half our army had been engaged only four out of nine divisions. It was not thought possible that Burnside would confess defeat by retreating. Burnside himself, however, was far from having given up the battle, and, though many prominent officers advised against it, he determined to renew the attack at dawn. He proposed to form the whole Ninth Corps into a column of regiments and to lead it in person upon Mare's Hill. He came across the river after the fighting ceased gave the necessary orders, and returned to the Phillips house about 1 a.m. He found the waiting for him Hawkins, who had made the last charge, and who had now come at the request of Wilcox, Humphreys, Meade, Getty, and others to protest against the proposed attack, and to give information about the situation, which it was supposed that Burnside did not possess. A long conference ensued in the presence of Sumner, Hooker, and Franklin, the commanders of the three grand divisions. On their unanimous advice, verbal orders were sent countermanding the proposed assault. Before these could be delivered, many preparatory movements were underway. And while they were in progress, a courier bearing orders which disclosed Burnside's plan, becoming lost in the darkness, wandered up to our picket line. He was captured, and his orders were found and taken to Longstreet and Lee. Notice was at once sent along our lines, with instructions to extend and strengthen our entrenchments, and to make all necessary preparations of ammunition, water, and provisions, which was vigorously set about with no suspicion that Burnside would disappoint us. So on the 14th, when, at dawn, the Confederates stood to arms, they looked and listened in vain for signs of the fresh assaults which the captured order had led them to expect. About ten o'clock, the morning fog began to lighten, and a vicious sharpshooting sprang up. Sykes's regulars were now in our front, and the guns from the Stafford Hills kept up a slow target practice at our lines, to which we made no reply. The day passed without serious hostilities. During the afternoon some of their shells prematurely exploding, caused orders to be issued not to fire any more at our position about Mare's Hill. During the night of the 14th, we received ammunition from Richmond, and Longstreet authorized a moderate fire on the 15th, to suppress the sharp shooting. During the night, also, we had located two guns on our left where they could enfilade the sheltered position, in front of the canal, from which the Federal attacks had come. So, on the 15th, our position was agreeably improved. A few shots, raking the depressions in which the enemy had so far found shelter, rooted the picket reserves. A single shot into a loopholed brick tannery on the plank road, silenced it, and for the rest of the day nothing annoyed us, and we worked openly at our defenses. The night of the 15th was dark and rainy, with high wind from the south, preventing us from hearing noises from the enemy's direction. During the night Burnside safely withdrew across the river. Commencing his movement at 7 p.m., his whole enormous force was across in twelve hours of a stormy night. It was a great feat, and its successful performance, unmolested, under our guns, reflects badly upon the vigilance of the Confederates.
it should have been suspected, discovered by scouts, and vigorously attacked with artillery. On the morning of the 15th, both Hooker on the right and Franklin on the left had applied to Burnside for permission to send a flag of truce and recover the wounded in their respective fronts. It seems that Hooker's request was refused, for no flag was here shown. But on Franklin's front an informal arrangement was made by which all picket firing ceased, and the Federal ambulances and burial parties were allowed to remove the dead and wounded in front of our pickets, and our own men brought forward and delivered those who had fallen within our lines. On the 16th, when the city was evacuated, very few of the wounded who had fallen on the 13th in front of the town were found alive. The Federal guns were, generally, still in position on the hills on the north side, and a few spiteful shells were thrown by them in the early hours, but, before noon, the pickets of both sides were peacefully re-established. The whole action resolved itself into two separate offensive battles by the Federals, one on their right and one on their left, with some unimportant skirmishing in the center. The forces present or near at hand on each field, and the losses, may be divided about as follows colon whatever may be said of Burnside's strategy or tactics, he was not deficient in moral courage. Although well aware that most of his generals were in a despondent mood, he determined within a very few days to make a fresh effort. He had his cavalry reconnoitre the river below Fredericksburg, and then decided to cross in that direction. On December 26 he ordered three days cooked rations, and ten days rations in the wagons, with beef cattle, forage, and ammunition, all to be prepared to move at twelve hours' notice. His cavalry advance was already in motion for a raid within the Confederate lines, when he received a message from President Lincoln forbidding any movement without his being previously informed. This interference broke up his plan. Some of the generals had communicated it to the President with adverse criticisms. Not discouraged, however. He soon devised another, and, doubtless, a better one. He proposed to cross the river at Banks Ford, only about four miles above Fredericksburg, making at the same time demonstrations at several points, both above and below. His losses at Fredericksburg had been more than repaired by the arrival within reach of the 11th and 12th Army Corps, some 30,000 strong, under Sigel. There had been good weather since the battle and the roads were in fair order. He had visited Washington and sought the approval of the President and War Department, but had found them reluctant to give it, being influenced by the general distrust of Burnside's ability among the principal officers of his army. To bring the matter to an issue, Burnside tendered his resignation, to be accepted in case it was not deemed advisable for him to cross the river. He then returned and hurried his preparation. On January 20, he put his army in motion. Positions for 184 guns had been selected, covering the approaches to the points chosen for crossing, and roads had been found and opened as secretly as possible. But, nevertheless, the Federal activity had been noted, especially at Banks and United States Fords, and, on the 19th, Lee sent a brigade to strengthen our pickets there. As the distances were not great from the Federal camps before Fredericksburg to the positions about Banks Ford, most of their guns were able to reach their positions by the night of the 20th. About dark on that day, a violent rainstorm set in, which continued all that night and the two following days. The pontoon trains in rear of the guns had farther to go, and were unwieldy to handle. Many troops and trains were still far from their destinations and now every road became a deep quagmire, and even small streams were impassable torrents. Although desperate efforts were made all during the night to get the pontoons to the river, when morning dawned, not enough for a single bridge had arrived, and five bridges were required. Swinton writes of the situation, as follows, it would have been judicious in Gen. Burnside to have promptly abandoned a situation that was now hopeless. But it was a characteristic of the general's mind, a characteristic that might be good or bad according to the direction it took, never to turn back when he had once put his hand to the plow, and it had already. More than once, 
been seen that the more hopeless the enterprise, the greater his pertinacity. The night's rain had made deplorable havoc with the roads, but Herculean efforts were made to bring pontoons enough into position to build a bridge or two with all. Double and triple teams of mules were harnessed to each boat, but it was in vain. Long stout ropes were then attached to the teams, and a hundred and fifty men put to the task on each. The effort was but little more successful. Floundering through the mire for a few feet, the gang of Lilliputians, with their huge ribbed Gulliver, were forced to give over, breathless. Night arrived, but the pontoons could not be gotten up, and the enemy's pickets, discovering what was going on, jocularly shouted their intention to come over tomorrow and help build the bridges. Morning dawned upon another day of rain and storm. The ground had gone from bad to worse, and now showed such a spectacle as might be presented by the elemental wrecks of another deluge. An indescribable chaos of pontoons, vehicles, and artillery encumbered all the roads, supply wagons upset by the roadside, guns stalled in the mud, ammunition trains mired by the way, and hundreds of horses and mules buried in the liquid muck. The army, in fact, was embargoed. It was no longer a question of how to go forward, it was a question of how to get back. The three days rations, brought on the persons of the men, were exhausted, and the supple trains could not be moved up. To aid the return, all the available force was put to work to corduroy the rotten roads. Next morning the army floundered and staggered back to the old camps, and so ended a movement that will always live, in the recollection of the army, as the mud march, and which remains a striking exemplification of the enormous difficulties incident to winter campaigning in Va. Burnside's plan had been a good one, and his army, with the 11th and 12th Corps, had numbered on January 20, 152,516 present for duty, besides 45,239 in the defenses of Washington. But for the rainstorm, the act of God he certainly had reasonable ground to hope for success. But he was not disposed to lay the whole blame upon the storm. He had been greatly dissatisfied with Franklin, and his conduct of his command, at the Battle of Fredericksburg, and he now keenly resented hostile criticisms which had injured him in estimation of the President. From the scene of the mud march he went direct to Washington, with an order in his pocket for the President to approve, or else to accept, his resignation. He made the issue boldly, first with Hooker, and next with Franklin, and his principal officers. The proposed order dismissed from the army Hooker, Brooks, and Newton, commanding divisions, and Cochrane, commanding a brigade in the 6th Corps, and it relieved from further duty with the army, Franklin, Smith, commanding the 6th Corps, Sturgis, commanding a division, and Ferrero, a brigade in it, and Taylor, Franklin's ast. Gen. Lincoln felt kindly to Burnside and respected him. But he had now more confidence in Hooker, who had won the sobriquet of Fighting Joe, and much general popularity, both in the army and in the newspapers, with his fine bearing and frank manners. So Lincoln met the issue and suppressed the order, relieved Burnside from the command, and gave it to Hooker on January 25th. None of the other prescribed officers were disturbed, except Franklin who was placed on waiting orders and afterward transferred to Ladot one the same disease, sore tongue and soft hoof, was complained of by Lee on November 7 to the Secretary of War, as affecting his cavalry. Two, this was the second occasion, within four months, on which Stuart had ridden entirely around McClellan's army. Col. R. B. Irwin tells of the effect of this raid on the mind of President Lincoln, in the following anecdote, when the president seemed in unusually high spirits and was conversing freely, someone, I think Decay, suddenly asked, Mr. President, what about McClellan? Without looking at his questioner, the president drew a ring upon the deck with a stick or umbrella, and said quietly, when I was a boy we used to play a game, three times round and out. Stuart has been around him twice, if he goes around him once more, gentlemen. McClellan will be out. 1. This organization was not kept up by Burnside's immediate successors, 
but under Grant in 1864 something equivalent was developed in separate armies and in large corps. One in illustration, I quote from the report of Col. Evans, commanding Lawton's brigade, as follows, I cannot forbear to mention in terms of unqualified praise the heroism of Captain E. P. Lawton, Ust. Gen. of the brigade, from the beginning of the advance until near the close of the fight, when he received a dangerous wound, and was unavoidably left in the open plain where he fell. Cheering on the men, leading this regiment, or restoring the line of another, encouraging officers, he was everywhere along the whole line, the bravest among the brave. Just as the four regiments emerged from the neck of woods referred to, his horse was shot under him, and, in falling, so far disabled him that thousands, less ardent or determined, would have felt justified in leaving the field, but limping on he rejoined the line again in their advance toward the battery, but soon received the wound with which he fell. The wound unfortunately proved mortal. Gen. Burnside, a few days later, generously returned the body to the Confederate lines giving it an escort of honor from the hospital across the river. One this false impression doubtless arose from seeing the nine guns on the crest of Mare's Hill limber up, and leave the hill. When the lull in the firing occurred, Walton had requested Alexander's battalion to relieve his guns, which had nearly exhausted their ammunition. Nine fresh guns were quickly moved up. Walton's guns were withdrawn to give clear roads, and the reliefs replaced them at a gallop. These movements were seen by the enemy and thought to be the beginning of a retreat. Chaptex of Counselorsville Winter Quarters. Rations reduced. Hayes's Louisiana Brigade. Officers' Servants. Hooker's Reorganization. Confederate Organization. Hooker's Plan of Attack. Lee's Proposed Aggressive. Hooker Crosses. Hooker's Fatal Mistake. Lee's Prompt Action. The Wilderness. Hooker Advances. Lee's advance. Hooker retreats. Hooker entrenches. Lee reconnoiters. Lee's plan of attack. Jackson's march. The movement discovered. Sickles advances. Jackson deploys. Jackson attacks. Cole quits blunder. Dowdle's tavern. Casualties. At Hooker's headquarters. Defensive measures. Jackson pauses. A cannonade. Wounding of Jackson. Stuart in command. Formation for attack. Sickles is midnight attack. Hooker's interior line. Hooker abandons Hazel Grove. Stuart attacks. Assaults repulsed. Hazel Grove guns. Federals withdraw. Lee and Stuart meet. Sedgwick's advance. Wilcox on Taylor's Hill. Assaults renewed. Early falls back. Salem Church. Casualties. Early's division. Lee organizes an attack. Sedgwick driven across. Soon after the Battle of Fredericksburg, Lee placed his army in winter quarters. Jackson was extended along the river, below the town, as far as Port Royal, his own headquarters being at a hunting lodge on the lawn of a Mr. Corbin, at Moss Neck, eleven miles below Fredericksburg. Longstreet was encamped from a little above Fredericksburg to Massapanax Creek. Lee established his headquarters in a camp a short distance in rear of Hamilton's Crossing. Most of the artillery was sent back to the North Anna River for convenience of supply. My own battalion occupied a wood at Mount Carmel Church, five miles north of Hanover Junction, the horses being sheltered in an adjoining pine thicket. On the occasion of Burnside's Mud March, we marched about halfway to Fredericksburg, but were then allowed to return. The infantry generally did not leave their camps, as there was nowhere any fighting. Although so near to Richmond, the army was inadequately clothed, shod, and fed, in spite of Lee's earnest efforts. As far back as April 28, 1862, the meat ration had been reduced from 12 to 8 ounces, and a small extra allowance of flour, 2 ounces was given. It was claimed that but for this reduction, the supply of meat would not have held out throughout the fall. On January 23, 1863, a further reduction was ordered, by the Commissary General, to four ounces of salt meat with one-fifth of a pound of sugar. 
Lee wrote of the situation on March 27, the men are cheerful, and I receive but few complaints, still I do not consider it enough to maintain them in health and vigor, and I fear they will be unable to endure hardships of the approaching campaign. Symptoms of scurvy are appearing among them, and, to supply the place of vegetables, each regiment is directed to send a daily detail to gather sassafras buds, wild onions, garlic, lamb's quarter, and poke sprouts, but for so large an army the supply obtained is very small. Some idea of the situation is given in the following extracts from a letter of a staff officer of Hayes's La Brigade to his representative in Congress. Among 1,500 men reported for duty there are 400 totally without covering of any kind for their feet. These men, of course, can render no effective service, as it is impossible for them to keep up with the column in a march over frozen ground. There are a large number of men who have not a single blanket. There are some without a particle of underclothing, having neither shirts, drawers, nor socks, while overcoats from their rarity, are objects of curiosity. The 5th Regiment is unable to drill for want of shoes. The 8th Regiment will soon be unfit for duty from the same cause, and indeed, when shoes are supplied, the men will be unable to wear them for a long while, such is the horrible condition of their feet from long exposure. This destitution, in the way of clothing, is not compensated by close shelter or abundant food for the troops have no tents, and are almost totally unprovided with cooking utensils for the petty rations they receive. Troops from other states are supplied, indeed, in a great degree by individual contributions from their homes, while we of Louisiana have received nothing whatever, since the fall of New Orleans, with the exception, I believe, of a company of the 9th Regiment. Troops from the more distant states suffered many more privations, both in food and clothing, than those near home. Some of the state governments also did much toward the clothing of their own troops, and private families, too, sent largely both of food and clothing to their members in the armies. Without such help, Confederate officers would often have suffered for food. Early in the war, officers received no rations, but were allowed to purchase from the commissaries, for themselves and servants. But as rations became scarce, the privilege of purchase was taken away, and a ration was given each officer. Nothing, however, was allowed for a servant. Thereafter, officers had to divide with their servants and supply the deficiency as best they could. Personally, my mess received constant supplies of bacon and peace from our country homes in SC and Georgia and other articles giving the most nourishment in the least space. Our scarcities were due entirely to insufficient railroad transportation. Before the war, our roads had but a light traffic. They were now loaded with a very heavy one, and as cars, engines, and rails wore out, they could not be replaced. When complaint was made to the Commissary General of insufficient supplies, he would answer, stop running passenger trains and I can run more freight trains and supply you. The great need of rations for the coming summer led the War Department to send Longstreet with two divisions for a campaign in the vicinity of Suffolk. Its object was to collect forage and provisions from counties near the federal lines. The campaign was not initiated by Lee, and he thought that one division would have been sufficient, as the result showed. For the little fighting done was unnecessary, being initiated by the Confederates. And, although Lee at Chancellorsville repulsed Hooker's attack, it was poor policy to take the risk of battle against enormous odds, with one fourth of his infantry absent. As might have been expected, under the difficult circumstances attending our transportation either by wagon or by rail, Pickett's and Hood's divisions could not be gotten back in time for the battle, and our victory was the product of lucky accident combined with sublime audacity, desperate fighting and heavy losses. Hooker proved himself a good organizer. When placed in command, the army was much discouraged and desertions were numerous. Hooker abolished the grand divisions, devised a system of furloughs as a check to desertion, improved the transportation and supply departments, and organized his cavalry into a corps. In addition, he instituted the system of badges, showing at a glance the corps and division to which the wearer belonged. 
it was simply a piece of flannel, sewed on the top of the cap, whose shape designated the core, and its color the division. A circle indicated the first core, a trefoil a 2D, a lozenge the 3D, a Maltese cross the 5th, a Latin cross the 6th, a crescent the 11th, and a star the 12th. These shapes cut from red flannel were worn by the first divisions, from white flannel by the 2D, from blue flannel by the 3D, and from green flannel by the 4th divisions, should there be so many. Discipline, drill, and instruction were well maintained, supplies of all kinds abundantly furnished. The spirit of the men revived with the consciousness of their immense superiority in numbers and equipment, and it was with good show of reason that Hooker spoke of his army when it took the field, as the finest army on the planet. His organization was as follows, with the strength of each corps present for duty equipped on April 30th. The nearest Confederate return is for March 21st. It is not entirely complete for the artillery and cavalry, but, estimating for them, Lee's organization and strength at that date was as follows allowing for about 3,500 reinforcements during the month of April, Lee's whole force was about 60,000, of whom some 57,000 were infantry and artillery. Of these arms Hooker had about 122,000. Each commander planned to take the initiative. Hooker knew that he had double Lee's infantry, and great superiority in artillery and he desired only to get at Lee away from breastworks. On April 13 he ordered Stoneman's cavalry upon a raid to Lee's rear, which expedition was to be the opening of his campaign. A rainstorm on the 14th, lasting 36 hours, halted the movement, after its leading brigade had forded the Rappahannock. The brigade was recalled, having to swim horses across the fast-rising river, and two weeks elapsed before the movement could be renewed. It was intended that Stoneman should destroy the railroads, which would force Lee to retreat. Stoneman should then harass and delay him as he fell back, pursued by Hooker. Lee's proposed campaign was another invasion, this time of Pa. He could neither attack Hooker, nor even threaten his rear across the Rappahannock. But he could again sweep the valley and cross the Potomac, and beyond. Both Lee and Jackson imagined great possibilities. One three months later, the opportunity offered, and Lee put it to the test, but his great lieutenant, Jackson, was no longer at the head of his 2D Corps. On April 29, Lee found himself anticipated by Hooker's having, the night before, laid pontoon bridges across the Rappahannock, below Deep Run. At the site of Franklin's crossing in December, Hooker had commenced his movement on the 27th, by going with the 5th, 11th, and 12th court across the Rappahannock at Kelly's Ford, above the mouth of the Rapidan, 27 miles from Fredericksburg. A picket, at this point, was driven off, a pontoon bridge laid, and the whole force, about 42,000 men, was across the river on the 29th, when the 6th Corps, under Sedgwick, was crossing in front of Jackson. Hooker immediately pushed his force by two roads from Kelly's to Germana and Dealey's fords of the Rapidan, about eleven miles off, and, on arriving, the troops forded, although the water was nearly shoulder deep. The fording was kept up all night by light of large bonfires, and the next morning the march to Chancellorsville, six miles away, was resumed. Meanwhile, Two divisions of the 2D Corps had moved up from Fredericksburg to United States Ford, where they laid a pontoon bridge about noon on the 30th. By 9 p.m. they had crossed and united with the 5th, 11th, and 12th Corps at Chancellorsville. No resistance had been encountered anywhere, but that of picket forces. Hooker, in 84 hours, had covered about 45 miles, crossing two rivers and had established a force of 54,000 infantry and artillery upon Lee's flank at Chancellorsville. One Hooker was naturally elated at his success, and issued an order to his troops, congratulating them, and announcing that now, the enemy must either ingloriously fly, or come out from behind his defenses, and give us battle on our own ground, where certain destruction awaits him. And, indeed, if a general may ever be justified in enumerating his poultry while the process of incubation is incomplete, this might be an occasion. 
He was on the left flank and rear of Lee's only strong position with a force fully equal to Lee's, while another equal force threatened Lee's right. And somewhere in Lee's rear, between him and Richmond, was Stoneman with 10,000 sabres, opposed only by two regiments of cavalry, tearing up the railroads and waiting to fall upon Lee's flank when he essayed the retreat which Hooker confidently expected to see. He had said to those about him that evening, the rebel army is now the legitimate property of the army of the Potomac. They may as well pack up their haversacks and make for Richmond, and I shall be after them. But Hooker had made one mistake, and it was to cost him dearly. He had sent off, with Stoneman, his entire cavalry force, except one brigade. This proved insufficient to keep him informed of the Confederate movements, even though their efforts were supplemented by many signal officers with lookouts and field telegraphs, and by two balloons. It was during the morning of the 30th that Lee learned that Hooker had divided his army and that one half of it was already at Chancellorsville, while most of the remainder was in his front. By all the rules of war, one half or the other should be at once attacked, and as Sedgwick's was the nearest, and Lee's whole force was already concentrated, Jackson at first proposed to attack Sedgwick. Lee, however, thought the position impregnable, and Jackson, after careful reconnaissance, came to the same conclusion. Orders were then at once prepared to march and attack Hooker before he could move from Chancellorsville. Early with his division, Barksdale's brigade, Pendleton's artillery reserve, and the Washington artillery, in all about 10,000 men, were left to hold the lines before Fredericksburg. These covered about six miles, and the force averaged about one man to each yard, and nine guns to each mile. About midnight on the 30th, Jackson marched from Hamilton's Crossing with his three remaining divisions, under A.P. Hill, Rhodes, and Colston. He was joined on the road in the morning by Lee with the remaining brigades of McClure's, and by Anderson's division, and Alexander's battalion of artillery. Jackson's three divisions numbered about 25,000, Anderson's division about 8,000, and three brigades of McClure's about 6,000. Thus, Lee had in hand nearly 40,000 men, with which to attack Hooker at Chancellorsville, where Hooker now had four corps, the 3d, 5th, 11th, and 12th, and two divisions of the 2d, a total effective of about 72,000 infantry and artillery, and was entrenching himself. Chancellorsville was situated about a mile within the limits of a tract called the Wilderness. It stretched some 12 or 14 miles westward along the Rapidan and was some 8 or 10 miles in breadth. The original forest had been cut for charcoal many years before, and replaced by thick and tangled smaller growth. A few clearings were scattered at intervals, and a few small creeks drained it. Chancellorsville was merely a brick residence at an important junction of roads, with a considerable clearing on the west. Three roads ran toward Fredericksburg, the old turnpike most directly, the plank road to its right, but uniting with the turnpike at Tabernacle Church, about halfway, the river road to the left, by a roundabout course passing near Banks Ford of the Rappahannock. Hooker's line of battle ran from Chancellorsville, about two miles northeastward to the Rappahannock, covering United States Ford. Westward it covered the plank road for about three miles ending in a short offset northward. Entrenchment was quickly done by cutting a batis, or an entanglement, in front, and throwing up slight parapets, or piling breastworks of logs. About 11 a.m., however, Hooker prepared to resume his advance, and ordered the 5th and 12th Corps to move out on the three roads toward Fredericksburg and establish a line in the open country beyond the wilderness. Griffin's and Humphreys's divisions of the 5th were sent down the river road, on the left, Sykes's division down the turnpike in the center, and the 12th Corps, under Slocum, down the plank road on the right. Meanwhile, Lee and Jackson disposed Anderson's division for an advance, covering both the pike and the plank roads. Wilcox's and Muon's brigades, with Jordan's battery of Alexander's battalion, moved upon the former rights. Perry's, and Posey's brigades, with the remainder of Alexander's battalion, on the latter. 
McClellan's division moved by the Pike, and Lee, with Jackson's three divisions, followed the plank road. Thus the two armies were marching toward each other on these two roads, while on the river road two of the Federal divisions were marching toward Banks Ford, which was at this time undefended, although some entrenchments had been erected there. The possession of Banks Ford by Hooker would shorten the distance between Chancellorsville and his left wing under Sedgwick, by several miles. The advancing forces first came into collision on the pike. Sharp fighting followed, Semmes's brigade coming up on the left of Muon and bearing the brunt of it against Sykes's regulars. Sykes's orders had been, however, only to advance to the first ridge beyond the forest, and he maintained his position there though menaced by the extension of the Confederate lines beyond his flank, until orders were received from Hooker to withdraw to the original position within the forest. Similar orders were also sent to Slocum on the plank road, and to Griffin and Humphreys who had advanced, nearly five miles down the river road, entirely unopposed, and who were within sight of Banks Ford when the orders for the countermarch reached them. Slocum's corps had not become seriously engaged but its skirmishers had been driven in and its right flank threatened by Wright's brigade. This advanced upon the line of an unfinished railroad, which, starting from Fredericksburg, ran through the wilderness generally a mile or two south of the plank road. Up to the moment of the withdrawal of his troops, Hooker's campaign had been well planned and well managed, and its culmination was now at hand in the open field, as he had desired. He could scarcely hope for more propitious circumstances, and, by all the rules of the game, a victory was now within his grasp. His lieutenants received the order to fall back with surprise and regret. The advance, upon both the plank road and the pike, had cleared the forest and reached fairly good positions. An officer was sent to Hooker to explain and request permission to remain, but he returned in a half hour. With the orders repeated. Hooker has been severely blamed for these orders, subverting all the carefully prepared plans only published to the army that morning. It is interesting to learn the cause. Reports from the balloons and signal officers had informed him of the march of a force toward Chancellorsville, estimated at two corps. Rumors had also been brought by deserters. The night before, that Hood's division had rejoined Lee, coming from Suffolk, but Hooker's information from Fortress Monroe should have shown that to be impossible. There is no sign of any hesitation upon his part until 2 p.m. at that hour he wired Butterfield, his chief of staff, at Falmouth, from character of information have suspended attack. The enemy may attack me, comma, I will try it. Tell Sedgwick to keep a sharp lookout, and attack if he can succeed. This dispatch makes clear Hooker's mind. He realized from the rapid manner of Lee's approach, and from the sounds of battle already heard, both on the pike and the plank road, that Lee meant to attack. He had confidently expected Lee to retreat without a battle, and finding him, instead, so quick to take the aggressive, he lost his nerve and wished himself back on the line he had taken around Chancellorsville where he would enjoy the great advantage of acting upon the defensive. He had seen in December the enormous advantage which even slight breastworks could confer, and now he saw the chance of having his battle a defensive one behind entrenchments. It was surely the safest game to play, and Hooker is fully justified in electing to play it. No remonstrances shook his confidence in the least. He said to Couch, It is all right, Couch. I have got Lee just where I want him. He must fight me on my own ground. Orders were given to entrench, and work was at once begun with abundance of men and tools, and it was pushed during most of the night. Couch says, at 2 a.m. the corps commanders reported to Jen. Hooker that their positions could be held, at least so said Couch, Slocum, and Howard. Indeed. No better field fortification can be desired than what it was the quickest to build in the wilderness. A wide belt of dense small growth could be soon felled in front of shallow ditches, with earth and log breastworks. Any charging line is brought to a halt by the entanglement, and held under close fire of musketry and canister, 
while the surrounding forest prevents the enemy from finding positions to use his own artillery. So the corps commanders, responsible only for the front of their own lines, might truly report that their positions could be held. Yet the line, as a whole, may have a weak feature. This was the case here. Its right flank crested in the air, and was not even covered by a curtain of cavalry. Hooker, however, was not entirely blind to this weakness of his line. He inspected it early next morning, May 2nd, and ordered changes and enjoined vigilance which might have saved him from the surprise of the afternoon, had he not, like Pope in his campaign of the previous fall, failed to fathom the boldness of Lee's designs even after discovering the Confederate movements. Lee appreciated that Hooker's withdrawal into the wilderness was not forced but to fortify and concentrate. He could, therefore, lose no time in finding how and where he might attack. Until nightfall the skirmishes were pushed forward everywhere, in order to locate the exact position of the enemy. The result is briefly given in Lee's report, as follows, the enemy had assumed a position of great natural strength, surrounded on all sides by a dense forest, filled with a tangled undergrowth in the midst of which breastworks of logs had been constructed, with trees felled in front so as to form an almost impenetrable abatis. His artillery swept the few narrow roads by which his position could be approached from the front, and commanded the adjacent woods, Hooker had, indeed, maneuvered Lee out of his position without a battle. There was now nothing left but to attack the greatly superior force in the impregnable position or to attempt to retreat already dangerously delayed. But presently there came some more cheerful news. Fitzhugh Lee, who held the extreme left of our cavalry, had also reconnoitred the enemy, and had discovered that his right flank was in the air. The one chance left to Lee was to pass undiscovered entirely across the enemy's front and turn his right flank. The enterprise was of great difficulty and hazard. To try it and fail meant destruction for the army, already divided, must now be further subdivided, and the largest fraction placed in a position whence retreat would be impossible. Only a very sanguine man could even hope that fifteen brigades, with over one hundred guns, could make a march of fourteen miles around Hooker's enormous army without being discovered. The chance, too, must be taken of aggressive action by the enemy at Fredericksburg or Banks Ford, even if Hooker himself did nothing during the eight hours in which the flanking force would be out of position in a long defile through the forest. But no risks appall the heart of Lee, either of odds, or position, or of both combined. His supreme faith in his army was only equaled by the faith of his army in him. The decision to attack was quickly made and preparations begun. Wilcox's brigade was ordered to Banks Ford to hold the position. This precaution was well taken, for after midnight of the first, Hooker ordered Reynolds's corps to leave Sedgwick and join the army at Chancellorsville. Reynolds started at sunrise and marched by Banks Ford, where he expected to find a bridge. But, as has been told, Griffin's and Humphreys's divisions, after being within sight on the afternoon of the first, had been recalled. Wilcox, at dawn on the 2d, had occupied the trenches. So Reynolds, arriving after sunrise and seeing Confederates in possession, continued his march on the north side, and crossed at United States Ford. Anderson's four remaining brigades, with McClus's three, were ordered to entrench during the night. Jackson, with his three divisions, his own artillery, and Alexander's battalion of Longstreet's corps, were assigned to make the march through the wilderness and turn Hooker's right. Lee himself would remain with McClus's and Anderson's troops, and occupy the enemy while the long march was made. Cheering was forbidden, and stringent measures taken to keep the column closed. Fitz Lee, with his cavalry, would precede the infantry and cover the flank. Two hours after sunrise, Lee, standing by the roadside, watched the head of the column march by and exchanged with Jackson the last few words ever to pass between them. Rhodes's division led the column, Colston's division followed, and A.P. Hills brought up the rear. The sun rose on May 2nd a few minutes after 5, and set at 6.50 p.m. The moon was full that night. 
the march led by a crossroads near the Catherine Furnace, thence southward for over a mile and then southwestward for two miles before turning west and striking the Brock Road within another mile. At the crossroads, the line of march was nearest the federal lines and was most exposed. Here the 23d Georgia Regiment of Colquitt's Brigade, Rhodes's division, was left to cover the rear dot when the line of march reached the Brock Road, it turned southward for about a mile, and then, almost doubling back upon itself, it took a woods road running a trifle west of north, nearly parallel to the Brock Road itself, and coming back into it about three miles north of the point at which it was first entered. This made a route two miles longer than would have been made by turning northward when the Brock Road was first reached. And as this part of the road was farthest of all from the enemy, over three miles, and in the densest woods, it would seem that two miles might have been saved, had there been time and opportunity for reconnaissance. Where the Brock Road crossed the Plank Road, the column halted, while Fitzley took Jackson to the front to a point whence he could see the Federal lines with arms stacked, in bivouac behind their entrenchments, and utterly unconscious of the proximity of an enemy. Until that moment it had been uncertain exactly where Jackson would attack. But he now saw that by following the Brock Road about two miles farther he would get upon the old turnpike, beyond the enemy's flank, and could take it in the rear. So the march was at once resumed to reach that position. But Paxton's brigade of Colston's division was here detached and placed with the cavalry, in observation on the plank road, and did not rejoin its division until near midnight. The head of the column made about two and a half miles an hour, the rear about one and a half, for in spite of all efforts the column lost distance. During the day there were three halts for rest of perhaps twenty minutes each. There were no vehicles except the artillery, ambulances, and ammunition wagons. These, marching each behind its division, made the column ten miles in length, of which the infantry occupied over six. The head, marching at about 6 a.m., reached the deploying point on the turnpike by 4 p.m. The distance had proven greater than anticipated, and time was now of priceless value. Meanwhile, the movement, though misunderstood, had been detected by the enemy. One about a mile southwest of Chancellorsville was a settlement called Hazel Grove, on a cleared ridge. From this ridge, about 8 a.m., Bernie, of Sickles's corps, discovered a column of infantry, trains, and artillery passing his front. He brought up a battery and opened on the train at a range of 1,600 yards, throwing it into much confusion and compelling it to find other routes around the exposed point. Jackson sent a battery to reply and check the enemy from advancing. Sickles came to Bernie's position and observed Jackson's column. His official report says, this continuous column, infantry, artillery, trains, and ambulances, was observed for three hours, moving apparently in a southerly direction toward Orange Sea. H, on the zero. And A. Ah, ah, or Louisa C. H. On the va. Sn. The movement indicated a retreat on Gordonsville, or an attack upon our right flank, perhaps both, for if the attack failed, the retreat would be continued. I hastened to report these movements, through staff officers, to the general in chief. To Major Gen. Howard and also to Major Gen. Slocum inviting their cooperation in case the General-in-Chief should authorize me to follow up the enemy and attack his columns. At noon I received orders to advance cautiously toward the road followed by the enemy, and attack his columns. Sickles advanced Burnley's division, which engaged an outpost on the flank and captured a regiment, the 23d Georgia the two rear brigades, under Thomas and Archer, with Brown's battalion of artillery were halted for an hour in observation, but were not engaged, and then followed one after the column. They were only able to overtake it, however, after night. It was about 4 p.m. when the head of Jackson's column began its deployment on both sides of the plank road, beyond Hooker's right, in the tangled forest, and it was nearly 6 p.m. when eight of the twelve brigades now in his column, 
have formed in two lines of battle, and one of the remaining four in a third line. Meanwhile Sickles, though now unopposed in front, had brought up Whipple's division of his own corps, and, having asked for reinforcements, had also received Barlow's brigade from the right flank of the 11th Corps, Williams's division of the 12th Corps, and three regiments of cavalry and some horse artillery under Pleasanton. Posey's brigade held the left flank of Lee's line of battle in Hooker's front, while Jackson conducted the flanking movement. Posey had a strong force of skirmishers in front, which became hotly engaged with the left flank of Sickles's advance, when it engaged Jackson's rearguard. While bringing up their reinforcements, the Federals made several efforts to carry Posey's position, but were always repulsed. Sickles then planned to outflank and surround it, but he had been so slow that, before he was ready to act, Jackson had attacked, and Sickles was hastily recalled. Otherwise, there might have been a strange spectacle. Sickles might have routed Anderson at the same time that Jackson was routing Howard. For he was on Anderson's flank with over 20,000 infantry, a brigade of cavalry, and some horse artillery. He wandered off, however, to the south and west for miles, where there was no enemy before him. Along the front of Lee's line the six brigades present of Anderson's and McClellan's divisions, aided by their artillery, had spent the day in more or less active skirmishing and cannonading with the enemy. Where the enemy showed a disposition to advance, the Confederates were well satisfied to lie quiet and repel them, as on the left in front of Posey. But on the Confederate right the Federal skirmish line, under Col. Miles, being strongly posted and showing no disposition to advance, it was wise to be moderately aggressive and keep the enemy in hopes of an attack. Kershaw and Sams did this handsomely throughout the day, though the threat of Sickles's movements caused Lee to draw his troops to his left, and reduce his right to less than a full line. About 6 p.m., the sun being then about one hour high, Jackson gave the signal to Rhodes to move forward. His brigades were in the following order from left to right, Iverson, O'Neill, Doles, and Colquitt, with Ramses' brigade 100 yards in rear of Colquitt on the right. Colston's three brigades formed in line with Rams, and in the following order from the left, Nichols, Jones, Warren. About half of each division was on each side of the pike and two Napoleons of Breathed's horse artillery stood in the pike ready to follow the skirmishers. Two hundred yards behind Colston, A. P. Hill had deployed Pender on the left of the pike. Lane, McGowan, and Heth were coming in column down the pike. Archer and Thomas were following, but some miles behind. Jackson had made his play so far with fair success and he now stood ready with over 20,000 men to surprise Howard's 13,000. He was sure of an important victory, but the fruits to be reaped from it would be limited for two reasons. One st. Two brigades were some hours behind, for Archer, without orders, had taken them to protect the rear. 2d. There were now but two hours of daylight left, and only in daylight can the fruits of victories be gathered. The question is suggested whether or not time had been anywhere lost unnecessarily. It would seem that twelve hours should not be needed to march fourteenth miles and form twenty thousand men in line of battle. Briefly, it may be said, that with good broad roads, on with troops formed, ready to march at the word, and disciplined to take mud holes and obstructions without loss of distance, two hours could have been saved but none of these conditions existed. Especially was time lost in the morning in getting the column formed. Rhodes reports it about 8 a.m. before the start was made. Further on, his report notes, a delay was caused by an endeavor on our part to entrap some federal cavalry. There may have been, during the morning, lack of appreciation of the value, even of the minutes, in an enterprise of the character now on foot and an inadequate idea of the distance to be covered. Some time was also lost in deploying Pender's brigade in the third line just before the charge was ordered. It would have saved a half hour of great value to have ordered the charge as soon as the 2D line was formed, and allowed A.P. Hill's division to follow Rhodes and Colston in column from the first, as they actually did at last. 
4. After advancing some distance through the tangled undergrowth, Pender's brigade was brought back to the road and placed at the head of the column for the rest of the advance. It was nearly 6 p.m. when the signal for the advance was given by a bugle, and taken up and repeated for each brigade by bugles to the right and left through the woods. But the sounds seem to have been smothered in the forest, for the Federal reports make no mention of them. Their first intimation of anything unusual was given by wild turkeys, foxes, and deer, startled by the long lines of infantry and driven through the Federal camps. Then came shots from the Federal pickets, and then the guns on the turnpike opened and were soon followed by Confederate volleys and yells, impressing upon the enemy the fact that an overwhelming force had surprised them. Nevertheless, a gallant effort at resistance was made. The extreme right of the Federals was held by von Gilser's brigade of four regiments, about 1,400 strong, which was formed, a half facing south and half facing west. They stood to fear three volleys, but by that time the Confederate lines were enveloping their flanks, and enfilade and reverse fire was being opened upon them. Only prompt flight could save the brigade from annihilation. After the third volley the brigade very wisely took to its heels and made its escape with a loss of 264 killed, wounded, and captured. Two guns with von Gilsa were also captured. The next brigade to the left, McLean's, endeavored to change front. But it did not take long for the stern facts of the situation to become clear to every man of the brigade. As the canister fire of the Confederate guns was added to the enfilade fire of the Confederate infantry, this brigade also dissolved into a mass of fugitives, and two more guns, serving with them, were captured. But that they had fought well is shown by their losses, which were 692 out of about 2,500, the division commander and four out of five regimental commanders were killed or wounded. For a while, now, the fight degenerated into a foot race. Howard's original force of 13,000 had been reduced to 10,000 by the sending off of Barlow's large brigade. Of the 10,000, in a half hour 4,000 had been routed. The Confederates, recognizing the importance of pushing the pursuit, exerted themselves to the utmost. The lines broke into the double quick wherever the ground was favorable, stopping only to fire at fugitives or when completely out of breath. The horse artillery kept nearly abreast, and directed its fire principally at the Federal batteries which endeavored to cover the retreat. Some of these were fought gallantly, and some were overrun and captured. More might have been, and more prisoners taken, but for a blunder by Colquitt. His brigade was on the right of the front line, and its advance was least obstructed either by woods or the enemy. It could have moved most rapidly and might have narrowed the enemy's avenue of escape. Jackson's instructions had been explicit. Rhodes's report says, each brigade commander received positive instructions which were well understood. The whole line was to push ahead from the beginning, keeping the road for its guide. Under no circumstances was there to be any pause in the advance. Rams's brigade was ordered to move in rear of Colquitt's and to support it. Colquitt, early in the advance, halted to investigate a rumor of a body of the enemy on his right flank, which proved to be a small party of cavalry. He delayed so that neither his brigade or Rams rejoined the line until late at night. Thus two brigades, by disregard of instructions and without need, were kept entirely out of action during the whole afternoon. So it happened that five of Jackson's fifteen brigades, Thomas, Archer, Paxton, Colquitt and Drams were missing from his line of battle during the whole afternoon, and, as A.P. Hill's four remaining brigades were not deployed until after dark, only six brigades were in the attack and pursuit of the 11th Corps, to wit, Rhodes, Doles, and Iverson of Rhodes's division, and Jones, Warren, and Nichols of Colston's division. The great advantage of the Confederates lay in their being able to bring the center of their line of battle against the flank of the enemy's line. This overwhelmed the two right brigades in a very short while, as we have seen, and the line pushed rapidly on, hoping to overwhelm the succeeding brigades likewise, 
one at a time. The next division was Schertz's of two brigades, in line of battle along the plank road, with two batteries which took positions and fired on the approaching Confederates. Schertz endeavored to form at right angles to their approach, but the mass of fugitives with wagons, ambulances, beef cattle, etc., entirely overwhelmed some of his regiments, and only two or three isolated ones were able to march in good order, and, facing about, to fire from time to time at their pursuers. Next, at Dowdle's Tavern, was a line of rifle pits at right angles to the plank road, and already occupied by Bushbeck's brigade of von Steinwiz division, the last of Howard's corps, its companion brigade, Barlow's, being away with sickles. Three or four batteries were here established upon the line, and to it were rallied numbers of fugitives. At last an organized resistance was prepared. When the Confederates approached, in very scattered shape, they met a severe fire, and the advance was checked. Had Cole could here been on the Confederate right with his and Ramses brigades, an opportunity was offered for a large capture. It might have been accomplished by the force at hand with a little delay. But they were already flushed with victory and would not be denied. After a sharp fight of perhaps twenty minutes, Colston's second line merged into the first, and the two lines pushed forward everywhere. The Federal artillery foresaw the end and fled, five guns being too late and captured. Bushbeck followed in fairly good order, but proceeded by a stampede of troops and trains, principally down the plank road, though a part diverged to the left by a road to the White House, called the Bullock Road. The casualties in Schertz's division were 919. In Bushbeck's brigade were 483. The total loss of Howard's corps was killed, 217, wounded, 1,221, missing, 974, total, 2,412, only about 20% of the corps. It was a very trifling loss, compared with what it might have been had all of Jackson's troops been upon the field, and had his orders been strictly observed. The casualties of the Confederates are not known their returns consolidating all separate actions together. Much undeserved obloquy was heaped upon the 11th Corps for their enforced retreat. No troops could have acted differently. All of their fighting was of one brigade at a time against six. With the capture of the Bushbeck position, the fighting of the day practically ceased. The Confederate troops were at the limit of exhaustion and disorganization. Daylight was fading fast and commands badly intermingled. The pursuit was kept up, however, for some distance, although the enemy was no longer in sight. A few hundred yards beyond the Bushbeck position, the plank road entered a large body of forest, closing on both sides of the road for nearly a mile before the open Chancellorsville Plateau is reached. At the entrance of the wood a single Federal gun, with a small escort, was formed as a rear guard and followed the retreat to Chancellorsville without seeing any pursuers. A notable case of acoustic shadows occurred during this action. Sickles, some two and a half miles away, heard nothing of the attack upon Howard until word was brought him, which he at first refused to believe. At 6.30 p.m., Hooker sat on the veranda of the Chancellorsville house in entire confidence that Lee was retreating to Gordonsville and that Sickles was among his trains. Faint sounds of distant cannonading were at first supposed to come from Sickles. Presently, an aide looking down the road with his glass suddenly shouted, My God! Here they come! All sprang to their horses and, riding down the road, met, in a half mile, the fugitive rabble of Howard's corps and learned that Jackson, with half of Lee's army, had routed the Federal flank. Had there been some hours of daylight, Hooker's position would have been critical. For Lee and Jackson were now less than two miles apart, and between them were of infantry less than two divisions, Geary's of the 12th Corps in front of Lee, and two brigades of Berry's of the 3D, near the path of Jackson. But darkness puts an embargo upon offensive operations in a wooded country, Troops may be marched during the night, where there is no opposition, but the experiences of this occasion will illustrate the difficulty of fighting, even when the moon is at its best. 
the night restored to the Federals nearly all the advantages lost during the day. Hooker acted promptly and judiciously. Urgent recalls were sent for Sickles and his entire force. His advance had gone two miles to the front and was preparing to bivouac. When orders overtook it, it did not reach the field until after 10 p.m. The force first available against Jackson was the artillery of the 12th Corps, for which a fine position was offered along the western brow of the Chancellorsville Plateau, south of the Plank Road. This position was known as Fairview, and it now became the key point of the battle. In front of it the open ground extended about 600 yards to the edge of the forest. A small stream, between moderate banks at the foot of the plateau, offered shelter for a strong line of infantry in front of the guns. Here, within an hour, was established a powerful battery of 34 guns, and during the night all were protected by parapets. The position was essentially like the Confederate position at Mares Hill before Fredericksburg, but on a larger scale. The forest in front offered no single position for a Confederate gun. Only from one point could it be assailed by artillery. Across the stream in front, about 1,000 yards obliquely to the left, was the small settlement called Hazel Grove, occupying some high open fields, from which, as has been told, Bernie had that morning discovered Jackson's march. Hazel Grove offered excellent positions for attacking the Fevier lines. But Hazel Grove was itself within the Federal lines, and, about sundown, was occupied by a few cavalry with some artillery of the 3D Corps, and some miscellaneous trains. One the only Federal infantry near at hand when the fugitives reached Chancellorsville were Cars and Revere's brigades of Berry's division of the 3D Corps. These brigades were formed in line of battle in the forest north of the Plank Road, with their left resting on the guns at Fairview. Here they promptly set to work to entrench themselves in the forest across the plank road, and to cut an abatis in front. They were soon reinforced by Hayes's brigade of French's division of the 2D Corps, and later by Mott's, the remaining brigade of Berry's division, which had been guarding bridges at United States Ford. Meanwhile, as darkness fell, the Confederate pursuit died out upon entering the forest beyond the open lands about Dowdell's Tavern. The cessation was not voluntary on Jackson's part, but it was necessary that Rhodes's and Colston's divisions should be reformed, and that Hill's division should take the lead. It had followed the pursuit, marching in column, and was in good order and comparatively fresh. The other divisions were broken, mingled, and exhausted, and several brigades were far behind. During the long pause in the advance, while Hill's brigades filed into the woods to the right and left, and the disorganized brigades were withdrawn to reform, Jackson impatiently supervised and urged forward the movements. It is possible that he proposed to push his attack down the Bullock Road which, a short distance ahead, diverged to the left, toward the river, instead of following the Plank Road to Chancellorsville, as he had said to Hill, press them, Hill, press them, cut them off from United States Ford. It would, however, have been an error to make such a diversion, for the attack would have met an overwhelming force. Its only hope of success was to reunite with Lee at Chancellorsville with the least delay. Meanwhile, partaking of the impatience of Jackson, his chief of artillery, Col. Crutchfield, pushed some guns forward on the plank road, and opened a random fire down it toward Chancellorsville, now less than a mile away. It was an unwise move for it provoked a terrific response from the 34 guns now in position upon Fairview Plateau. The plank road was now crowded with troops and artillery in column, and the woods near it were full of the reorganizing brigades. Under such a fire, even in the dim light of the rising moon, great confusion soon resulted, and although actual casualties were few, it became necessary to discontinue our fire before order could be restored and the formation of the line of battle be resumed. Lane's NC Brigade was at the head of Hill's division. One regiment, the 33D, was deployed and sent some 200 yards ahead as skirmishers, and the other four formed line of battle with the center on the plank road in the following order from left to right, 28th, 18th, 
37th, 7th. The Bullock Road here diverged to the left, toward United States Ford, but the enemy was evidently close in front, and Jackson said to Lane, push right ahead, Lane. Right ahead. While the formation was still in progress, Jackson, followed by several staff officers and couriers, rode slowly forward upon an old road, called the Mountain Road, which left the Bullock to its left near the Plank Road, and ran parallel to the latter, about eighty yards distant, toward Chancellorsville. One up this road the party advanced for one hundred or two hundred yards, but not passing the thirty-three DNC skirmish line. They then halted and listened for a while to the axes of the Federals, cutting a batis in the forest ahead. Beyond the plank road, the Federal troops who had been off with sickles were now returning, and were slowly working their way to reoccupy some breastworks which had been built the night before in the forest south of the plank road. Between their skirmishers and those of the 33 DNC on their side of the plank road, there suddenly began some firing. The fire spread rapidly in both directions, along the picket lines, and was presently taken up by federal regiments and lines of battle in the rear. Jackson, at the head of his party, was slowly retracing his way back to his line of battle, when this volley firing began. Major Barry, on the left of the 18th and C, seeing through the trees by the moonlight a group of horsemen moving toward his line, ordered his left wing to fire. Two of the party were killed, and Jackson received three balls, one in the right hand, one through the left wrist and hand, and one shattering the left arm between shoulder and elbow. The reins were dropped, and the horse, turning from the fire, ran into overhanging limbs which nearly unhorsed him, but, recovering the rein, he guided into the plank road where Captain Wilborn of his staff helped him off. Meanwhile, the enemy had advanced guns to their skirmish line, and presently began to sweep the plank road with shell and canister. A litter was brought and Jackson placed in it, but a bearer was shot, and Jackson fell heavily on his wounded side. With great difficulty he was finally gotten to an ambulance, which already held his chief of artillery, Col. Crutchfield, with a shattered leg. During the night Jackson's left arm was amputated and the next day he was taken in an ambulance via Spotsylvania, to a small house called Chandler's, near Guinea Station. For a few days his recovery was expected, but pneumonia supervened, and he died on May 10. In his last moments his mind wandered, and he was again upon the battlefield giving orders to his troops, order A.P. Hill to prepare for action. Pass the infantry to the front. Tell Major Hawks. There was a pause for some moments, and then, calmly, the last words, let us pass over the river, and rest under the shade of the trees. Jackson's fall left A.P. Hill in command, but Hill was himself soon disabled by a fragment of shell, and sent for Stuart. Rhodes ranked Stuart, but the latter was not only best known to the army, but was of great popularity, and Rhodes cheerfully acquiesced. His whole career until his death at Winchester, September 19, 64, was brilliant, and justifies the belief that he would have proven a competent commander, but, as will be seen, Stuart's conduct, upon this occasion, was notably fine. A little before dark, Stuart, with Jackson's consent, had taken his cavalry and a regiment of infantry and started to attack the camps and trains of the enemy near Ely's Ford. He had reached their vicinity and was forming for the assault, when one of Jackson's staff brought the message of recall. He ordered the command to fire three volleys into the nearest camp and then to withdraw, while he rode rapidly back, about five miles, and took command between 10 and 11 p.m. There was but one course to take, to make during the night such preparation as was possible, and, at dawn to renew the attack and endeavor to break through the enemy's line and unite with Lee at Chancellorsville. The wounding of Crutchfield had left me the senior artillery officer present, and I was sent for, and directed to reconnoiter, and to post before dawn as many guns as could be used. I spent the night in reconnaissance and, beside the plank road, could find but one outlet through the forest, a cleared vista some two hundred yards long and twenty-five wide 
through a dense pine thicket, opening upon a cleared plateau held by the enemy. This plateau afterward proved to be the Hazel Grove position, and I concentrated near it several batteries. In his life of Stuart, Major McClellan, his adjutant, writes, Col. Alexander's reconnaissance convinced Stuart that Hazel Grove was the key to the Federal line, and to this part of the field Stuart directed a large share of his personal attention on the morning of the 3D. One of Jackson's engineers was sent by a long detour and found Lee before daylight and explained to him Stuart's position and plans, that he might, during the action, extend his left and seek a connection with our right. During the night, the brigades in rear rejoined, and the three divisions were formed for the attack in the morning, with Hill's division in front, Colston's in a second line, and Rhodes's in a third. Two brigades on Hill's right were placed obliquely to the rear to present a front toward that flank. The positions of the different brigades are roughly shown thus colon when Hooker found that the Confederate attack had come to a standstill in front of the Fevier line, with Sickles near Hazel Grove upon its right flank, he ordered Sickles to move forward by the moonlight, and attack. Burney's division, in two lines with supporting columns, about midnight, advanced from Hazel Grove upon the forest south of the Plank Road and in front of the Fairview position. The left wing of this force grazed the skirmishers of McGowan and struck the right flank of Lane's brigade, of which two and a half regiments became sharply engaged. But the whole Federal advance glanced off, as it were, and, changing its direction, it turned toward the Federal line in front of Fairview, where it approached the position of Knipes and Ruger's brigades of Williams's division of the 12th Corps. Hearing their noisy approach, and believing them to be Confederates, the Fairview guns and infantry opened fire upon the woods, while the approaching lines were still so distant that they were unable to locate their assailants, and supposed the fire to come from the Confederate line. And now for a long time, for one or perhaps two hours, the Confederates listened to a succession of furious combats in the forest in their front, accompanied by heavy shelling of the woods, volleys of musketry, and a great deal of cheering. Our pickets and skirmish lines were forced sometimes to lie down or seek protection of trees from random bullets, but we had no other part in it. It extended northward sometimes even across the plank road and the official reports of many federal officers give glowing accounts of the repulse of desperate confederate attacks, and even of the capture of confederate guns. These stories were founded on the finding of some federal guns, which had been abandoned in one of the stampedes of the afternoon. Col. Hamlin's book, above referred to, says, some of the reports of this midnight encounter are missing, and their publication will throw much light on the details. On the federal side it was undoubtedly a mixed up mess, and some of the regiments complain of being fired into from the front and from both flanks. At all events, after reading the reports of Gen. Sickles at the time, and his statement a year afterward to Congress. The brilliant array of gallant troops in the moonlight. The bold attack. The quick return of one of the columns to be stopped by the bayonets of the 63 d par the advance of the other column deflecting to the right, until it met Jen. Slocum in person. Certainly there is occasion for a slight smile on the part of the reader. And this smile may be lengthened on reading the story of General de Trobriand, who was a participator, or the account left by Col. Underwood of the 23d Mass, who returned from the depths of the wilderness in time to witness and describe the ludicrous scene. Hooker had little cause for apprehension after darkness had come to his relief, yet the shock to his overconfidence had been so severe that his only new dispositions were defensive. Yet he had over 60,000 fresh troops present, while Lee had on the east but about 16,000 and on the west about 24,000. His first care was to order the entrenchment of an interior line, upon which he could fall back in case Stuart forced his way through to a junction with Lee. A short line was quickly selected, of great natural strength, behind Hunting Run on the west, and behind Mineral Spring Run on the east, with both flanks resting on the river and covering his bridges. This line will be more fully described and referred to later. 
It took in the White House, some three-fourths of a mile in the rear of Chancellorsville, and was probably the strongest field entrenchment ever built in Va. Next, Hooker sent orders to Sedgwick at 9 p.m., as follows. The Major General, commanding, directs that you cross the Rappahannock at Fredericksburg on receipt of this order, and at once take up your line of march on the Chancellorsville Road until you connect with him and will attack and destroy any force you may fall in with on your road. You will leave all your trains behind, except pack trains of your ammunition, and march to be in the vicinity of the general at daylight. You will probably fall upon the rear of the forces commanded by Gen. Lee, and between you and the Major General, commanding. He expects to use him up. Send word to Gen. Gibbon to take possession of Fredericksburg be sure not to fail. These orders were good, and would have ensured victory, had they been carried out. And Hooker took a further precaution, most desirable whenever important orders are issued. He dispatched a competent staff officer, Gen. Warren, his chief engineer, to supervise their execution. Unfortunately for him, however, under the conditions it proved impossible to execute the orders within the time set as will be told later. Here it is only necessary to note that Sedgwick was never able to get near Chancellorsville. Even as the field stood, with or without the arrival of Sedgwick, the battle was still Hooker's, had he fought where he stood. But about dawn he made the fatal mistake of recalling Sickles from the Hazel Grove position, which he was holding with Whipple's and Burney's divisions, and five batteries. There has rarely been a more gratuitous gift of a battlefield. Sickles had a good position and force enough to hold it, even without reinforcements, though ample reinforcements were available. The Federal line was longer and overlapped ours on its right, and our only opportunity to use artillery was through the narrow vista above referred to, which was scarcely sufficient for four guns, and had but a very restricted view. Had Stuart's attack been delayed a little longer, our right flank might have marched out upon Hazel Grove Plateau without firing a shot. A federal battery, supported by two regiments, had been designated as a rear guard, and it alone occupied the plateau when our advance was made, though the rear of the retiring column was still near. Stuart's men, when the lines were finally formed, got from two to three hours rest before dawn. About that time, cooked rations were brought up. Before the distribution, however, was finished, Archer's and McGowan's brigades were moved forward, from their retired positions as the right flank, to straighten the line. They soon came upon a picket line of the enemy, and sharp firing began. Stuart, without waiting further, ordered the whole line to the attack. Archer's brigade, about 1,400 strong, in advancing through the pine thickets, drifted to the right and gradually opened a gap between it and McGowan's brigade, emerging from the forest alone, and in front of the enemy's rearguard. A sharp action ensued, while Archer extended his right and threatened the enemy's rear, forcing the battery to retreat. He then charged and captured 100 prisoners, and forced the abandonment of four of the guns. He attempted to push his advance much farther, but was checked by the fire of the enemy's artillery and of the rear brigade, Graham's, of Sickles's column. After two efforts, realizing that his force was too small, and leaving one of his captured guns, he fell back to Hazel Grove Ridge, about 6.30 am this was now being occupied rapidly by our guns. Thus, so easily that we did not at once realize its great value, we gained space for our batteries where we soon found that we could enfilade the enemy's adjacent lines. Meanwhile, the first assault had been made along the whole line by Hill's division. The enemy's advanced line crossed the plank road and was held by Williams's division of the 12th Corps, Berry's of the 3D Corps, and Hayes's brigade of the 2D Corps. In rear of the front line was a second line near the edge of the forest. Across the small stream and along the edge of the elevated plateau, their artillery had been strongly entrenched during the night, making a third line. The two divisions from Hazel Grove, with their four batteries, were brought up in rear of the forces already holding the front to the west. This whole front from north to south was scarcely a mile and a quarter long. 
it was defended by about 25,000 men, and it was being attacked by about an equal number. The Confederates, however, had the hot end of the affair, in having to take the aggressive and advance upon breastworks protected by abattis and entrenched guns. In his first assault, however, Hill's division, now commanded by Heth, after a terrific exchange of musketry, succeeded in driving the Federals from the whole of their front line. They followed the retreating enemy, and attacked the second line, where the resistance became more strenuous. On the extreme right, Archer's brigade had now fallen back to Hazel Grove, where it remained, supporting the guns now taking position there. This left McGowan's flank uncovered, and a Federal force attacked it and drove it back to the captured line. This uncovered Lane's brigade, and it was also forced to fall back. On the left of the plank road, the advance of Thomas beyond the enemy's first line met both a stronger second line and a flank attack, his left being in the air. After an hour's hard fighting, the whole line was forced back to the captured breastworks, with severe losses. It was clear that extreme efforts would be needed to drive the enemy from his position. Stuart ordered 30 additional guns to Hazel Grove, and brought forward both the second and third lines, putting in at once his last reserves. It would be useless to follow in detail the desperate fighting which now ensued and was kept up for some hours. The Federal guns on the Fairview Heights were able to fire over the heads of two lines of infantry and other batteries aided from the new position in which Hooker had now established the 1st, 2d, and 5th Corps. This was so near on our left that Carroll's and McGregor's brigades of the 2d Corps, with artillery, were sent forward to attack our flank, and were only repulsed after such fighting that they lost 367 men. With the aid of our 2nd and 3rd lines, fresh assaults were made on both sides of the plank road, and now the enemy's second lines were carried. But his reserves were called upon, and again our lines were driven back, and countercharges south of the road again penetrated the gap between McGowan and Archer. Paxton's brigade was brought across from the north and restored the situation at a critical moment, Paxton, however, being killed. Some of our brigades were now nearly fought out, the three divisions being often massed in one and the men could only be moved by much example on the part of their officers. Stuart himself was conspicuous in this, and was everywhere encouraging the troops with his magnetic presence and bearing, and singing as he rode along the lines, Old Joe Hooker, won't you come out the wilderness? There can be no doubt that his personal conduct had great influence in sustaining the courage of the men so that when, at last, our artillery had begun to shake the Federal's lines. There was still the spirit to traverse the bloody ground for the fourth time and storm the Fairview batteries. Guns had been brought to Hazel Grove from all the battalions on the field Begrams, Carters, Joneses, McIntoshes, and Alexanders. Perhaps fifty guns in all were employed here, but less than forty at any one time, as guns were occasionally relieved, or sent to the rear to refill. Their field of fire was extensive being an oblique on both the enemy's artillery and infantry. Some ground having been gained on the plank road, calls. Jones and, Carter had also been able to establish ten rifle guns there, which enfiladed the plank road as far as the Chancellorsville house. About nine o'clock, the Federal artillery fire was perceptibly diminished. Many of their guns were running short of ammunition, and fresh ammunition was not supplied. Sickles asked for it, and for reinforcements, but none were sent. It would seem that Hooker preferred to lose the Chancellorsville Plateau entirely, and fall back into his new position, which was like a citadel close at hand, rather than risk fighting outside of it. At Stuart's last charge, the Federal lines yielded with but moderate resistance. The guns in the Fairview entrenchments abandoned them and fell back to the vicinity of the Chancellorsville House. The guns at Hazel Grove moved forward across the valley and occupied the deserted Federal positions, here making connection with Anderson's division which Lee was extending to his left to meet them. They were soon joined by Jordan's battery of my own battalion, which had been serving with Anderson. The enemy, driven out of their fortified lines, 
attempted to make a stand near the Chancellor's Ville House, but it was a brief one. There were no breastworks here to give shelter, and their position was now so contracted that our guns from three directions crossed their fire upon it. Hooker, in the porch of the Chancellor's Ville House, was put hors de combat for two or three hours by a piece of brick torn from a pillar by a cannon shot. No one took command in his place, and for a while the army was without a head. Meanwhile, McClers and Anderson had seen the enemy withdrawing from their fronts and pressed forward at the same time that Stuart's infantry crowned the plateau from the west. Some prisoners were cut off and captured on each flank, and a few guns also fell into our hands, but, as a whole, the enemy's withdrawal was orderly and well managed, and with less loss than might have been expected. One sad feature of the occasion was that the woods on the north of the road were set on fire by shells, and the dry leaves spread the fire rapidly, although the trees and undergrowth did not burn. Efforts were made to remove the wounded, but the rapid spread of the fire prevented, and some of the wounded of both armies were burned. About 10 a.m., Lee, advancing with McClure's division, met Stuart with Jackson's corps near the site of the Chancellorsville House now only a smoking ruin, for our shells had set it on fire. It was, doubtless, a proud moment to Lee, as it was to the troops who greeted him with enthusiastic cheering. Lee, by no means, intended the battle to end here. Both infantry and artillery were ordered to replenish ammunition and renew the assault, but there came news from the rear, which forced a change of program. Sedgwick's corps had broken through the flimsy line in front of it, and was now moving up the plank road. With all his audacity Lee could not venture to attack five corps entrenched in his front, while Sedgwick came up in his rear. The story of events at Chancellorsville must now pause, as the action that paused, while it is told of Sedgwick's venture against Lee's rear. Hooker had sent urgent orders the night before to Sedgwick to come to his help, and a staff officer, Warren, to supervise their execution. But Sedgwick, though already on the south side of the river, which Hooker did not seem to know, was three miles below Fredericksburg, near the scene of Franklin's crossing in December he had been under orders to advance toward Richmond on the Bowling Green Road, and had disposed his troops accordingly. To advance up the plank road, it was necessary to march to Fredericksburg and force the Confederate lines on Mare's Hill. These lines were held from Taylor's Hill to the Howison House, about three miles, by only two brigades, Barksdale's and Hayes's, with a small amount of artillery. The regiments were strung out in single rank, the men sometimes yards apart, and with wide intervals at many places between regiments. On Mare's Hill, two regiments, the 18th and 21st Miss with six guns of the Washington Arty and two under Lieutenant Brown of Alexander's Bat, were distributed from the Plank Road to Hazel Creek, about a half mile. Sedgwick had marched at midnight with a good moon, but his progress was slow, for the Confederate pickets annoyed it. By daylight he was in Fredericksburg, and his batteries from both banks of the river and from the edge of the town opened on the Confederates. Sedgwick had been informed by Hooker that the Confederate force left at Fredericksburg was very small, and, without delay, he sent forward four regiments from Wheaton's and Shaler's brigades to charge the works in front of Mare's Hill. It was sending a boy on a man's errand. The Confederate infantry reserved its fire until the enemy were within forty yards, when they opened and quickly drove them back. A second assault was made, but with similar result. Sedgwick was now convinced that a heavy force confronted him, and he waited for Gibbon's division of the 2D Corps. This had just crossed from Falmouth, and it made an effort upon the extreme Confederate left. It proved futile on account of the canal along the front at that part of the field, which was defended by three regiments of Hayes's brigade of Early's division, hurried the by early on seeing the enemy's preparations. Soon afterward, Wilcox's brigade came to the scene from Banks Ford, where it had been in observation on the 2D. At dawn on the 3D, Wilcox noted that the enemy's pickets on the north side were wearing haversacks, and correctly guessed that the forces opposite were leaving for Chancellorsville. 
he was preparing to march in the same direction, when a messenger brought word of the advance of Gibbon's division. Thereupon leaving a picket of fifty men and two guns in observation at Banks Ford, Wilcox marched to Taylor's Hill. About 10 a.m., Gibbon having reported that an attack on our extreme left was impracticable, and Howe's division, making no progress east of Hazel Run, Sedgwick had no recourse but to renew his attack upon Mare's Hill by main force. He accordingly prepared a much stronger assault than that of the morning. Newton's division, supported by Burnham's brigade, was to attack Mare's Hill, while Howe's division assaulted Lee's Hill beyond Hazel Run. This force numbered about 14,000 men, with an abundant artillery. Across Hazel Creek were seven guns of Cutts and Cabell's battalions, and the two remaining regiments of Barksdale's brigade and one lap of Hayes's brigade. About 11 a.m., both Newton and Howe renewed the assault. Newton advanced rapidly through the fire of the few Confederate guns, but recoiled soon after the infantry opened, although Barksdale's line was so thin that it scarcely averaged a man to five feet of parapet. Some of the Federal regiments, however, suffered severely and a number of killed and wounded were left near the Confederate line. This, by a strange piece of good nature on the part of one of our best officers, proved our undoing. When Newton's line was beaten back, the firing on both sides nearly ceased, and some Federal officer sent forward a flag of truce. No Federal report mentions this incident. The flag was probably sent by only a brigade commander, for the fighting, by Howe's division across Hazel Run, was kept up without cessation. Col. Griffin of the 18th Miss. Received the flag. The officer bearing it asked to be allowed to remove his dead and wounded in Griffin's front. Without referring to his brigade commander, Griffin granted the request, and, still more thoughtlessly, allowed his own men to show themselves while the wounded were being delivered. The enemy, to their great surprise, discovered what a small force was in their front. They lost little time in taking advantage of the information. The action was reopened, and now a charge was made with a rush, and the enemy swarmed over our works. The Mississippians had no chance to escape, but fought with butts of guns and bayonets, and were mostly captured, with the loss of about 100 killed and wounded. The casualties in Newton's division and Burnham's brigade, in the whole battle, were about 1,200, of which probably 900 fell in this affair. All of the guns on the hill were captured. Brown's section last of all, firing until surrounded. Meanwhile, Howe's division had a full mile to traverse before reaching the Confederate lines. Instead of a charge, their progress was a slow advance under cover of heavy artillery fire. Before they reached the Confederate line, Newton's division had made its second charge and was in possession of Mare's Hill. Thereupon, Early, who was in command, ordered the withdrawal of his whole division, and the formation of a new line of battle across the Telegraph Road, about two miles in the rear. Here he concentrated Gordon's, Hoax, and Smith's brigades, with the remnants of Barksdale's. Hayes's brigade had been cut off with Wilcox and these two brigades were in position to delay Sedgwick in advancing upon the plank road toward Chancellorsville. But Hayes, under orders from Early, crossed the plank road before Sedgwick had made any advance. Wilcox then took position with four guns across the plank road, and delayed the enemy's advance as much as possible, while he fell back slowly to Salem Church, where he had been notified that McClaws would meet him with reinforcements. He reached this point about 3 p.m., meeting the Wafords, Semses, Gershaws, and Muon's brigades, under McClaws. The five brigades rapidly formed a single line of battle across the plank road. Wilcox's brigade held the center, with the 14th and 11th Alabama on the left of the plank road, and the 10th and 8th on the right. The 9th Alabama was in reserve a short distance in rear of the 10th. Four guns were posted across the plank road, and a company of infantry was put in Salem Church, and one in a schoolhouse a short distance in front. Kershaw's brigade was on the right of Wilcox, and Wofford on right of Kershaw, Semmes's brigade was on Wilcox's left, 
and Muon's brigade was on the left of Sem's dot in front of the line of battle stretched a fringe of dense young wood, some two hundred yards wide, and beyond that, for perhaps a half mile, were open fields, which extended with a few interruptions on each side of the plank road back to Fredericksburg, about four miles. Sedgwick had been delayed over four hours in traversing that distance. At about 4.30 p.m., Sedgwick established a battery 1,000 yards in front of Wilcox, and opened fire. The Confederate artillery was nearly out of ammunition, and after a few rounds it was withdrawn. Encouraged by this, the Federals now sent forward Brooks's division, formed across the road in two lines with Newton's division in the same formation upon Brooks's right. Now ensued one of the most brilliant and important of the minor affairs of the war. McClers had reached the field and assumed the command, but credit is also due to Wilcox, who had delayed many times his number for several hours, and gained time for reinforcements to arrive. The story of the battle may be told very briefly. North of the road, opposite the 14th and 11th Alabama, was Torbert's Jersey Brigade under Brown, in a double line. On the south, opposite the 8th, 9th, and 10th Alabama, was Bartlett's Brigade, one of the best in the Federal Army, which boasted that it had never been repulsed, and had never failed to hold any position it was ordered to occupy. The strength of the Confederate position consisted in the thick undergrowth which completely hid their lines, lying down on the crest of a slight ridge in rear of the woods. These were held by skirmishers during the enemy's approach across the open. When the artillery was withdrawn, it left a gap of about 50 yards between the 11th Alabama, on the left of the road and the 10th on the right. Bartlett's brigade advanced gallantly through the severe skirmish fire, fought through the strip of woods, drove the company from the church, and cut off the one in the schoolhouse. Pushing on and overlapping the left of the 10th Alabama, they enfiladed it broke its line, and drove it back in confusion. The 8th Alabama, under Lieutenant Cole. Herbert, on the right of the 10th, however, did not break, but threw back its three left companies, and brought an enfilade fire on the enemy's further advance. The 9th Alabama, being in reserve a little in rear of the 10th, rose from the ground, and, giving the enemy a volley, charged them and drove them back. Brown's brigade, on the opposite side of the road, had a wider body of woods to cross, and had not advanced as far as Bartlett. But when Bartlett was driven back, Wilcox's whole brigade joined in the counterstroke. Bartlett's first line was followed so rapidly that the prisoners in the schoolhouse were liberated, and the rush of the fugitives and the quick pursuit overwhelmed the second line giving it no chance to make a stand dot across the plank road, Sam's two right regiments, the 10th and 51st Georgia, joined the 14th and 11th Alabama, and these four regiments, meeting the Jersey Brigade in the woods, drove it back in such a direction that the fugitives from each side of the plank road converged upon the road. The Confederates in pursuit said that they had never had such crowds to fire upon. The pursuit was dangerously prolonged, but fortunately the enemy contented himself by checking it, and the Confederates then slowly withdrew. Long-range firing, however, was kept up until night. Bartlett's brigade reported a loss in this attack of 580 officers and men out of less than 1,500 men. Brown's brigade reported a loss of 511. Brooks, commanding the division, said in his official report, in this brief but sanguinary conflict this division lost nearly 1,500 officers and men. Col. H. W. Brown, commanding the Jersey Brigade, was severely wounded, and Col. Collett, 1st and J. Col. G. W. Town, and Lieutenant Col. Hall, 95th Pa, were killed. Wilcox's brigade lost 75 killed, 372 wounded, and 48 missing, a total of 495. The losses of Semmes's brigade are included with the campaign losses. One of its regiments, however, the 10th Georgia, reports for this day, 21 killed, 102 wounded, and 5 missing, a total of 128 out of 230 present.
In the morning at Chancellorsville, this regiment had received the surrender of the 27th Connecticut, which had been on picket and was cut off by the capture of Chancellorsville. During this charge it also captured over 100 prisoners. While this action was going on, Early had formed line of battle to resist an advance of the enemy upon the Telegraph Road, and was bringing up his extreme right from Hamilton's Crossing. It was about night when his whole division was concentrated. The enemy was holding Gibbon's entire division idle in Fredericksburg, guarding the pontoon bridges to Falmouth. Had Gibbon moved up on Sedgwick's flank to Banks Ford, his division would have counted for something in the next day's affairs. His force was just what Sedgwick needed to enable him to hold his ground. Returning now to Chancellorsville, we have to note a movement which involved an unfortunate Confederate delay on the next day, a delay which enabled Sedgwick's corps to escape scot free from a position which should have cost him all his artillery and half his men. The River Road, from Chancellorsville to Fredericksburg via Banks Ford, was left unoccupied when Hooker took refuge in his fortified lines on the morning of the 3d. Anderson, with his three remaining brigades, Comerites, Perry's, and Posey apostrophe s comma was sent at 4 p.m. to watch that road and threatened the enemy upon that flank. Two hours after sunrise on the 4th, Heth arrived with three brigades to relieve Anderson, who was now ordered to proceed to Salem Church, about six miles and report to McClure's, which he did about noon. This sending Anderson to reinforce McClure's might have been done the afternoon before. He would then have been on hand at the earliest hour for the joint attack upon Sedgwick, on the 4th, which is now to be described. The events of the morning of the 4th had been as follows, no communication had been received by Sedgwick from Hooker, and he was still under orders to come to Chancellorsville. But at an early hour, Movements of Early's troops were discovered in his rear, and, instead of advancing, Sedgwick had deployed Howe's division perpendicular to the plank road facing to his rear, and stretching to the river above Banks Ford, where pontoon bridges had been laid the afternoon before. Sedgwick's scouts had reported that a column of the enemy, 15,000 strong, coming from the direction of Richmond, had occupied the heights of Fredericksburg, cutting him off from the town. He at once abandoned all idea of taking the aggressive, and only wished himself safely across the river. But he did not dare to attempt a crossing, except under cover of night. His lines were too long, and were weak in plan, as they faced in three directions comma east, south, and west. But he dared not venture a change, for fear of precipitating an attack. When at last he received a dispatch from Hooker, its non-committal advice was not encouraging. It said, everything's snug here. We contracted the lines a little and repulsed the last assault with ease. Gen. Hooker wishes them to attack him tomorrow, if they will. He does not desire you to attack them again in force, unless he attacks him at the same time. He says you are too far away for him to direct. Look well to the safety of your corps and keep up communication with Jen. Benham at Banks Ford and Fredericksburg. You can go to either place if you think it best to cross. Banks Ford would bring you in supporting distance of the main body, and would be better than falling back to Fredericksburg. A little later Hooker sent another message, urging Sedgwick, if possible, to hold a position on the south bank, to which Sedgwick replied, the enemy threatens me strongly on two fronts. My position is bad for such attack. It was assumed for attack, not for defense. It is not improbable that the bridges at Banks Ford may be sacrificed. Can you help me strongly if I am attacked? No answer to this inquiry appears, and Sedgwick stood on the defensive, awaiting nightfall. Meanwhile, early in the morning, Early's division, with Barksdale's brigade, had moved down upon Mare's Hill which they found held by a picket force only, and easily occupied. An advance was attempted into Fredericksburg, but it was found with barricades across the streets held by one of Gibbon's brigades, supported by two other brigades and a number of guns on the north bank. Early then sent to communicate with McClure's and endeavor to arrange a joint attack upon Sedgwick, but received information that Anderson's division was coming, 
and was himself sent for to meet Lee. Before leaving Chancellorsville that morning, Lee had examined Hooker's lines with the view of assaulting at once, but their strength made it imprudent to do so while Sedgwick was still south of the river. So he next set out to dispose of Sedgwick, that he might then concentrate his whole force to attack Hooker. Probably no man ever commanded an army and, at the same time, so entirely commanded himself, as Lee. This morning was almost the only occasion on which I ever saw him out of humor. It was when waiting the arrival of Anderson, with his three brigades from the river road, after being relieved by Heth. Anderson was in no way to blame for the delay, but he should have been relieved the afternoon before, which would have let him move during the night. Some delay was inevitable, as Sedgwick's peculiar rectangular formation was not readily understood. It was about three miles in extent, and occupied high ground, with a wide, open valley in its front, forcing a development of our line of nearly six miles to cover its three fronts. An entire day would have been none too much to devote to the attack, if the fruits of victory were to be reaped. Although Lee urged all possible speed, it was 6 p.m. when the advance commenced. Sunset was at 7. Darkness fell before the lines could be gotten into close action. In the dusk, two of Early's brigades, Hooks and Hayes's, fired into each other by mistake, and were thrown into confusion. Both had to be withdrawn and reformed. The enemy was, however, forced back to the vicinity of Banks Fort, and had there then been daylight to bring up our batteries, there might have been large captures. Upon McClellan's front, Ranges were marked by daylight for firing upon Banks Ford and some guns were kept firing all night. But all that was possible amounted only to annoyance. It was again illustrated that afternoon attacks seldom reap any fruits of victory. It was with great elation on the morning of the 5th, that our guns fired the last shots across the Rappahannock at Sedgwick's retreating columns. But orders, soon received from headquarters, indicated that our commander was not yet satisfied. Early's division and Barksdale's brigade were directed to remain in observation at Banks Ford and Fredericksburg, which had also been evacuated by Gibbon's division during the previous night, while all the rest of the army was ordered to return to the front of Hooker's lines near Chancellorsville, which Lee intended to assault on the morrow with his whole force. What was known of the enemy's position gave assurance that the task would be the heaviest which we had ever undertaken. Hooker now had his entire army concentrated, and, allowing for his losses, must have had fully 90,000 men to defend about five miles of breastworks. These he had had 48 hours to prepare, with all the advantages for defense which the wilderness offered. Lee would scarcely be able to bring into action 35,000 under all the disadvantages imposed by the wilderness upon the offensive and by two streams which on the southeast and northwest covered three-fourths of the enemy's front. Behind these streams both flanks rested securely upon the river. The attack would have to be made everywhere squarely in front, and our artillery would be unable to render any efficient help. When, upon the 6th, we found the lines deserted and the enemy gone, our engineers were amazed at the strength and completeness of the enemy's entrenchments. Impenetrable abatis covered the entire front, and the crest everywhere carried headlogs under which the men could fire as through loopholes. In rear, separate structures were provided for officers, with protected outlooks, whence they could see and direct without exposure. Four of Hooker's corps had suffered casualties averaging 20%, but three, the first, two D, and fifth, had scarcely been engaged. It must be conceded that Lee never in his life took a more audacious resolve than when he determined to assault Hooker's entrenchments. And it is the highest possible compliment to the army commanded by Lee to say that there were two persons concerned who believed that, in spite of all the odds, it would have been victorious. These two persons were Gens. Lee and Hooker for Hooker was already hurrying his preparations to retreat during the coming night. Clearly, this decision was the mistake of his life. During the afternoon of the 5th, there came on one of the remarkable storms which on many occasions closely followed severe engagements. The rainfall was unusually heavy and continued long after dark, 
converting roads into quagmires, rivulets into torrents, and causing great discomfort to man and beast. But its occurrence was advantageous to the Confederates, as it prevented their pressing upon the enemy's impregnable line, and it hurried the efforts of the Federals to cross the river, as rapidly rising waters overflowed the approaches to their bridges. Before the rain, I had found positions for several guns close upon the riverbank, partly around a bend below the Federal left, giving an oblique fire upon some of their batteries. During the night we constructed pits, and, at early dawn, were putting the guns in them, when we were suddenly fired upon by guns square upon our own flank and across the river. A lieutenant had his ankle smashed, some horses were killed, and some dismounted limber chests were exploded, before all could be gotten under cover in the pits. From these we could make no reply, as they faced Hooker's lines, and we could only lie close and wait for more daylight. This revealed that the enemy had abandoned his works during the night and recrossed the river. To retaliate I brought up seven other guns, under cover of the wood, and engaged the enemy for a half hour, inflicting some loss in killed and wounded, as reported by Jen. Hunt, with no further loss to ourselves, but the wheel of a gun. Finding by then that the battle was over and no enemy left on our side of the river, the guns were gradually withdrawn and camps were sought in another severe rainstorm, which came up about 5 p.m. and lasted far into the night. One, the battle made by Stuart on the 3D has rarely been surpassed, measured either by the strength of the lines carried or by the casualties suffered in so brief a period. In Colston's division, four brigades lost eight brigade commanders three killed and five disabled. Three out of six of the division staff fell. In Pender's brigade of Heth's division, six out of ten field officers were killed or wounded. Our brigades rarely came to the field two thousand strong, and casualties of six hundred to a brigade were rarely reached even in battles prolonged over a day. Here within six hours, five of the fifteen brigades lost over six hundred in killed and wounded each. Lane's NC Brigade losing 786, Colston's NC and VA losing 726, Pender's NC 693. The Battle of Chickamauga is generally called the bloodiest of modern battles. The losses given by Livermore are 22% in the Federal Army and 25% in the Confederate, in two days' fighting. Jackson's three divisions had a paper strength of 26,661, and their losses were 7,158, about 27%. They were, doubtless, over 30% of the force actually engaged. The losses in the 3D and 12th Federal Corps, which composed the principal part of our opponents, were less, as they fought behind breastworks. Their strength on paper was 32,171. Their losses were 4,703, being about 15% of the paper strength and probably 18% of the actual Dr. Gen. Lee being present on the left, during the Sunday morning attack, and seen Stuart's energy and efficiency in handling his reserves, inspiring the men by his contagious spirit, and in the cooperation of artillery, with the infantry, he might have rewarded Stuart on the spot by promoting him to the now vacant command of Jackson's corps. Yule, who did succeed Jackson, was always loved and admired, but he was not always equal to his opportunities, as we shall see at Gettysburg. Stuart's qualities were just what were needed, for he was young, he was not maimed, and he had boldness, persistence, and magnetism in very high degree. Lee once said that he would have won Gettysburg, had he had Jackson with him. Who so worthy to succeed Jackson as the man who had successfully replaced him on his last and greatest field? Confederate casualties Federal casualties 1 Between January and April, 1863, Jackson had his chief engineer, Major Hotchkiss, prepare a remarkable map of the country from Winchester to the Susquehanna, compiled from county maps of M.D., V. and Pa. It was on a large scale and noted farmhouses, with names of occupants. It was used by Lee on the Gettysburg campaign, and has been reproduced on smaller scale in the OR Atlas, plate CXVI. 
one hooker's men carried eight days' rations. Three days' full rations, cooked, were in the haversacks, five days' bread and groceries in the knapsacks, and five days' beef on the hoof. The total weight carried by each man, including sixty rounds of ammunition, was forty-five pounds. But few wagons were brought across the Rappahannock. Most of the reserve ammunition was carried by pack mules, coupled in pairs and driven in trains. One Jackson's celebrated march around Pope had also been discovered by the enemy as soon as it was begun, but had also been misunderstood, doubtless for a similar reason. No one could conceive that Lee would deliberately plan so unwise a move as this was conceived to be. Dividing his army under the enemy's nose. One two small collisions had occurred just before the close of the fighting between some of these troops and small bodies of Jackson's men still making their way forward. The 8th Pa. Caff. had been ordered to Howard, and at the plank road it suddenly met a column of infantry in pursuit of Howard's fugitives. The cavalry received a volley emptying about thirty saddles and turning the regiment back. Meanwhile, about two hundred of Dole's brigade, under Col. Win of the 4th Georgia, had stampeded the trains at Hazel Grove, and had been heavily cannonaded by the Federal batteries. They had, however, found shelter and suffered no loss. The affairs were insignificant, and are only referred to here because absurd exaggerations of Pleasanton's Federal reports have been accepted by many reputable authors. A Federal writer, Col. A. C. Hamelin, historian of the 11th Corps, has published the fullest and most accurate account yet produced of the history of that evening, including the wounding of Stonewall Jackson, from either Confederate or Federal sources. He made many visits to the field in company with the most prominent living actors, and has carefully compared the official report, both of Federal and Confederate officers. No future student of this battle can afford to be ignorant of his story. The Battle of Chancellorsville. By A. C. Hamelin, Historian, 11th Army Corps. Bangor, Me. Published by the author, 1896.1. Most accounts have stated that this ride was along the plank road, but careful investigation by Col. Hamelin, and the testimony of the most competent living witnesses make it clear that this ride, and the shooting of Jackson, both took place in the mountain road, which is now almost obliterated by the forest. One a reminiscence of that night is the finding of our camp in the heaviest of the rain and blackest of the darkness by a lost ambulance carrying a Virginian colonel, whose leg had been amputated on the field. He was taken out and fed, slept on the crowded floor of our tent, and next morning was started for a hospital in fine spirits in spite of his maimed condition. Chaptix via Jettisburg, the first day high tide. Opportunity open. Suggestion made. Invasion. Special feature. Feature impossible. Reorganization. Armament. Lee moves. Brandy station. Yulin Valley. Captured property. Puka moves. Lincoln suggests. Lee in Valley. Stuart proposes raid. Conditional consent. Stuart's raid. Carlisle. Results of raid. Across the Potomac. Puka relieved. Chambersburg. Return of Scout. Orders. Chance encounter. Hill to Gettysburg. Meade's movement. Reynolds to Gettysburg. Battle opens. Archer captured. Rhodes arrives. Early arrives. Lee orders pursuit. Yule stops pursuit. Lee confers. The enemy's line. Best point of attack. Longstreet's arrival. Federal arrivals. A pause of four weeks after the Battle of Chancellorsville to prepare for an aggressive counterstroke was, perhaps, the period of highest tide in Confederate hopes among all the vicissitudes of the war. The campaign which ensued, culminating at Gettysburg, is generally accepted as the turning point of Confederate fortunes. I think it may be held that each summer campaign in Va marked a Confederate crisis. That is to say, that defeat in any one of them would have been followed by the collapse of its government, within less than another twelve months, while a victory would assure it only of that much of life. More than that was impossible as long as the war spirit ruled the North, 
and this was certainly the case in 1863. A year later, however, there did come a period of very great federal discouragement, due to a succession of severe losses. At the same time, there occurred a crisis in the military situation, which threatened an ignominious termination to Grant's campaign, the greatest campaign of the war. This was saved by a brilliant piece of federal strategy, which is to be told of in due course. In it will be found the real crisis, the story of the passing of the last hope of Confederate success. It was not lost upon any field of battle, either of offense or of defense. It was a victory of strategy and not one of arms. It was now for Lee to take the offensive, a role appealing strongly to his disposition. The defensive was to invite the enemy to accumulate his resources to the point at which their very weight would crush us. But, for a brief period, we enjoyed a choice of the field of action. It was a fatal mistake that in this choice we failed to utilize the single advantage in the game of war, which the Confederacy enjoyed. We occupied the interior lines, and could reinforce from one flank to the other, across our country, more quickly than the enemy could discover and follow our movements by roundabout routes. Only by such transfers of her armies could the South ever hope to face her adversaries with superior, or even with equal, numbers by demanding double duty of her regiments, fighting battles with them alternately in the east and in the west. In Lee we had a leader of phenomenal ability, could this policy have been once adopted under his direction? Here in May, 1863, was presented a rare opportunity to inaugurate what might be called an army on wheels within the Confederate lines, as distinguished from an army of invasion beyond them. The situation was this. Grant was investing Vicksburg with 60,000 men, and we were threatened with the loss of the Mississippi River, and of 30,000 men at Vicksburg under Pemberton. At Jackson, Miss, Johnston, with scarcely 24,000 men, was looking on and begging vainly for reinforcements. At Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Bragg, with about 45,000 Confederates, confronted Rosecrans with about 84,000. Neither felt strong enough for the aggressive, and the whole spring and summer passed idly. At Knoxville were about 5,000 Confederates under Buckner, and there were also scattered brigades in southwest Va and eastern NC, from which reinforcements might be drawn. In this state of affairs, Longstreet, with Hood's and Pickett's divisions, arrived in Petersburg, under orders to rejoin Lee at Fredericksburg. Hooker had just been driven across the Rappahannock, and his army was soon to lose largely from the expiration of terms of service of many regiments. Nothing aggressive was probable from him for many weeks. Longstreet's veteran divisions, about 13,000 strong, could have been placed on the cars at Petersburg and hurried out to Bragg, via Lynchburg and Knoxville. Johnston's 25,000 from Jackson and Buckner's 5,000 from Knoxville, could have met them. With these accessions, and with Lee in command, Rosecrans might have been defeated, and an advance made into Key, threatening Louisville and Cincinnati. If anything could have caused Grant's recall from Vicksburg, it would have been this. Surely the chances of success were greater, and of disaster less, than those involved in our crossing the bridgeless Potomac into the heart of the enemy's country, where ammunition and supplies must come by wagons from Staunton, nearly 200 miles, over roads exposed to raids of the enemy from either the east or the west. In this position, a drawn battle, or even a victory, would still leave us compelled soon to find our way back across the Potomac. Long Street one tells of his having suggested to Secretary Seddon such a campaign against Rosecrans, and he also suggested it to Lee on his arrival at Fredericksburg. Mr. Seddon thought Grant could not be drawn from Vicksburg even by a Confederate advance upon the Ohio River. To this Long Street answered that Grant was a soldier and must obey orders if popular alarm forced the government to recall him. At that time Davis was sanguine of foreign intervention, and the Emperor Napoleon was permitting a French firm to build some formidable ironclads for the Confederate Navy. These might have accomplished some results, 
had not the issue of the Gettysburg campaign induced the Emperor to withdraw his consent to their delivery. Lee recognized the strong features of the proposed strategy, and took a day or two to consider it. But he finally decided upon an invasion of Pa. He was averse to leaving the himself, and also to any division of his army. Both he and Jackson, ever since the failure of the MD campaign, had longed to try it once more, and Jackson had had prepared during the winter and spring the remarkable map, already mentioned, p. 322, covering the whole scene of the coming campaign. In the discussion with Longstreet, it was assumed that the strategy of the campaign should be such as would force the enemy to attack our army in position. Jackson had once said, and it was ever afterward an article of our steadfast faith and confidence, we sometimes fail to drive the enemy from position, but they always failed to drive us. Lee fully appreciated the over-anxiety of the enemy for the safety of Washington, and proposed, for this occasion, a special feature, which he hoped would play upon and exaggerate these fears. Two of Pickett's five brigades had been temporarily left, Jenkins is at Petersburg, and courses at Hanover Junction. Lee proposed that when his column of invasion crossed the Potomac, these two brigades, reinforced by whatever could be drawn from Lower Virginia and the Carolinas, should form a column commanded by Brigard, who should come from Charleston for the purpose. This column, with some parade of its intention, should advance from Culpeper and threaten Washington. Hooker's army would have been drawn by Lee north of the Potomac. The prestige of Brigard's name would doubtless exaggerate the numbers in his command, and Lee hoped that the sudden danger might lead the enemy to call troops from the west, particularly if his army could win a battle north of the Potomac. The weak feature was that Lee did not have under his own control the troops which he desired to move. Davis had, indeed, proposed to him to control all troops on the Atlantic slope, but Lee insisted even on being relieved of the department south of the James, under D. H. Hill. He did not take the War Department into his confidence at first, hoping to accomplish his purpose by gradual suggestion and request. The process was too slow, and the result was unfortunate. Only on June 23 from Berryville, Va, did he fully explain to the President his wishes. On the 25th, from Williamsport, he followed the matter up with two letters, urging the organization of an army, even in effigy, under Brigade, at Culpeper C. H. Meanwhile, some demonstrations by the enemy from the York River had excited apprehensions at Richmond, and neither Courses or Jenkins's brigades were sent forward as had been planned. A reply was dispatched on June 29, saying, This is the first intimation the President has had that such a plan was ever in contemplation, and, taking all things into consideration, he cannot see how it can by any possibility be carried into effect. Explaining the difficulty of protecting the railroads near Richmond, the letter even suggested that Lee spare some of his own force to better protect his own communications. This caution was not excessive. The messenger carrying this letter to Lee was captured on July 2, by a raid upon our ear, and, its importance being recognized, it was hurried to Meade and delivered to him on the field of Gettysburg at 4.10 a.m. on July 4. At that hour there was some uncertainty in the Union councils as to their best policy. The facts given in the captured letter of the difficulties of the Confederates and the impossibility of Lee's receiving any reinforcements, doubtless increased Meade's confidence in all his later movements. The letter was considered of such importance that the officer who brought it, Captain Ulrich Dahlgren, was complimented and promoted. In May our army was reorganized into three corps, each comprising three divisions of infantry, generally of four brigades each, and five battalions of artillery averaging 16 guns each. Ewell succeeded Jackson in command of the 2D Corps, and A.P. Hill took command of the new 3D Corps. He had been an excellent division commander, and done conspicuous fighting and marching in the previous campaigns. One, It has already been said that Stuart would have made a more active and efficient corps commander than Ewell. Reorganized, 
the army stood as follows colon the figures given are the returns of the officers and men present for duty on May 31st. No later return was made before the battle. Similarly, for the Federal Army, the table below gives the officers and men present for duty on June 30th, the last return before the battle. To arrive at the forces actually engaged, deductions must be made from these figures in both armies for sick, guards, and details. This deduction live more averages at 7% for infantry and artillery and 15% for cavalry. Army of the Potomac. Present for duty, June 30th, 63. The Confederate infantry by this time were about 9 tenths armed with the rifled musket, muzzle loading, mostly of caliber .58, but some of caliber .54. Their artillery was now, also, all organized into battalions usually of four gun batteries each. Each corps had five of these battalions. One of these served with each of the three divisions, and the remaining two constituted a corps reserve, under command of the senior artillery officer, who began to be called, and to act, as chief of artillery of the corps. The general artillery reserve, which had been commanded by Pendleton, was broken up, on the organization of the 3D corps, and it was never re-established. Pendleton, however, was retained as chief of artillery. It is worthy of note that this artillery organization of a few batteries with each division, and a reserve with each corps, but with no general reserve for the army, was the first of the kind ever adopted by any foreign army, and that it was subsequently copied by Prussia and Austria after 1866, and by France after 1870, and later by England. But, Although our reserve under Pendleton had never found the opportunity to render much service, its being discontinued was due to our poverty of guns, not to dissatisfaction with the system. And the fine service at Gettysburg by the Federal Reserve of 110 guns, under Hunt, would seem to demonstrate the advantage of such an organization in every large army. On Wednesday, June 3rd, Lee began the delicate operation of maneuvering Hooker out of his position behind the Rappahannock by a movement of the 1st and 2d corps toward Culpeper. Hood and McClers marched on the 3d, Rhodes on the 4th, and Early and Johnson on the 5th. Longstreet's reserve, the Washington artillery with 8 guns, and my own with 26, marched on the 3d. On the 5th, the enemy, having discovered that something was on foot, crossed a small force over the Rappahannock, at the old position near the mouth of Deep Run. On this, Lee ordered Ewell's corps to halt and await developments. But on the 6th he became satisfied that nothing serious was intended, and Ewell was ordered to proceed. In the afternoon, Lee himself left Fredericksburg for Culpeper. Hill's corps now stood alone in front of Hooker's entire army. Meanwhile, Hooker had sent Ford's and Gregg's divisions of cavalry, supported by Russell's and Ames's brigades of infantry, to attack Stuart's camps near the Rappahannock. A severe cavalry battle resulted on the 9th, near Brandy Station. The enemy's attack was a surprise, and the isolated Confederate brigades, first encountered, were so roughly handled that help was called for from the infantry and artillery. My own battalion and an infantry force were sent to the field, but reached it too late. The enemy, having obtained the information which was the object of his expedition, withdrew across the Rappahannock under cover of his infantry brigades, with loss of three guns and 907 men. Stuart's loss was 485. On June 10, Ewell's corps left Culpeper for the valley. Rhodes moved to Berryville while Early and Johnson advanced upon Winchester, and, on the 13th and 14th, drove Milroy's forces into the city. Preparations were made to storm the fortified line at dawn on the 15th, an enterprise which might easily have been disastrous, had they been well defended. But Milroy saw his communications threatened, and did not wait for the attack. About dawn. His retreating forces were struck in the flank near Stevenson's depot by Stuart's and the Stonewall Brigade, and were routed with the loss of about 2,400 men and 23 guns. Rhodes's division, going by Berryville, had driven the enemy from that point on the 13th, 
and on the 14th had captured Martinsburg late in the afternoon, taking five guns and many stores. Most of the enemy escaped under cover of darkness, though the pursuit was pushed until late at night. On the 15th, starting at 10 a.m., Rhodes reached Williamsport at dark and at once crossed three brigades and three batteries over the Potomac. The marches made by Ewell's whole corps in this swoop upon Milroy, and the fruits of victory secured, compare well with the work of the same corps under Jackson thirteen months before. Early and Johnson, advancing upon Winchester, made seventy miles in three days. Rhodes speaks of his march to Williamsport as, the most trying march we had yet had, most trying because of the intense heat, the character of the road, stony and dusty, and the increased number of barefooted men in the command. He goes on to say, it was not until this day that the troops began to exhibit unmistakable signs of exhaustion, and that stragglers could be found in the line of march, and even then none but absolutely worn out men fell out of the line. The whole march from Culpeper to Williamsport, which was an extremely rapid one, was executed in a manner highly creditable to the officers and men of the division. A halt at Williamsport was absolutely necessary from the condition of the feet of the unshod men. Very many of these gallant fellows were still marching in ranks with feet bruised, bleeding, and swollen. Of the fruits gathered by the victory, Lee reports, more than 4,000 prisoners, about 30 pieces of artillery, 250 wagons, 400 horses, 20 ambulances, and a lot of ammunition etc. Besides, these captures of military material, large quantities of cattle, provisions, and supplies of all kinds useful to the army were now to be collected in the fertile farming country, into which the army had penetrated. Stringent orders were issued, forbidding the taking of private property except by duly authorized officers, giving formal receipts in all cases, that the owners might have no difficulty in establishing claims and receiving payment at fair prices. On June 13, as Ewell's corps approached Winchester, Longstreet being at Culpeper, and Hill still opposite Fredericksburg, Hooker put his army in motion from Falmouth for Manassas. Before Lee began his movement, Hooker had anticipated it, and had proposed in that event to cross the Rappahannock and interpose between Lee's flanks. It was, doubtless, his proper move, and would have forced Lee to recall Longstreet and Ewell and have broken up his campaign. But it had been decided, soon after the Battle of Chancellorsville, in a council between Mr. Lincoln, Halleck, and Stanton, that Hooker should never again be entrusted with the conduct of a battle. He could not be at once removed on account of the support of politicians who desired to have Secretary Chase succeed Mr. Lincoln as president. This party, with the active aid of Chase, had placed Hooker in his position by turning the scale in his favor, when the choice was between Hooker and Meade, as successor to Burnside. They still supported Hooker strongly, and a deadlock was only averted by Chase's friends consenting to a change of the commander in case Hooker should voluntarily resign. The secret of Chase's interest lay in the fact that Hooker had pledged himself not to become a candidate for the presidency should he win a great victory. Meanwhile, as he was not to be allowed to fight, both Halleck and Lincoln refused his sensible proposition to cross the Rappahannock, and Lincoln wrote him the oft-quoted advice, not to be entangled on the river, like an ox jumped half over a fence, and liable to be torn by dogs, front and rear, without a fair chance to go one way or kick another. Now that Lee's army was stretched out over a line more than 100 miles long, even Lincoln saw that a wonderful opportunity was flaunted in the face of the Federals. He now wrote to Hooker in quite a different spirit, if the head of Lee's army is at Martinsburg, and the tail of it on the plank road between Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, the animal must be very slim somewhere. Could you not break him? Hooker would have only been too glad to try, but Stanton and Halleck were on guard over him and practically the army of the Potomac was bound hand and foot, and Lee was free to work his own will, unmolested, until Hooker should be forced to tender his resignation. Hooker's movement toward Manassas was at once followed by Hill's marching for Culpeper on the 14th, and, on the 15th, Longstreet marched from Culpeper to take position east of the Blue Ridge, 
while Hill passed in his rear and crossed the mountains to Winchester via Front Royal. When Hill was safely in the valley, Longstreet also entered through Ashby's and Snicker's gaps, and about the 20th the two corps were united. The cavalry had acted as a screen in front of Longstreet during this advance, and, in this duty, had severe encounters with the enemy at Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville, losing in them over 500 and killed, wounded, and missing. About June 22, as Hill and Longstreet drew near the Potomac, ready to cross, Stuart made to Lee a very unwise proposition, which Lee more unwisely entertained. It was destined to have an unfortunate influence on the campaign. Stuart thus refers to the matter in his official report. I submitted to the commanding general the plan of leaving a brigade also in my present front, passing through Hopal or some other gap in the Bull Run Mountains, attain the enemy's rear, passing between his main body and Washington, and cross into M.D., joining our army north of the Potomac. The commanding general wrote authorizing this move, if I thought it practicable, and also what instructions should be given the two brigades left in front of the enemy. He also notified me that one column would move via Gettysburg, and the other via Carlisle, toward the Susquehanna, and directed me, after crossing, to proceed with all dispatch to join the right, early, of the army in par. In view of the issues at stake, and of the fact that already he had been deprived of two promised brigades, courses and Jenkinses, it was unwise even to contemplate sending three brigades of cavalry upon such distant service. When one compares the small beneficial results of raids, even when successful, with the risks here involved, it is hard to understand how Lee could have given his consent. Hooker's Chancellorsville campaign had been lost by the absence of his cavalry, and Lee's Gettysburg campaign was similarly compromised. Lee, however, acquiesced, only attaching the condition that Longstreet could spare the cavalry from his front, and approved the adventure. Longstreet, thus suddenly called on to decide the question, seems not to have appreciated its importance, for he decided it on the imaginary ground that the passage of the Potomac by our rear would, in a measure, disclose our plans. Accordingly, about midnight of June 24, Stuart, with Hampton's, W. H. F. Lee's, and Fitz Lee's brigades, six guns and some ambulances, marched from Salem, for the Potomac River. Making a circuit by Brentsville, Wolf Run Shoals, Fairfax C. H., and Drainsville, he crossed the Potomac at Rose's Ford at midnight of the 27th. About 80 miles by the route travelled. The ford was barely passable. The water came on the saddles of the horses and entirely submerged the artillery carriages. These were emptied and the ammunition carried across by hand. Here the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal was cut. Next morning at Rockville, a train of wagons eight miles long was captured, and 400 prisoners were taken and paroled. In saving a large number of wagons, instead of burning them, and in delaying twelve hours to parole his prisoners, Instead of bringing along the officers and letting the men go, Stuart committed fatal blunders. The federal authorities refused to recognize the paroles, though they were given at the earnest solicitation of the captured officers, and all the paroled were at once returned to duty. The delay caused to subsequent marches by the long wagon train, and the embarrassment of protecting it, was responsible for the loss of time which made, on the whole, a sad failure of the expedition. On the 29th, the Baltimore and Ohio RR was crossed and torn up at Hood's Mills. At Westminster about 5 p.m., a squadron of Federal cavalry was routed, and the head of the column bivouacked that night midway between Westminster and Littletown. Had it here followed the direct road, via Littletown to Gettysburg, only about 16 miles away. It could have occupied Gettysburg before 11 a.m. on the 30th, where it would have found itself in good position in front of Lee's army, then concentrating at Cash Town. It might, however, have had a severe fight with Pford's two brigades of cavalry, which arrived in the afternoon, just in time to anticipate Pettigrew's brigade of Heth's division, 
which had been directed to visit Gettysburg in quest of shoes. This incident will be referred to again. It is mentioned here only to show how near Stuart's expedition came to a happy issue on June 30th. Had it done so, Lee's army would have occupied some strong position between Cash Town and Gettysburg, and the onus of attack would have been upon the Federals, as had been the plan of the campaign. But his orders led Stuart toward the Susquehanna, so he proceeded north to Hanover, which was reached at 10 a.m. on the 30th. Here he had a sharp skirmish with Kilpatrick's cavalry. Hampered by his 125 captured wagons, he turned squarely to the right, and, making a detour by Jefferson, he reached Dover on the morning of July 1st, crossing during the night the road on which Early's division had marched on the 30th from York to Heidelisburg. Here he learned that Early had gone toward Shippensburg. Stuart was practically lost, and had to guess in which direction he should go to find Lee's army. Lee was now beginning the Battle of Gettysburg, 25 miles off to the southwest. Stuart's report says, after as little rest as was compatible with the exhausted condition of the command, I pushed on for Carlisle, 25 miles to the northwest, where I hoped to find a portion of our army. He arrived before Carlisle in the afternoon. His rations were now entirely exhausted. He desired to levy a contribution, but learned that a considerable force of militia was ambushed in the town, with a view to entrap him on his entrance. He invested the town, threw in some shells, and burned the United States cavalry barracks. The whereabouts of our army, he says, was still a mystery, but during the night I received a dispatch from Lee that the army was at Gettysburg, about thirty miles south, and had been engaged this day. The investment was abandoned, and the column headed for Gettysburg, where it arrived that afternoon just in time to thwart a movement of the enemy's cavalry upon our rear. The expedition had occupied eight days, and had traversed in that time about 250 miles. Meanwhile, Lee had been exceedingly impatient. When Stuart, at last, reported in person, late in the afternoon of the 2d, although Lee said only, well, General, you are here at last, his manner implied rebuke, and it was so understood by Stuart. He, however, is scarcely to be blamed for suggesting the raid. Had he wasted no time paroling prisoners and saving wagons? His raid might have been successful, as raids go, for his whole casualties were but 89 killed, wounded, and missing. But the venture was a strategic mistake, for it resulted in the battles being one of chance collision with the Confederates taking the offensive, whereas the plan of the campaign had been to fight a defensive battle. Hill crossed the Potomac at Shepherdstown on June 23rd, and Longstreet began crossing at Williamsport on the 24th. Hooker was not far behind, for he crossed at Edwards Ferry on the 25th and 26th, and moved to the vicinity of Frederick. Here he threatened Lee's rear through the South Mountain Passes, if he moved north, and, at the same time, covered Washington. Hooker had, meanwhile, been placed in command of the troops at Washington, some 26,000 men, and at Harper's Ferry, where there were about 11,000. It was a wise order, but under the policy of not allowing Hooker to fight, it was but a sham, as he soon discovered. He attempted to draw 15,000 men from the Washington lines, as his whole army was now in front of the city but Halleck refused to allow it. He then proposed to throw a strong force across the mountains upon Lee's rear, and, for this purpose, he ordered the 11,000 under French at Harper's Ferry to unite with the 12th Corps, which was to lead the movement. Again Halleck interposed. He refused the troops on the absurd ground that Maryland Heights have always been regarded as an important point to be held by us and much labor and expense has been incurred in fortifying them. Hooker appealed in vain to Stanton and Lincoln, pointing out the folly of holding so large a force idle. Then Hooker realized that he had lost the support of the government, and tendered his resignation June 27. It was just what Stanton and Halleck had been seeking, and was no sooner received than accepted, and prompt measures adopted to relieve him lest the armies should come into collision with Hooker still in command. Meade succeeded Hooker. He was an excellent fighter, 
but too lacking in audacity for a good commanding general. He was also of cross and quarrelsome disposition, and unpopular with his leading officers. Duplicate orders, relieving Hooker and installing Meade, were sent that afternoon by Hardy, Stanton's chief of staff. He delivered the order to Meade about midnight, while Hooker was still in ignorance how his proffered resignation was being received. Meade protested, and begged to be excused in favor of Reynolds, who was the favorite of the army. But he was compelled to accompany Hardy on a ride to Hooker's quarters, some miles away, to deliver the order superseding him. Hooker had hoped for a different outcome. He acquiesced gracefully, but the scene was a painful one. Meanwhile, Lee, with Longstreet and Hill, had reached Chambersburg and bivouacked in its neighborhood from June 27 to the 29th. The Federal Army had now been across the Potomac for three days, but Lee was not yet informed, and he now became anxious to hear from his cavalry. An additional large brigade coming from W. Va, under Imboden, should have joined him here, but it had not yet arrived. It had been delayed in its approach by destroying the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal about Hancock. A very essential part, also, of Stuart's proposed program had not been carried out. This was that two of his five brigades should cross into MD. With Lee and continue on his right flank, to screen it and observe the enemy. Longstreet had specially directed Stuart to let Hampton's brigade be one of these, with Hampton in command of both. This was not convenient, and Stuart had left Robertson's and Jones's brigades, with Robertson in command. Also, he had failed to make Robertson understand what was expected of him. The result was that Robertson and his two brigades remained in Va. Until brought over by Lee's order on July 2. One to gain information, Stuart had designed to have two efficient scouts operating within the enemy's line, but accident had prevented in both cases. Mosby, one of them, had failed to reach Stuart, at his crossing of the Potomac, owing to an enforced change of Stuart's line of march. Stringfellow, the other, had been captured. Lee, therefore, on June 28, still believed that Hooker's army had not yet crossed the Potomac, and, to hurry Hooker up, he issued orders for an advance. The next day, of all his forces upon Harrisburg. But there was still one scout, Harrison, within the Federal lines. Longstreet had dispatched him from Culpeper, three weeks before, to go into Washington and remain until he had important information to communicate. With good judgment and good fortune he appeared about midnight on the 28th, with the news that Hooker had crossed the Potomac, and had been superseded by Meade. He was also able to give the approximate locations of five of Meade's seven corps three being near Frederick and two near the base of South Mountain. This news caused an immediate change in Lee's plans. He was specially anxious to hold Meade east of the Blue Ridge, and not have him come into the valley behind us, the movement which Hook had brought on his own resignation by seeking to make. To forestall this, Lee's plan had long been formed to concentrate his own army somewhere between Cash Town and Gettysburg, in a strong position where it would threaten at once Washington, Baltimore, and Philadelphia. The enemy, he hoped, would then be forced to attack him. His report states that, the march toward Gettysburg was conducted more slowly than it would have been had the movements of the Federal Army been known. Accordingly, on the 29th, orders were sent, countermanding those of the day before and directing movements which would concentrate the three corps at Cash Town, eight miles west of Gettysburg. There was no urgency about the orders, which indicates that Lee had not yet selected any particular site for his coming battle. Meade, however, very soon after taking command on the 28th, had selected a position, Pars Ridge, behind Pipe Creek, on the divide between the waters of the Potomac and Chesapeake Bay. Here he, too, hoped to fight on the defensive. It would have been safe play, but not so brilliant as what Hooker had proposed, or as what Lee himself had used with Pope in August, 1862. On June 29, Hill moved Heth's division from Fayetteville to Cashtown, about 10 miles. Heth heard that shoes could be purchased in Gettysburg, 
and, with Hill's permission, authorized Pettigrew's brigade to go the next day and get them. On the 30th, Pender's division followed Heth's from Fayetteville to Cashtown, and was followed by Longstreet with Hood and McClure's from Chambersburg as far as Greenwood, about 11 miles. Here they bivouacked about 2 p.m. Lee accompanied this march, and also bivouacked at Greenwood. Pickett's division was left at Chambersburg to guard the rear until Imboden's cavalry should arrive, and Law's brigade was detached from Hood's division and sent to New Guilford C. H., a few miles south of Fayetteville, until Robertson's cavalry should relieve it. On the 30th, Ewell's corps, having received the orders from Lee, also marched toward Cashtown, the place of rendezvous. Meanwhile, Pettigrew, on approaching Gettysburg, found Ford's cavalry just occupying it, upon which he withdrew about five miles and bivouacked. Previously, everything had moved favorably for the Confederates' strategy. Now, Stuart was still unheard from, Robertson and Imboden were still behind, and four brigades of infantry were detained waiting for them. Lee knew approximately the enemy's position, however, and his own three corps were converging by easy marches upon Cash Town, near which village he proposed to select his ground and await an attack. Meade's army was equally near Pipe Creek, where he hoped to be able to play the same game. But a chance collision suddenly precipitated a battle, unforeseen and undesired by either party. Hill's report describes how it began. On arriving at Cash Town, Heth, who had sent forward Pettigrew's brigade to Gettysburg, reported that Pettigrew had encountered the enemy at Gettysburg, principally cavalry, but in what force he could not determine. A courier was then dispatched with this information for the general commanding, and with orders to start Anderson early. Also to Ewell informing him, and that I intended to advance the next morning, and discover what was in my front. Battlefield of Gettysburg This Hill's movement to Gettysburg was made of his own motion, and with knowledge that he would find the enemy's cavalry in possession. Ewell was informed of it. Lee's orders were to avoid bringing on an action. Like Stuart's raid, Hill's venture is another illustration of an important event allowed to happen without supervision. Lee's first intimation of danger of collision was his hearing Hill's guns at Gettysburg. He was much disturbed by it, not wishing to fight without the presence of his cavalry to gather fruit in case of victory. On July 1st, of his nine divisions, Pickett's was in bivouac at Chambersburg. The other eight, except Law's brigade, were all in motion toward Gettysburg, Ewell having at an early hour ordered Rhodes and Early to diverge to that point from the roads they were pursuing toward Cash Town. Unfortunately, six of the divisions, and the trains and the reserve artillery of all three corps, were concentrated upon the turnpike from Fayetteville to Gettysburg. Anderson's division, followed by the three D corps trains, had started soon after daylight from Fayetteville. Here they had halted, but Lee, passing, had ordered them on to Gettysburg, following Heth and Pender, who had marched from Cash Town at 5 a.m and become engaged at Gettysburg about ten dot soon after Anderson had passed Greenwood, Hood and McClure's were starting to follow, when they encountered Johnson's division of the 2D Corps cutting in from the left, with the trains and reserve artillery of that corps. Lee, who was riding with Longstreet at the head of his infantry, directed that he should halt until these had all passed. This column occupied about 14 miles of road and it delayed Longstreet's infantry until 4 p.m. in the morning, Longstreet's orders had been only to go as far as Cash Town, but later orders were sent for all troops to come to Gettysburg. It was now the fourth day since Meade had relieved Hooker. Harper's Ferry had been evacuated. Of its 11,000 troops, 7,000 under French were brought to Frederick, and 4,000 escorted to Washington the artillery and stores of the post. Meade knew that Ewell's corps was between York and Carlisle, and, on the 29th, put his whole army in motion in that direction, encamping that night on a line extending from Emmitsburg to Westminster. On the 30th, his advanced corps moved forward within a few miles of Gettysburg on his left, to Little Town in the centre and toward Manchester on his right. He now found that Lee was withdrawing and concentrating near Cash Town. 
he wrongly ascribed this to his own advance from Frederick, and published orders on the 30th, saying, the general believes he has relieved Harrisburg and Philadelphia, and now desires to look to his own army, and assume position for offensive or defensive, as occasion requires, or rest to the troops. It is not his desire to wear the troops out by excessive fatigue and marches, and thus unfit them for the work they will be called upon to perform. In fact, Lee did not know that Meade had moved at all, and his own movement eastward was really inspired by apprehension for his own communications, aroused by Hooker's action before he had been superseded. Although Meade had selected his proposed line of battle behind Pipe Creek, and now announced his intention to rest his troops, he still, on the first, ordered a further advance of each of his seven corps, as follows, the fifth corps was ordered to Hanover, the sixth corps to Manchester, the twelfth corps to two Davins, the three D corps to Emmitsburg, and the first and eleventh corps to Gettysburg. These advances were not intended to bring on a battle, but to cover the position selected, allowing space in front to delay the enemy's approach and give time for preparation. The instructions to Reynolds, who was in command on the left, were not to bring on a general engagement. But, though both Meade and Lee had cautioned their lieutenants to this effect, it was precipitated by Hill's initiative and Reynolds's willing concurrence. In the first collision of the day, Reynolds's leading division, by good handling, got decidedly the best of the affair, giving the Federals quite a taste of victory. Lee had been very uneasy as the roar of the distant battle increased, but when, later, the arrival of Ewell had turned the scale, and he, reaching the field, saw the Federals routed and prisoners taken by the thousand, it became simply impossible for him to hold back his hand. And not only impossible, but then unwise, for a great opportunity was undoubtedly before him. He ordered it seized if possible and for the rest of the afternoon rested in the belief that efforts were being made, being misled by Ewell's not informing him that the pursuit had been abandoned before his orders to push it were given. The course of the battle had been as follows, about 10 a.m. The advance of Heth's division became engaged with Pford's cavalry, between one and two miles in front of Gettysburg. Pford, with his horse artillery, sought to detain the enemy until Reynolds's corps, seven brigades, which he knew was approaching, could come to his assistance. By eleven o'clock, however, he was forced to withdraw to the left, where he took position, and during the rest of the day protected the left flank of the Federals. As Bford withdrew, Wadsworth's two brigades became engaged with Davis and Archer. Davis, on the left, overlapped Cutler on the Federal right and, of course, soon drove back his right wing along with Hall's battery all of which were withdrawn without severe loss. But, on the Confederate right, Archer's brigade was overlapped by Meredith's, which struck it on the flank and captured Archer and several hundred prisoners. This blow to Archer relieved Cutler's brigade, which, changing front to its left, was able to cut off and capture two regiments of Davis's brigade which had advanced in pursuit of Cutler's right and taken position in the cut of an unfinished railroad north of the Chambersburg Pike. Almost at the moment of his victory, however, Reynolds was killed. He was an excellent soldier and was well known to have been the choice of the army to replace Hooker. Meanwhile, Cutler was now reinforced by Rowley's division of the same corps, which extended its line farther to the right. Robinson's division also approached and was held in reserve nearby. Later, as the engagement grew more severe, it was also put into the battle. Meanwhile, Hill had formed Pender's division in line of battle in rear of Heth, but it was held in reserve for some time, as Heth about noon received a reinforcement by the arrival of Rhodes's division, on his left flank, coming in from Middletown. About the same time, also, the head of the 11th Corps, under Howard, arrived at Gettysburg, and Howard succeeded Reynolds in command of the field. He halted Steinway's division, two brigades, on Cemetery Hill, as a reserve, and advanced Schkertz and Barlow to the front. With these he formed line to cover the approaches from the north as far east as Rock Creek. This disposition was bad. The force was small for so long a line, and its right flank was in the air near the Heidelersburg Road, 
by which Early was now drawing near Dot for a while, however, the Federal forces were superior in numbers at the actual points of contact, where only Rhodes's and Heth's divisions were yet engaged. And, whether from discipline or from the inspiration of home, the fighting done by the Federal brigades was of the best type. At this period some Confederate brigades were seriously crippled. Heth's division, which had already suffered severely in Archer's and Davis's brigades, now lost heavily in Pettigrew's by a musketry combat at very close quarters. It won the affair, but the brigade was scarcely a half brigade for the rest of the battle. Iverson's brigade was exposed to a severe flank fire and lost three regiments. In his report, Iverson says, When I saw a white handkerchief raised, and my line of battle still lying down in position, I characterized the surrender as disgraceful. But when I found afterward that five hundred of my men were left lying dead and wounded on a line as straight as a dress parade, I exonerated the survivors and claim for the brigade that they nobly fought and died without a man running to the rear. It is needless to detail the fighting when Early's division advanced upon the right of the Eleventh Corps, and when Pender reinforced Heth against the First Corps. The enemy was forced back and an advance of the Confederate line swept forward into the city. About 5,000 prisoners were captured, and fugitives could be seen in disorganized masses passing over the hills in the rear. It was now about 3.0 apostrophe clock. One sunset was about 7.30, twilight was long, and the moon was full. There was daylight enough, and force enough at hand, to follow the pursuit and at least to carry Cemetery Hill from which one of the two reserve brigades, Costas, had been withdrawn. Soon after two o'clock, Lee had arrived on Seminary Ridge, and seen the defeat of the enemy and their retreat over Cemetery Hill. His first impulse was to have the pursuit pushed and he sent his adjutant Col. W. H. Taylor, to instruct Ewell accordingly. Unfortunately, he took no steps to see that the order was obeyed. Taylor gives the following account. Gen. Lee witnessed the flight of the Federals through Gettysburg and up the hills beyond. He then directed me to go to Gen. Ewell, and to say to him that from the position which he occupied, he could see the enemy retreating over those hills without organization and in great confusion, that it was only necessary to press those people in order to secure possession of the heights, and that, if possible, he wished him to do this. In obedience to these instructions I proceeded immediately to Gen. Ewell, and delivered the order of Gen. Lee, and after receiving from him some message for the commanding general in regard to the prisoners captured, returned to the latter and reported that his order had been delivered. Gen. Ewell did not express any objection or indicate the existence of any impediment to the execution of the orders conveyed to him, but left the impression upon my mind that they would be executed. One after reading this circumstantial statement, it is hard to understand Ewell's conduct. Not only did he fail to renew the pursuit which he had previously stopped, but, by apparent acquiescence and sending messages about prisoners captured, he seems to have intentionally misled Lee into the belief that his orders were being obeyed, while the rare opportunity slipped rapidly away. There could not be a more striking illustration either of the danger of giving any important orders in any conditional form, or of failing to follow up all such orders with some supervision. When the firing gradually died out instead of being renewed, Lee took no action. Meanwhile, Johnson's division, closely followed by Anderson's, had reached the field, and was ordered by Ewell to pass the town and occupy Culp's Hill, a half mile to the east. Ewell's report says, before Johnson could get up, the enemy was reported moving to outflank our extreme left, and I could see what seemed to be his skirmishers in that direction. The skirmishers turned out to be our own men. Before this was discovered, it was sunset, and the hill about that time was occupied by Wadsworth's Federal Division. Ewell, however, was not informed of this, and was again about to dispatch Johnson on his errand when orders arrived from Lee to draw his corps to the right. He rode to see Lee and persuaded him to let the expedition be made. It was a most unfortunate decision, as will presently appear, for it fatally extended Lee's left flank. 
About midnight, Johnson's division was moved around the base of Culp's Hill and a reconnoitering party ascended, but found the enemy in possession. No one ordered the division to be carried back to the right, where it could have been of much service in subsequent operations, and where Lee had intended it to be. It was far too weak to attack the strong position of the enemy on Culp's Hill, and its communication with the rest of the army was long, roundabout, and exposed to the enemy's view. But the division was allowed to remain until the end of the battle, and, as long as it remained absent, the task before the remainder of the army was beyond its strength. During the afternoon, Longstreet had joined Lee on Seminary Ridge overlooking the town, and had noted the position being taken by the enemy. He had said to Lee, We could not call the enemy to a position better suited to our plans. We have only to file around his left and secure good ground between him and his capital. To his surprise, Lee had answered, If he is there tomorrow, I shall attack him. Longstreet replied, If he is there tomorrow, it will be because he wants you to attack him. Later in the afternoon Lee rode forward to arrange a renewal of the attack upon Cemetery Hill from the town at daylight next morning. He held a long conference with Yule, Early, and Rhodes, who urged, instead, that Longstreet should attack the enemy's left flank. No one of those present had more than a very vague idea of the character and features of the enemy's line, and it is therefore not surprising that this advice though very plausible in view of the success of former flank movements, was here the worst possible. The enemy's line, though taken hurriedly upon the natural ridges overlooking the open country, which nearly surrounded it, was unique both in character and strength. In plan it nearly resembled a fishhook, with its convexity toward us, forcing upon our line a similar shape with the concavity toward them. Their lines were the interior and shorter, being scarcely three miles in length, giving ability to reinforce at any point by short cuts across the interior area. Our exterior lines were about five miles in length, and to move from point to point required long, roundabout marches, often exposed to the enemy's view. Their force would allow 25,000 infantry and 100 guns for each mile of line. Ours would allow but 13,000 infantry and 50 guns per mile. Their flanks were at once unassailable and unturnable. Their left, which was the top of the fishhook shank, rested on big and little round top mountains, and their right, which was the point of the fishhook, was on Culp's Hill over Rock Creek. Both flanks presented precipitous and rocky fronts, screened from artillery fire by forest growth and the convexity of the line was such that the two flanks approached and each was able to reinforce the other. The shank of the fishhook ran north, nearly straight, for about two miles from Little Round Top to Cemetery Hill, where the bend began. The bend was not uniform and regular, but presented a sharp salient at the north, and on the east a deep re-enterant around which the line swept to reach Culp's Hill and pass around it nearly in an S. This salient upon Cemetery Hill offered the only hopeful point of attack upon the enemy's entire line, as will more fully appear in the accounts of the different efforts made at various places during the battle. It would be too much to say that an attack here on the morning of July 2nd would have succeeded. But it is not at all too much to say that no other attack was possible at that time which would have had near as good chance of success. Yet it was deliberately discarded, and Lee's conference closed with the understanding among all those present that Longstreet should attack in the morning upon the enemy's left. It was this which gave rise to the mistaken charges made after Lee's death that Longstreet had disobeyed orders in not attacking early on the 2D. No orders whatever were given Longstreet that night. Before sunset, he had ridden back from his interview with Lee to meet his troops, who, about 4 p.m., marched from near Greenwood with orders to come to Gettysburg, 17 miles. About midnight they bivouacked four miles from the field. Marching again at dawn on the 2D, they arrived near the field between 6 and 8 a.m. His reserve artillery, the Washington Artillery and Alexander's Battalion, which was ordered to follow the infantry from Greenwood at midnight, was much detained upon the road by passing trains, 
and did not reach the field until 9 a.m. Law's Brigade of Hood's Division, recalled from New Guildford C. H., did not rejoin its division until noon on the 2d, having marched at 3 a.m., and covered by that time about 20 miles. Pickett's division was also upon the road, having marched from Chambersburg at 2 a.m. It made 22 miles and encamped within 3 miles of Gettysburg at 4 p.m., reporting its presence to Lee. The most important occurrence of the evening had been Meade's wise decision to abandon his plan of offering battle behind Pipe Creek, and to concentrate upon the position at Gettysburg, which Hancock had recommended. He was most anxious to fight upon the defensive and he knew that Lee, having a taste of victory, was not one to recoil from further offensive efforts. So, although reports during the afternoon had been discouraging, the march of all the corps had been hastened to find the defensive battlefield, and their arrivals upon it had been about as follows. Colon Geary's division of the 12th Corps had arrived about 6 p.m. and was placed on the left of the Federal line by Hancock. Williams's division of the same corps bivouacked near Oak Creek Bridge that night. The advance of the 3D Corps came upon the field about sunset. During the night, or early in the morning, the entire corps arrived. The 2D Corps, having come from Taney Town, also reached the field soon after nightfall, and was all at hand in the morning. The 5th Corps, marching from Hanover at 7 p.m., arrived on the field, 14 miles. At 8 a.m. on the 2D. The 6th Corps, from the Union right of Manchester, arrived about 2 p.m., after a march of about 32 miles in 17 hours. At 8 a.m. of the 2D, therefore, practically the whole of both armies was upon the field except Pickett's Division and Law's Brigade of the Confederates, and the 6th Corps of the Federals. One Manassas to Upper Maddox, p. 327.1d. H. Hill also had strong claims for promotion. He had done as much hard fighting as any other general, and had also displayed great ability in holding his men to their work by supervision and example. But at this time he was not with the army, and was in command of the important department south of the James. He was a North Carolinian, and was very acceptable to the state authorities who objected if too many North Carolinians were taken to VA, leaving NC exposed to federal raids. There was an earnestness about D. H. Hill's fighting which was like Jackson's at its best. Had opportunity come to him, he must have won greater fame. His individuality may be briefly illustrated by an official endorsement placed upon the application of a soldier to be transferred from the infantry to the band. Respectfully forwarded, disapproved. Shooters are more needed than tutors. One this failure to carry out Lee's orders indicates a staff insufficient to keep him in touch with what was taking place. A notable feature of the coming battle will be found in the number of important events which seemed to happen without any control for the commander-in-chief. One the time and the condition of affairs are given in Hancock's report, as follows, at 3 p.m. I arrived at Gettysburg and assumed the command. At this time the 1st and the 11th Corps were retiring through the town, closely pursued by the enemy. The cavalry of Bford was occupying a firm position on the plain to the left of Gettysburg, covering the rear of the retreating corps. The 3D Corps had not yet arrived from Emmitsburg. Orders were at once given to establish a line of battle on Cemetery Hill with skirmishers occupying that part of the town immediately in our front. The position just on the southern edge overlooking the town and commanding the Emmitsburg and Taney Town roads and the Baltimore Turnpike, was already partially occupied on my arrival by direction of Gen. Howard. Some difficulty was experienced in forming the troops of the 11th Corps, but by vigorous efforts a sufficiently formidable line was established to deter the enemy from any serious assault on the position. It will presently appear that the enemy was not deterred by the Federal line but was halted by Yule without orders, and was deliberately kept halted even after orders to attack if possible had arrived, and remained halted all the rest of the afternoon. One four years with Lee, p. 95. Chaptix Wittisburg, second day of situation. Lee decides to attack. The attack to be on our right. Longstreet's flank march. 
Sickles is advance. Meade foresees Sickles is defeat. Progressive type of battle. Hood proposes flank movement. Formation and opening. Hood's front line. Fight on little round top. Hood's second line. McClure's badly needed. Kershaw and Sam's. Artillery fighting. Barksdale and Wofford. Anderson's division. Wilcox's brigade. Wilcox asks help. Why no help was given. Lang's brigade. Wright's brigade. Wright carries the stone wall. Wright's retreat. Reinforcements for Sickles. Ayers's division. Confederate situation. The artillery engaged. Ten more brigades in sight. Crawford's advance. Ewell's cooperation. The afternoon cannonade. Johnson's assault. Early's attack. Federal account. Rhodes's failure to advance. Rhodes's new position. Rhodes's summary. Second day. Longstreet, riding ahead of his approaching troops, met Lee upon Seminary Ridge about dawn on July 2. Daylight disclosed the enemy in his position overlooking the town, and it was apparent that he was entrenched and was offering us the privilege of taking the offensive. Lee was far from disposed to decline the offer. Col. Long, of his staff, reports that he advised Lee during the night, at present only two or three corps of the enemy are up, and it seems best to attack before they are greatly strengthened. But, as a matter of fact, 43 of the 51 Federal Brigades of Infantry were upon the ground at 8 a.m. and occupying the strong position already described. Four of Lee's 37 Infantry Brigades were absent, four more, Johnson's division, were out, of position east of Culp's Hill, and the lack of cavalry required the use of part of his remaining infantry upon each flank to protect from surprise. When, at nine o'clock, the arrival of Longstreet's reserve artillery was reported, it must be admitted that there was little to be hoped for from any immediate attack then possible. Lee, however, had decided to make one. He had said to Hood soon after the latter's arrival, The enemy is here. If we don't whip him, he will whip us. He had sent staff officers to each flank and was awaiting their reports. Longstreet's only suggestion had been a turning movement, and taking a position threatening the enemy's rear. Lee seems to have doubted that this would force the enemy to attack. He feared being maneuvered out of position, and perhaps forced back across the Potomac without any opportunity of fighting. It was a reasonable fear, now that the Federal Army had drawn near, and could much restrict his foraging for supplies. This was a risk inseparable from campaigns of invasion, and it evidently seemed a much greater one now, than when the campaign was being decided upon. Not fully appreciating the strength of the enemy's position, and misled by the hope that a large fraction of the Federal Army was out of reach, Lee had determined to strike, and only hesitated as to the best point to attack. About nine o'clock, he rode to the left and conferred again with Ewell and Early, who again discouraged attack in their own front, and urged that it be by Longstreet on the right. About ten he returned, and presently received the report from Long and Pendleton who had reconnoitred on the right dot about 11 a.m., his orders were issued. Anderson's division of Hill's corps was directed to extend Hill's line upon Seminary Ridge to the right, while Longstreet with Hood's and McClure's divisions should make a flank march to the right and pass beyond the enemy's flank, which seemed to extend along the Emmitsburg Road. Forming then at right angles to this road, the attack was to sweep down the enemy's line from their left, being taken up successively by the brigades of Anderson's division as they were reached. Ewell's corps, holding the extreme left, was to attack the enemy's right on hearing Longstreet's guns. Longstreet was directed, in his march, to avoid exposing it to the view of a federal signal station on Little Round Top Mountain. Meanwhile, on the arrival of Longstreet's reserve artillery in the vicinity of the field, I had been placed in charge of all the artillery of his corps, and directed to reconnoitre to the enemy's left and to move some of the battalions to that part of the field. This had been done by noon, when three battalions, comma my own, Cabell's and Henry's, were located in the Valley of Willoughby Run awaiting the arrival of the infantry. 
Riding back presently to learn the cause of their non-arrival, the head of the infantry column was found halted, where its road became exposed to the federal view, while messages were sent to Long Street, and the guide sought a new route. The exposed point had been easily avoided by our artillery, by turning out through a meadow, but after some delay there came orders to the infantry to countermarch and take a road via Black Horse Devon. This incident delayed the opening of the battle nearly two hours. It is notable, both as illustrating the contingencies attending movements over unfamiliar ground, and also the annoyance which may be caused an enemy by the use of balloons to overlook his territory. It hardly seems probable, however, that in this instance the delay influenced the result of the battle. The same may be said, too, of a preliminary delay in Long Streets beginning his march to the left after Lee's order at 11 a.m. Long Streets official report says, fearing that my force was too weak to venture to make an attack, I delayed until Gen. Law's brigade joined its division. The history of the battle seems to justify this delay. Longstreet calls it 30 minutes, as without Law's brigade our first attack must have been dangerously weak. Meanwhile, an important change had occurred in the enemy's position. Until noon, their main line had run nearly due south from Cemetery Hill to Little Round Top, while a strong skirmish line only was held upon the Emmitsburg Pike, for about a mile from Cemetery Hill, to a crossroad at the Poach Orchard. About noon, the movements of the Confederates toward the Federal left were noted, and Sickles, whose corps held that flank, sent forward from the Peach Orchard a small reconnoitering force. It encountered Wilcox's brigade, and was driven back with severe loss, but not before it had discovered the approach of Longstreet's column. This being reported to Sickles, he unwisely ordered an advance of his whole corps to hold the ground about the Peach Orchard. He probably had in mind the advantage given the Confederates at Chancellorsville in allowing them the occupation of the Hazel Grove Plateau. But it was, nevertheless, bad tactics. It exchanged strong ground for weak, and gave the Confederates an opportunity not otherwise possible. They would be quite sure to crush the isolated 3D Corps. If their attack was properly organized and conducted, it might become possible to rush and carry the Federal main line in the pursuit of the fugitives. Meade, however, having seen Hooker's movement, at once visited the ground, and, after conferring with Sickles, ordered his return to his original position. Before the movement could be begun, however, Longstreet's guns had opened, and it was unwise to attempt a withdrawal under fire. Meade saw the danger and with military foresight prepared to meet it with every available man. There was not during the war a finer example of efficient command than that displayed by Meade on this occasion. He immediately began to bring to the scene reinforcements, both of infantry and artillery, from every corps and from every part of his line. As will be seen in the account of the fighting, he had engaged, or in hand on the field, fully 40,000 men by the time that Longstreet's assault was repulsed. Dot on the other hand, it must be said that the management of the battle on the Confederate side during this afternoon was conspicuously bad. The fighting was superb. But there appears to have been little supervision, and there was entire failure everywhere to conform to the original plan of the battle, as it had been indicated by Lee. Offensive battles are always more difficult of control than defensive and there were two special difficulties on this occasion. First, was the great extent of the Confederate lines, about five miles, and their awkward shape, making intercommunication slow and difficult. Second, was the type or character of the attack ordered, which may be called the echelon, or progressive type, as distinguished from the simultaneous. The latter should be the type for any battle in the afternoon. Battles begun by one command and to be taken up successively by others, are always much prolonged. We had used this method on four occasions, at Seven Pines, Gaines Mill, Frazier's Farm or Glendale, and Malvern Hill, and always with poor success. Our effort this afternoon will be seen to be a monumental failure. General instructions were given to each corps commander, but much was left to their discretion in carrying them out. More than one fell short in performance. It was about 3 p.m. when Hood's division, in the advance, 
crossed the Emmitsburg Road about 1,000 yards south of the beach orchard. The enemy's artillery had opened upon us as soon as our approach was discovered, and we presently replied. Hood's division crossed the road and formed in two lines, Robertson and Law in front, with Law on the right, Anderson and Benning 200 yards in rear, with Benning on the right. Dot. While this formation was taking place, scouts reported that Big Round Top Mountain was unoccupied and that an open farm road around it led to unguarded supply trains and hospitals. Hood and Law earnestly urged upon Longstreet that instead of making the direct attack, he should pass around the 3D Corps, seize Big Round Top, and fall upon the trains. Longstreet replied that Lee had ordered the direct attack, and it must be made without delay. It is not likely that the movement proposed by Hood would have accomplished much. Already our line was dangerously extended, and to have pushed one or two divisions past the 3D Corps and around the mountain would have invited their destruction. Had our army been more united and able to follow up the move in force, it might have proved a successful one. Not by assaulting the enemy in his chosen position where his whole army stood, as it were, in a circle back to back, but by threatening his communications while covering our own. It might easily have resulted in our being able to secure a position which would force the enemy to take the aggressive. Had Johnson's division been brought back from its isolated position, and had Lee been present to hear the report brought by Hood's scouts, the whole subsequent history of the battle might have been changed. Meanwhile, McClellan's division had been formed, west of and parallel to the Emmitsburg Road, with Kershaw on the right supported by Semmes, and Barksdale on the left supported by Wofford. In front of Kershaw, Cabell's battalion of artillery was engaged with 18 guns and in front of Barksdale were 18 of my own battalion. Ten guns, also of Henry's battalion, were engaged across the Emmitsburg Road. The remaining eight guns of my own battalion were held close by, to follow the infantry promptly in any advance, and the Washington artillery with ten guns, by Longstreet's order, were held in reserve in rear. Thus, about 3.45 p.m., 36 guns were in action against the Beach Orchard, and the enemy's adjacent lines and 10 guns against the enemy's left. The ranges were generally between 500 and 700 yards. After this cannonade had continued for perhaps 30 minutes, Hood received the order to advance. Following the initiative prescribed by Lee, Longstreet, Hood, and McClellan all made progressive attacks. Hood at first advanced only his front line. McClellan was about to advance upon Hood's left very soon after, when Longstreet halted him. He was held back for about an hour, during which Hood's second line was sent in, and both lines suffered severely. Then McClellan advanced both lines of his right wing, Kershaw and Semmes, and, after a further interval of at least twenty minutes, long enough to cause severe loss to Kershaw's exposed left, Barksdale and Wofford followed. There were thus four partial attacks of two brigades each, requiring at least an hour and a half to be gotten into action, where one advance by the eight brigades would have won a quicker victory with far less loss. When Hood's first line commenced the advance, Law, on the right, overlapped the Federal left. On the left Robertson was greatly overlapped by the Federal line. Law, obliquing still farther to his right, hoping to turn the Federal flank. A gap opened between Robertson and himself. The fourth and fifth techs, on Robertson's right, trying to dress upon Law, were drawn entirely away from Robertson, and attached themselves to Law's brigade. This brigade became divided, in the rough ground it traversed, into two bodies. The two regiments on the right, the 15th and 47th Alabama with a few of the fourth and fifth techs, swung still farther to the right, meeting no enemy, and, crossing Plum Run, they ascended the side of Big Round Top. Then, wheeling to the left, they crossed the depression between Big and Little Round Top and finally found the enemy in position on the top of the latter. Quite a sharp action ensued, which may be described here, out of its order in time as it was entirely isolated. Three companies of the 47th Alabama were detached and left on picket at the foot of the mountain. 
The remaining force was by about 500 men under the command of Col. Oates of the 15th Alabama the mountain had been partially occupied in the morning by the 3D Corps, but was vacated when they moved to the front. About 4 p.m., Gen. Warren, seeing the deployment of our lines, had brought up Vincent's brigade of Barnes's division of the 5th Corps. Swinton has written that a foot race occurred for the commanding position, and that a desperate hand-to-hand -hand fight with bayonets and clubbed muskets took place for a half hour between Hood's Texans and Vincent's men. None of the official reports on either side are consistent with this story. There was some sharp fighting and Vincent was killed, but Oates's small and isolated force was soon outflanked and compelled to retreat to the foot of the mountain. It was not pursued, and, at the foot, it built breastworks of rocks which it held all night and part of the next day. The total casualties reported for the battle by the 15th Alabama were, 17 killed, 54 wounded, and 90 missing, total 161. Major Campbell of the 47th reported about one-third of his whole number of men were killed and wounded. The losses of Vincent's brigade for the battle were 352. Hood's front line had, meanwhile, been reduced, by Oates's divergence to Big Round Top, to less than seven regiments in two isolated bodies. Law, on the right, had the 4th, 44th, and 48th Alabama, and parts of the 4th and 5th Tex. Robertson, on the left, had only the 1st Tex and 3D Arkansas his left flank, too, was in the air, and was much overlapped by the federal line. It could make no progress, but maintained a position under very severe fire of artillery and infantry, which, within the first half hour, severely wounded Hood. Law succeeded to the command of the division. His part of the brigade had made more progress, but already reinforcements sent by Meade were reaching the enemy and Law's advance was checked. Ho ordered in the second line, using Benning's brigade to reinforce his own, and Anderson to extend Robertson on his left. Law thus describes the advance of his reinforced line in an article in Battles and Leaders The ground was rough and difficult, broken by rocks and boulders which rendered an orderly advance impossible. Sometimes the Federals would hold one side of the huge boulders on the slopes until the Confederates occupied the other. In some cases my men, with reckless daring, mounted to the top of the large rocks in order to get a better view and to deliver their fire with greater effect. In less than an hour from the time we advanced to the attack, the hill by Devil's Den, opposite our center, was taken with three pieces of the artillery that had occupied it. The remaining piece was run down the opposite slope by the gunners, and escaped capture. During all this time, however, McClure's division was standing idle, though Barksdale was begging to be allowed to charge, and McClure's was awaiting Longstreet's order. Even when prolonged by Anderson's Georgians, the Texans' line was still so overlapped by the Federals that it could not advance. Law, placing his two brigades on the defensive on the captured hill, now came to the left and made a strong appeal to Kershaw for help. This was referred to McClure's and probably to Longstreet, for now the order was given for the advance of Kershaw supported by Semmes. But, by some unaccountable lack of appreciation of the situation, Barksdale, Wofford, and all the brigades of Anderson's division are still left idle spectators of the combat, while Hood's division is wearing itself out against superior numbers in strong position. Lee seems not to have been near. This was unfortunate, for his whole field of battle had been waiting all day and was still waiting for Longstreet's battle to be developed, and here it was being begun in the progressive manner which had been ordered, but with unwise deliberation. Longstreet, of course, is responsible, but every commanding officer takes great risks when he leaves such important movements without supervision. It was especially unfortunate in this case, because advancing Kershaw without advancing Barksdale would expose Kershaw to enfilade by the troops whom Barksdale would easily drive off. Few battlefields can furnish examples of worse tactics. Kershaw was put in motion by a signal. Cabell's guns, in his front, 
were ordered to pause in their firing, and then to fire three guns in rapid succession. At the signal the men leapt the wall in their front and were promptly aligned by their company officers. Kershaw writes, in battles and leaders, the brigade moved off at the word with great steadiness and precision, followed by Semmes with equal promptness. Longstreet accompanied me in this advance on foot as far as the Emmitsburg Road. All the field and staff officers were dismounted on account of the many obstacles in the way. When we were about the Emmitsburg Road I heard Barksdale's drums beat the assembly and knew then that I should have no immediate support on my left about to be squarely presented to the heavy force of infantry and artillery at and in rear of the peach orchard. As such a position would be speedily ruinous, Kershaw directed the three regiments on his left to wheel to the left and to charge the batteries in rear of the orchard, while with the right wing he continued the movement to the aid of Hood's division. Thus this brigade was also separated into two parts. Kershaw moved with the right wing, and presently, finding his right regiment, the 7th SC, beginning to overlap one on its left, he halted his line and ordered the 7th to move by the right flank. By some misunderstanding the order was shouted to the left, and was overheard by the left wing, who supposed it was an order for themselves to move by the right flank. Kershaw's narrative continues, after passing the building at Roses. The charge of the left wing was no longer visible from my position, but the movement was reported to have been magnificently conducted until the cannoneers had left their guns and the caissons were moving off, when the order was given by some unauthorized person to move by the right flank, and was immediately obeyed by the men. The Federals returned to their guns and opened on these doomed regiments a raking fire of grape and canister at short distance which proved most disastrous, and for a time destroyed their usefulness. Hundreds of the bravest and best men of Carolina fell victims of this fatal blunder. Meanwhile our own artillery fire had been kept up without intermission for what seemed more than two hours, though I know of no one who timed it. The range was very close and the ground we occupied gave little shelter except at few points for the limbers and caissons. Our losses both of men and horses were the severest the batteries ever suffered in so short a time during the war. Moody's battery had 424 pr. Howitzers and 212 pr. Guns on a rocky slope, and the labor of running the guns up after each recoil presently became so exhausting that, with Barksdale's permission, Eight volunteers from a miss regiment were gotten to help the cannoneers. Two of this detachment were killed and three severely wounded. Fielding's battery of 412 PR. Howitzers had two of them dismounted, and 40 cannoneers killed or wounded. At last, the ten guns of Jordan and Woolfolk, which had been held in reserve, were sent for. But just as they arrived, Barksdale's brigade made its advance, and was soon followed by Wofford's which Longstreet also accompanied in person. While the infantry was passing, my four batteries, which had been engaged in the cannonade, were gotten ready, and the whole six followed the charge of the infantry, and came into action in and about the beach orchard. One Barksdale's brigade advanced directly upon the beach orchard. Wofford's inclined somewhat to the right and went to the assistance of Gershaw and Semmes, striking the flank of the Federals opposing them. The enemy was driven back with severe loss and followed across the wheat field and on to the slopes of Little Round Top. Barksdale had made an equal advance upon our left. But by this time the reinforcements which Meade was hurrying from every part of the Federal line began to swarm around our mixed-up brigades. Barksdale was killed, Semmes mortally wounded, and our lines were slowly forced back. Another partial attack had spent its energy upon a task impossible for so small a force. Under the orders, Anderson's division was to take up the attack next after McClure's, so that the delay in starting Barksdale delayed also Wilcox's brigade on his left. Wilcox's report states that the cannonading continued until 6.20 pm when McClure's troops advanced to the attack. There was again much delay due to the fact that Wilcox had not been previously located at the position from which his charge should be made. 
This required a flank movement to the left of 400 or 500 yards over ground obstructed by stone and plank fences. The 8th Alabama was even hurried into the charge in column of fours. Proper preparation of the line during the long delay might have saved much time and permitted Wilcox's brigade to cover Barksdale's exposed left. Wilcox made a brilliant charge, and was soon followed in echelon on the left by Perry's brigade under Lang, and Lang was similarly followed by Wright's brigade. These two charges followed with the least delay of any during the affair. But each brigade was formed in a single line and without support, each advanced with its left flank in the air. Intervals of time and space intervened even between these attacks, and each was finally and separately repulsed with severe loss. The two remaining brigades of the division, Posey's and Muon's, were withheld from the assault. I will describe briefly the action of each brigade. Wilcox first encountered skirmishes in front of the Emmitsburg Pike with a line of infantry and batteries along the pike. These fell back before his musketry fire leaving in the road two guns whose horses had been killed. Beyond the pike the ground sloped gradually some 600 yards to a ravine fringed with small trees in rocky ground. Beyond the ground rose rapidly some 200 yards to a ridge, crowned with numerous batteries and held by the enemy in force. Wilcox's report gives his strength as about 1,200, and thus describes his advance. When my command crossed the pike and began to descend the slope they were exposed to an artillery fire from numerous pieces both from the front and from either flank. Before reaching the ravine at the foot of the slope two lines of infantry were met and broken, and driven pell-mell across the ravine. A second battery of six pieces hero fell into our hands. From the batteries on the ridge above referred to, grape and canister were poured into our ranks. This stronghold of the enemy, together with his batteries, were almost one when still another line of infantry descended the slope in our front, at a double quick, to the support of their fleeing comrades, and for the defense of the batteries. Seeing this contest so unequal I dispatched my adjutant general to the division commander to ask that support be sent to my men, but no support came. Three several times did this last of the enemy's lines attempt to drive my men back and were as often repulsed. This struggle at the foot of the hill on which were the enemy's batteries, though so unequal, was continued for some thirty minutes. With a second supporting line the heights could have been carried. Without support on either my right or my left my men were withdrawn to prevent their entire destruction or capture. The enemy did not pursue, but my men retired under a heavy artillery fire, and returned to their original position in the line, and bivouacked for the night pickets being left on the pike. In the engagement of this day I regret to report a loss of 577 men killed, wounded, and missing. Soon after this battle a newspaper correspondent, P. W. A. described Wilcox's charge and his sending in vain to Anderson for reinforcements, and stated that Anderson had Posey's and Muon's brigades idle, and that the battle was lost for lack of their support. Anderson replied, admitting the facts, but stating that he was under orders from Hill to hold two brigades in reserve, and that when Wilcox's call for help was received he was unable to find Hill and refer the matter to him. Next on Wilcox's left was our lone Florida brigade, Perry's, now under Lang. It had but three small regiments, and mustered about 700 bayonets. Lang reports as follows, at 6 p.m. Wilcox having begun to advance I moved forward. Being met at the crest of the first hill with a murderous fire of grape, canister, and musketry. Moving forward at the double quick, the enemy fell back beyond their artillery, where they were attempting to rally, when we reached the crest of the second hill. Seeing this the men opened a galling fire upon them, thickly strewing the ground with their killed and wounded. This threw them into confusion when we charged them with a yell and they broke and fled into the woods and breastworks beyond, leaving four or five pieces of cannon in my front, carrying off, however, most of the horses and limbers. Following them rapidly I arrived behind a small eminence at the foot of the heights, where, the brigade having become much scattered, I halted for the purpose of reforming, 
and allowing the men to catch their breath before the final assault upon the heights. While reforming, an aide from the right informed me that a heavy force had advanced upon Wilcox's brigade and was forcing it back. At the same time a heavy fire of musketry was poured upon my brigade from the woods fifty yards in front, which was gallantly met and handsomely replied to by my men. A few moments later another messenger from the right informed me that Wilcox had fallen back and the enemy was then some distance in rear of my right flank. Going to the right I discovered that the enemy had passed me more than 100 yards and were attempting to surround me. I immediately ordered my men back to the road some 300 yards to the rear. Arriving there I found there was no cover under which to rally and continued to fall back, rallying and reforming upon the line from which we started. In this charge the brigade lost about 300 killed, wounded, and missing. Next came Wright's Georgia Brigade about 1800 strong. Wright, in his report, describes the ground over which his advance was to be made, the distance to be traversed under fire increasing toward the left. I was compelled to pass for more than a mile across an open plain, intersected by numerous post and rail fences, and swept by the enemy's artillery, posted along the Emmitsburg Road and upon the crest of the heights a little south of Cemetery Hill. He noted that Posey's brigade upon his left was not advancing, and fearing that with his left flank in the air would be involved in serious difficulty, he sent an aide to Anderson with a message on the subject. Anderson ordered Posey to send forward two regiments as skirmishers. Later Posey speaks of supporting his skirmishers with his remaining regiments but as his casualties in the whole campaign were but 12 killed and 71 wounded, evidently his brigade was not seriously engaged, and the whole attack was allowed to terminate with that of Wright. Neither Hill nor Anderson give any explanation. Hill had still unengaged and close at hand Muon's brigade and Heth's division in reserve. Wright's report is of special interest as his advance was over the same ground covered the next day by the charge of Pickett's division. His report thus describes it after he had carried the enemy's advanced line, capturing several guns, crossed the pike, and approached the stone wall marking Pickett's farthest advance in his charge on the 3D. We were now within less than 100 yards of the crest of the heights, which were lined with artillery, supported by a strong body of infantry under protection of a stone fence. My men, by a well-directed fire, soon drove the cannoneers from their guns and leaping over the fence charged up to the top of the crest, and drove the enemy's infantry into a rocky gorge on the eastern slope of the heights, and some eighty or one hundred yards in rear of the enemy's batteries. We were now complete masters of the field, having gained the key, as it were, of the enemy's whole line. Unfortunately, just as we had carried the enemy's last and strongest position, it was discovered that the brigade upon our right had not only not advanced across the turnpike, but had actually given way and was rapidly falling back to the rear, while on our left we were entirely unprotected, the brigade ordered to our support having failed to advance. We were now in a critical condition. The enemy's converging lines were rapidly closing upon our rear, a few moments more and we would be completely surrounded, still no support could be seen coming to our assistance and with painful hearts we abandoned our captured guns, faced about, and prepared to cut our way through the closing lines in our rear. This was effected in tolerable order, but with immense loss. The enemy rushed to his abandoned guns as soon as we began to retire and poured a severe fire of grape and canister into our thin ranks as we retired slowly down the slope into the valley below. I continued to fall back until I reached a slight depression a few hundred yards in advance of our skirmish line of the morning, when I halted, reformed my brigade, and awaited the further pursuit of the enemy. In this charge my loss was very severe, amounting to 688 and killed, wounded, and missing, including many valuable officers. I have not the slightest doubt that I should have been able to have maintained my position on the heights and secured the captured artillery if there had been a protecting force on my left, or if the brigade on my right had not been forced to retire. We captured over twenty pieces of artillery, all of which we were compelled to abandon. Is there anywhere a sadder story of the war than this?
In all the reports of all the battles of the war there is no one more eloquent of fine conduct, but of poor handling of splendid troops. And presently we shall see in sharp contrast, in the Federal Army, during this same afternoon, perhaps the best example which the war produced of active supervision and efficient handling of a large force on the defensive. This action of Wright's ended Longstreet's battle of the afternoon. Three of Anderson's five brigades had attacked in progressive order and in single lines. They had been defeated and driven back, one at a time, in the order of their advance. No better demonstration could be asked of the evils of progressive attacks. The three brigades could just as easily have attacked simultaneously with McClure's, and several other brigades of Hill's corps could have supported and advanced with them. The temporary success of each brigade in a single and isolated line puts it beyond doubt that such an attack would have had better result. It has been told that Meade, being on the left with Sickles at the time of Longstreet's attack, had at once begun to bring up reinforcements. It is interesting to note the number thus brought forward before the fighting ceased at dark. The first help sent Sickles, when his six brigades were attacked by Longstreet's eight was Barnes's division of the 5th Corps, three brigades comma Tilton's, Schweitzer's, and Vincent's. Vincent fought Oates on a little round top and repulsed him, Vincent, however, being killed. Tilton and Schweitzer attacked Law and Anderson, but were themselves soon driven back. The losses of this division were, Vincent's, 352, Tilton's, 125, Schweitzer's, 427, total, 904. As Barnes retreated, Caldwell's division of the 2D Corps came up, with four brigades under Cross, Kelly, Zook, and Brook. The battle seesawed, but Caldwell, was driven back with the loss of half his division. Cross and Zook were killed and Brook wounded. The brigade losses were, Cross, 330, Kelly, 198, Brook, 389, Zook, 358, total, 1275. While Caldwell was in the stress of action, Sykes advanced as his division of three brigades, sending Weed to the left to the aid of Vincent, and the two brigades of regulars, under Day and Burbank, to the left of Caldwell's division. Here their right was exposed by the retreat of Caldwell and they were compelled to cut their way back to the main federal line upon the crest of the ridge, closely pursued and severely punished by the Confederates. Weed, supporting Vincent at a critical juncture, bad been himself killed. Between Weed and Vincent, however, Oates's force had been driven to the base of the mountain, where it remained unpursued. Day and Burbank, when driven back, formed upon Weed's left upon the crest. Weed's losses were 200, Day's, 382, Burbank's, 447, total, 1029. Most of this fighting was taking place about midway between Little Round Top, which was the left flank of the Federal line, and the Peach Orchard on the Emmitsburg Road. In the disputed arena was a wheat field nearly surrounded by woods on the west of Plum Run, here running south through marshy ground. The tide of battle rolled back and forth across this field several times, and when Ayres's regulars were driven back and pursued, Sykes ordered forward his last division, Crawford's, called the Par. Reserves, two brigades under McCandless and Fisher. Crawford formed in two lines, the second massed on the first, and his report thus describes the scene as he approached it, our troops in front, after a determined resistance unable to withstand the force of the enemy, fell back, and some finally gave way. The plain to my front was covered with fugitives from all divisions, who rushed through my lines and along the road to the rear. Fragments of regiments came in disorder, and without their arms, and for a moment all seemed lost. The enemy's skirmishers had reached the foot of the rocky ridge, little round top, and his columns were following rapidly. One is tempted to pause for a moment to contemplate the really hopeless situation of the Confederate battle. Already Sickles's six brigades had been reinforced by ten brigades which had been defeated one, two, or three at a time, 
with losses to the reinforcements alone of 3,108 men and five generals. The eight Confederate brigades had themselves suffered terribly and lost four generals. All had marched fully 20 miles within 24 hours, and the attack, much of it through woods and over rugged ground, had mingled commands and broken ranks. Infantry can never deliver their normal amount of fire except in regular ranks, shoulder to shoulder. When ranks are broken the men interfere with and mask each other. To say nothing of probable need of ammunition at this stage of the action, one must recognize that now, as the 11th and 12th brigades of the Federal reinforcements approach, the Confederate need of at least a fresh division is great. There are not only no reinforcements on the way, but none within two miles. Both Hill and Ewell have orders to cooperate with Longstreet's battle, but they are limiting their cooperation to ineffective cannonading of the enemy's entrenchments in their front, while the enemy is stripping these of infantry and marching fresh divisions to concentrate upon Hood and McClure's, and the three brigades of Wilcox, Perry, and Wright, which had supported them. But when these had carried the lines in their front, Carr's, Brewster's, and Burling's brigades of the 3D Corps, Hancock had brought up Harrow's and Hall's brigades of Gibbon's division, and Willard's of Hayes's division. One at a time, the three Confederate brigades were driven back with losses, already stated, amounting to 1,565 men. The six Federal brigades had lost as follows, Harrow's, 768, Hall's, 377, Willard's, 714, Willard being killed, Cars, 790, Brewster's, 778, Burling's, 513, total, 3940. One it would be tedious to attempt to follow the artillery reinforcements which came to the aid of Sickles's corps, but Hunt, chief of artillery, in his report, mentions eleven batteries with sixty guns being engaged from his general reserve. In addition to these the 2D, 3D, and 5th Corps had eighty guns engaged. Against these 140 guns, Longstreet had but sixty-two guns on the field, and Anderson's division but seven. The artillery on both sides suffered severely in men and horses. A number of Federal batteries were captured, and held temporarily, but only two or three guns could be brought off the field. Hunt's report says, the batteries were exposed to heavy front and enfilading fires and suffered terribly, but as rapidly as any were disabled they were retired and replaced by others. Besides the reinforcements of twelve brigades already mentioned, including Crawford's PA. Reserves, Meade had followed them with Robinson's and Doubleday's divisions of the 1st Corps, five brigades, taken from the lines in front of Hill's Corps, and with Williams's division, three brigades of the 12th Corps. Two more brigades, Candy's and Cobham's, of Geary's division of the 12th Corps, were also withdrawn from the entrenchments upon Culp's Hill, and ordered to the left, but they missed their road and did not reach the scene of action in time. These withdrawals left of the 12th Corps but a single brigade, Green's, holding the entrenchments upon Culp's Hill in front of Johnson's division of Ewell's Corps, who had been all day under orders to attack at the sound of Longstreet's guns. What they did will be told presently. All of these reinforcements did not become engaged. A part of Stannard's brigade recaptured six of the Federal guns, which the Confederates had overrun but could not remove. Part of Lockwood's brigade of the 12th Corps, who were raw troops, were led into action by Meade in person, and also retook a captured battery. Most of these reinforcements came into view upon the crest, from the lower slopes of which Crawford's division now advanced in a counterstroke to the Confederate charge which had routed and pursued Ayres's division. The mere sight of the long lines and solid blue masses which appeared to the Confederates as they cleared the woods and scanned the opposite slopes, was calculated to paralyze the advance. Ten fresh brigades were in position before them, besides the remnants of the thirteen brigades which had been driven back. About seventy-five guns were in action supporting this huge force. To this day there survive stories showing how the Confederates were impressed by this tremendous display. One, 
still told by guides at Gettysburg. Is that a cry was heard in the Confederate ranks, have we got all creation to whip? And another of the time was that the Federal commander was heard to give his orders, attention, universe, nations into line. By kingdom exclamation mark right wheel. Fortunately for the Confederates, the Federal counterstroke was confined to a very moderate advance by Crawford's division. Our disorganized lines made a show of resistance, but it only led to the loss of perhaps 200 prisoners from Anderson's brigade, which unwisely prolonged its fire. The enemy, however, only advanced to the eastern edge of the wheat field, and the Confederates retreated no farther than the western edge. From those positions the firing was kept up until darkness brought a welcome end. For in our worn out condition and isolated position we were in a very dangerous situation. Had Meade now ordered an advance he would have found long streets left flank in the air, and the whole line of McClure's and Hood's divisions much exhausted and but poorly supplied with ammunition. The ground on the left was open and the moon was full. There was certainly a great opportunity offered the Federal commander, with his large force of fresh troops in hand near the field, and only needing the word to go. It is now time to see how Lee's orders were being interpreted and carried out upon the left. The official reports are a painful record of insufficient comprehension of orders and inefficient attempts at execution, by officers each able to shift the blame of failure upon other shoulders than his own. Between the lines the apparent absence of supervision excites constant wonder. But everywhere that the troops fought their conduct was admirable. Yule, as before told, was ordered to attack with Johnson's division when he heard the sound of Longstreet's guns. Yule says that later his instructions were modified into making a diversion, but Lee's report does not recognize such modification. Yule interpreted his orders as calling only for a cannonade. It must be admitted that any serious attack by Johnson would have been suicidal. The enemy's lines were of exceptional strength, which is noted in the Federal reports. Ruger, for instance, thus describes the position of his division. Breastworks were immediately constructed of logs, rocks, and earth along the whole line, and at the gap in the line caused by the swale so as to give crossfire in front of Gap. In rear of breastworks of 1st Brigade, about 75 yards and nearly parallel therewith, was a stone wall, behind which the second line of the brigade was placed. In front of the line of the 3D Brigade Rock Creek was from 4 to 6 feet deep, with muddy bottom, caused by a dam near the turnpike. The whole position was covered with rocks. Added to these difficulties was the fact that there was but a single position where the Confederates could plant guns to fire upon this line, and that an inferior one, giving little shelter and exposed to an enfilade fire. It was so contracted that with difficulty 14 guns were crowded upon it, within about 1,000 yards of the enemy. It might have been foreseen that this battery, exposed to the fire of double its number of guns, would soon be put out of action. That was what happened, its commander, an especially gallant boy major, Latimer, under twenty-one years, being killed. Besides these guns Yule's diversion embraced six rifles, in rear of Latimer at a range of two thousand yards, and twelve more, on Seminary Ridge to the left of Hill's artillery at a range much over a mile. Hill's artillery comprised fifty-five guns on Seminary Ridge. So the whole assistance given to Longstreet's attack between 4 p.m. and darkness by the other two corps was confined to an artillery duel by 32 guns of Ewell and 55 of Hill, mostly at extreme ranges. But the value of this duel as assistance to Longstreet was absolutely nothing, for it did not prevent the enemy from withdrawing troops from every corps in his line to repel our assault. This cannonading was maintained for about two hours after which it gradually diminished until dark. Meanwhile, about six o'clock, Ewell had sent orders to each of his division commanders to attack the enemy's lines in his front. This involved for Johnson an attack upon Culp's Hill. The division had not been pushed close to the hill in preparation for an assault, although one had been contemplated all day. 
It now had a full mile to advance and Rock Creek had to be crossed. This could only be done at few places and involved much delay. Only three of Johnson's four brigades moved to the attack. His official report says, I then advanced my infantry to the assault of the enemy's strong position, a rugged and rocky mountain, heavily timbered and difficult of ascent, a natural fortification rendered more formidable by deep entrenchments and thicker battis, Jones's brigade in advance, followed by Nichols's and Stewart's. Gen. Walker was directed to follow, but reporting to me that the enemy were advancing upon him, from their right, he was ordered to repulse them as soon as possible. Gen. Walker did not arrive in time to participate in the assault that night. By the time my other brigades had crossed Rock Creek and reached the base of the mountain, it was dark. His skirmishers were driven in, and the attack made with great vigor and spirit. It was as successful as could have been expected under the circumstances. Stewart's brigade, on the left, carried a line of breastworks which ran perpendicular to the enemy's main line, captured a number of prisoners and a stand of colors, and the whole line advanced to within short range and kept up a heavy fire until late in the night. As has been told, the whole of the 12th Corps had been withdrawn from the lines except Green's brigade. This brigade was being extended when its advance was met by Stewart, who got possession only of empty trenches. Johnson's other brigades found the trenches in front of their approach held by Green's thin line, but in the darkness of the woods, the steep and rocky ground, and the abatis and obstructions in front, Johnson's line was halted at irregular distances, and the attack resolved itself into a random and ineffective musketry fire. Nothing more was possible. And even had they found more trenches vacant and occupied them, Meade could at will concentrate ample force to drive them out. The more one studies the situation, the more strange it seems that Lee abandoned his first purpose to withdraw Johnson from his false position. Early's attack is next to be described. It, too, was isolated, inadequate, and unsupported. It necessarily failed. Both attacks were in progress at the same time but long streets, which they were intended to support, had already ceased. Like Johnson's division, Early was also short of one brigade, Smith's having been sent to guard the rear from the direction of York. Gordon also was not engaged, as Early soon realized that the attack was an isolated one and would be quickly repulsed. Early's report gives the following details. As soon as Johnson became warmly engaged, which was a little before dusk, I ordered Hayes and Avery to advance and carry the works on the height in front. These troops advanced in gallant style to the attack, passing over the ridge in front of them under a heavy artillery fire, and then crossing a hollow between that and Cemetery Hill and moving up this hill in the face of at least two lines of infantry posted behind stone and plank fences, but these they drove back and passing over all obstacles they reached the crest of the hill and entered the enemy's breastworks crowning it, getting possession of one or two batteries. But no attack was made on the immediate right, as was expected, and not meeting with support from that quarter, these brigades could not hold the position they had attained, because a very heavy force of the enemy was turned against them from that part of the line which the divisions on the right were to have attacked and these brigades had, therefore, to fall back, which they did with comparatively slight loss, considering the nature of the ground over which they had to pass, and the immense odds opposed to them, and Hayes's brigade brought off four stands of captured colors. Gen. Rhodes did not advance for reasons given in his report. The maps show that Hayes's brigade on the right had only about 500 yards to advance over ground exposed to the enemy's fire. Avery's brigade on the left had a somewhat greater distance. Hayes reports his casualties in this affair as 181. Avery was killed. The casualties of his brigade for the three days were 345, of which at least two thirds were suffered in this charge. Howard's report gives the story from the Federal side. The attack was so sudden and violent that the infantry in front of Ames was giving way. In fact, at one moment the enemy had gotten within the batteries. A request for assistance had already gone to headquarters, so that promptly a brigade of the 2D Corps under Col. K. 
Carol moved to Ames's right, deployed, and went into position just in time to check the enemy's advance. At Y. Edrich's battery, Gen. Ames, by extraordinary exertions, arrested a Bannock, and the men with sponge staffs and bayonets forced the enemy back. At this time he received support from Gen. Schkertz. Effective assistance was also rendered at this time by a portion of Gen. Steinway's command at points where the enemy was breaking through. This furious onset was met and withstood at every point, and lasted less than an hour. It only remains to show why Rhodes failed to cooperate with Early and Johnson as Ewell had ordered. The fault was with Ewell himself. We have already seen that he had allowed Johnson's division to remain all day so far from the position which he was to attack that, when ordered to advance, darkness fell upon him before he could reach it. Similarly Ewell had allowed both of his other divisions to locate themselves far out of reach of the places where they were likely to be needed. Of his own motion, however, Early had advanced half of his division at dawn to the Federal skirmish line, and these two brigades were ready to advance when ordered. Rhodes had remained about the northwestern edge of the town, near where the fighting of the first day had ended, and was still there when the orders came to attack. He was already preparing to advance, having seen both infantry and artillery withdrawn by the enemy from his front to resist Longstreet's pressure upon their left. But his location was so unfortunate that, in spite of this warning, both Johnson's and Early's attacks were begun and finished before Rhodes had reached the enemy's skirmish line. Finding then his opportunity gone, he wisely desisted. But as Lee and his staff during the morning had visited Ewell's lines, it is strange that such faulty locations escape notice and correction. Rhodes's report not only shows the badness of his original position, but tells of an excellent one for the attack, which so far had entirely escaped the recognition of any Confederate reconnoitering officer. His report says, having to draw my troops out of town by the flank, change the direction of the line of battle, and then to traverse a distance of 1,200 to 1,400 yards, while Gen. Early had to move only half that distance without change of front. The result was that before I drove the enemy's skirmishers in, Gen. Early had attacked and been compelled to withdraw. But instead of falling back to the original line, I caused the front line to assume a strong position in the plain to the right of the town along the hollow of an old roadbed. This position was much nearer the enemy, was clear of the town, and was one from which I could readily attack without confusion. Rhodes's description of his new position is of special interest. Taken in connection with his statement of the distance to be traversed by Early's charge, it shows the existence of far more favorable ground for an attack upon Cemetery Hill than is to be found elsewhere upon the Federal line of battle from Culp's Hill to Little Round Top. It was open to our occupation from the afternoon of the first day, when you'll stop the pursuit and it must ever remain a grave reflection upon the Confederate conduct of the battle that the weakest part of the Federal position was the only portion which was not attacked. It will be more fully described in the account of the action on the 3D. Thus ended the second day, and one is tempted to say that thus ended the Battle of Gettysburg. For of the third day it must be said, as was said of the charge of the 600 at Balaclava, magnificent, but not war. The first day had been won by 17 Confederate brigades of infantry attacking 13 Federal. The victory was fruitless because Ewell stopped the pursuit in full tide. On the second day, Longstreet, with 11 brigades, in seven piecemeal attacks, drives back six Federal brigades, which, being gradually reinforced by 18 fresh brigades, check the Confederate advance, and recover part of the lost ground before night ends the conflict. Cooperative attacks by Ewell and Hill, ordered by Lee, failed to be effective because both Ewell and Hill had failed to have their divisions in proper positions for the charge long before the moment arrived, although each had had ample time. One as we advanced we saw a number of prisoners being sent to the rear, passing a rail fence across our path, Major Deering, commanding the battalion attached to Pickett's division was with us and he shouted an order to the prisoners to move those rails. Never was an order executed with more alacrity. 
every prisoner seemed to seize a rail, and the fence disappeared as if by magic. One the federal losses stated are from the official returns which include the losses of all three days, but most of the brigades mentioned suffered the greater part of their losses during the afternoon of the 2D. Chaptex Wittesburg, third day the plan of the day. Johnson reinforced. Johnson's battle. Lee joins Longstreet. A discussion. The decision. The neglected opportunity. Posting the guns. Artillery of other corps. Infantry formation. Hill's cannonade. The nine howitzers. Note from Longstreet. Talk with Wright. Cannonade opens. Picket called for. Picket and Longstreet. Picket appears. The repulse. Lee on the field. The afternoon. Nelson's enfilade. Advances from Beach Orchard. In his official report, Lee writes, the result of the second day's operations induced the belief that with proper concert of action, and with the increased support that the positions gained on the right would enable the artillery to render the columns, we should ultimately succeed, and it was accordingly determined to continue the attack. The general plan was unchanged. Longstreet, reinforced by Pickett's three brigades, was to attack the next morning, and Ewell was ordered to assault the enemy's right at the same time. The latter during the night reinforced Johnson with two brigades from Rhodes's and one from Early's division. This statement shows that the strongest features of the enemy's position were not yet apprehended. These were the ability of the enemy to concentrate their whole force upon any point attacked, and the impregnable character of the two federal flanks. The two brigades sent from Rhodes to reinforce Johnson were taken from the new position discovered by him early in the evening and already referred to, not only as the most favorable, but as practically the only position from which the Federal line could have been attacked with any hope of success. The brigade sent from early was sent from a force which could have effectively cooperated with an attack by Rhodes. The effect of sending the three brigades was to emasculate the center of our line and to concentrate seven brigades where they were utterly useless. Before proceeding, however, we may best here give briefly the outcome of Johnson's battle. He had been ordered by Yule to attack at daylight, under the impression that Longstreet would attack at the same hour. In fact, however, Longstreet received no orders during the night and the troops required for his attack could not be gotten into their positions before noon. Johnson, however, was himself attacked by the enemy at daylight at a point where he was still holding the trenches he had found abandoned the night before. He repulsed the Federal assault and attempted to follow the fugitives, but was repulsed. Heavy firing was kept up from behind rocks, trees, and parapets until near noon. Rumors of movements of the enemy upon his left, which afterward proved to be false, then led him to withdraw to the base of the hill where he remained unmolested until night, when he was at last recalled to the west of the town. His losses were about 1873, showing that the fighting was severe. Lee's headquarters were beyond the Chambersburg Pike, about four miles by road from the scene of battle on our right. During the night the Washington artillery was brought up and disposed with the rest of Longstreet's guns about the Peach Orchard, with the intention of resuming the battle in the morning. During the night Longstreet had sent scouts in search of a way by which he might turn the enemy's left and believed he had found one with some promise of success. Soon after sunrise, while Longstreet awaited the arrival of Pickett's division with Deering's battalion of artillery, intending then to extend his right, Lee joined him and proposed an assault upon the enemy's left center by Longstreet's three divisions. Longstreet demurred, and, as had occurred on the day before, some time was spent in discussion and examination. Although the opposing lines were in full view and easy range of each other, neither seemed anxious to begin an action. The enemy's guns were generally behind breastworks on the high hills and ridges with ample covering in rear for their horses and caissons. Ours, posted before daylight, stood exposed on gently rolling ground about the peach orchard and vicinity. The enemy fifed occasional shots, 
but not enough to force us to reply, and we were but too glad to be able to reserve our ammunition for more important work. Longstreet pointed out to Lee the enemy's position on the round tops and the danger of withdrawing Hood and McClers from our right flank, which would be necessary if they were to take part in the attack upon the enemy's left center. Lee recognized the necessity and substituted six brigades from Hill's Corps. His report says, Longstreet was delayed by a force occupying the high rocky hills on the enemy's extreme left, from which his troops could be attacked in reverse as they advanced. His operations had been embarrassed the day previous from the same cause and he now deemed it necessary to defend his flank and rear by the divisions of Hood and Mucklers. He was, therefore, reinforced by Heth's division and two of Pender's brigades to the command of which Trimble was assigned. One long street further objected that the enemy's artillery on the high rocky hills would enfilade the lines assaulting the left center. Col. Long, of Lee's staff, in his memoirs of Lee, writes, this objection was answered by Col. Long who said that the guns on round top could be suppressed by our batteries. This point being settled, the attack was ordered and Long Street was directed to carry it out. Long Street, in his menaces to Upper Maddox, describing the same conversation, gives further detail as follows, I asked the strength of the column. He, Lee, stated, 15,000. Opinion was then expressed that the 15,000 men who could make successful assault over that field had never been arrayed for battle, but Ho was impatient of listening and tired of talking, and nothing was left but to proceed. It seems remarkable that the assumption of Col. Long so easily passed unchallenged that Confederate guns in open and inferior positions could suppress Federal artillery fortified upon commanding ridges. Our artillery equipment was usually admitted to be inferior to the enemy's in numbers, calibers and quality of ammunition. Moreover, here, the points selected and the method of the attack would certainly have been chosen for us by the enemy had they had the choice. Comparatively the weakest portion of their line was Cemetery Hill, and the point of greatest interest in connection with this battle is the story of our entire failure to recognize this fact. The narrative may therefore pause while this neglected opportunity is pointed out. There was one single advantage conferred by our exterior lines, and but one, in exchange for many disadvantages. They gave us the opportunity to select positions for our guns which could enfilade the opposing lines of the enemy. Enfilading fire is so effective that no troops can submit to it long. Illustrations of this fact were not wanting in the events of this day. What has been called the shank of the Federal Fishhook, extending south from the bend at Cemetery Hill toward Little Round Top, was subject to enfilade fire from the town and its flanks and suburbs. That liability should have caused special examination by our staff and artillery officers, to discover other conditions which might favor an assault. There were and are others still easily recognizable on the ground. The salient angle is acute and weak, and within about 500 yards of its west face is the sheltered position occupied by Rhodes the night of July 2d, which has already been mentioned. From nowhere else was there so short and unobstructed an approach to the Federal line, and one so free from flank fire. On the northeast, at but little greater distance, was the position whence Early's two brigades the evening before had successfully carried the east face of the same salient. Within the edge of the town between these two positions was abundant opportunity to accumulate troops and to establish guns at close ranges. As long as Gettysburg stands and the contour of its hills remains unchanged, students of the battlefield must decide that Lee's most promising attack from first to last was upon Cemetery Hill, by concentrated artillery fire from the north and assaults from the nearest sheltered ground between the west and northeast. That this was not realized at the time is doubtless partly due to the scarcity of trained staff and reconnoitering officers, and partly to the fact that Ewell had discontinued and withdrawn the pursuit on the afternoon of the first, when it was about to undertake this position. Hence the enemy's pickets were not driven closely into their lines, and the vicinity was not carefully examined. Not a single gun was established within a thousand yards, 
nor was a position selected which enfiladed the lines in question. Quite by accident, during the cannonade preceding Pickett's charge, Nelson's battalion of Ewell's Corps fired a few rounds from a position which did enfilade with great effect part of the 11th Corps upon Cemetery Hill, but the fire ceased on being sharply replied to. Briefly the one weak spot of the enemy's line and the one advantage possessed by ours were never apprehended. In addition to the six brigades of Hill's corps assigned to Longstreet for his column of assault, one more, Wilcox of Anderson's division, was later added, making ten brigades in all, of which only three were Longstreet's and seven were Hill's. I was directed by Longstreet to post all of his artillery for a preliminary cannonade and then to take a position whence I could best observe the effect of our fire, and determine the proper moment to give the signal to pick it to advance. The signal for the opening of the cannonade would be given by Longstreet himself after the infantry brigades were all in position. A clump of trees in the enemy's line was pointed out to me as the proposed point of our attack, which I was incorrectly told was the cemetery of the town and about 9 a.m. I began to revise our line and post it for the cannonade. The enemy very strangely interfered with only an occasional cannon shot, to none of which did we now reply, for it was easily in their power to drive us to cover or to exhaust our ammunition before our infantry column could be formed. I can only account for their allowing our visible preparations to be completed by supposing that they appreciated in what a trap we would find ourselves. Of Longstreet's 83 guns, eight were left on our extreme right to cover our flank. And the remaining 75 were posted in an irregular line about 1,300 yards long, beginning in the Beach Orchard and ending near the northeast corner of the Spangler Wood. While so engaged, Gen. Pendleton offered me the use of 912 PR. Howitzers of Hill's Corps saying that that corps could not use guns of such short range. I gladly accepted and went to receive the guns under command of Major Richardson. I placed them under cover close in rear of the forming column with orders to remain until sent for, intending to take them with the column when it advanced. A few hundred yards to left and rear of my line began the artillery of the 3D Corps under Col. Walker. It comprised 60 guns extending on Seminary Ridge as far as the Hagerstown Road, and two Whitworth rifles located nearly a mile farther north on the same ridge. In this interval were located twenty rifle guns of the 2D Corps under Col. Carter. Four more rifles of the same Corps under Captain Graham were located about one and a half miles northeast of Cemetery Hill. These 24 guns of the 2D Corps were ordered to fire only solid shot as their fuses were unreliable. There remained unemployed of the 2D Corps 25 rifles and 16 Napoleons, and of the 3D Corps, 15 12 PR. Howitzers. It is notable that of the 84 guns of the 2D and 3D Corps to be engaged, 80 were in the same line parallel to the position of the enemy and 56 guns stood idle. It was a phenomenal oversight not to place these guns, and many beside, in and near the town to enfilade the shank of the fishhook and cross fire with the guns from the west. The Federal guns in position on their lines at the commencement of the cannonade were 166, and during it 10 batteries were brought up from their reserves, raising the number engaged to 220 against 172 used upon our side during the same time. The formation of our infantry lines consumed a long time, and the formation used was not one suited for such a heavy task. Six brigades, say 10,000 men, were in the first line. Three brigades only were in the second line, very much shorter on the left. It followed about 200 yards in rear of the first. The remaining brigade, Wilcox's, posted in rear of the right of the column, was not put in motion with the column, and being ordered forward twenty minutes or more later, was much too late to be of any assistance whatever. Both flanks of the assaulting column were in the air and the left without any support in the rear. It was sure to crumble away rapidly under fire. The arrangement may be represented thus colon Brock and Braw, Davis, McGowan, Archer, Garnett, Kemper, Lane, Scales, Armistead, Wilcox. No formation, 
however, could have been successful and the light one doubtless suffered fewer casualties than one more compact and deeper would have had. A little before noon the sprung up upon our left a violent cannonade which was prolonged for fully a half hour, and has often been supposed to be a part of that order to proceed Pickett's charge. It began between skirmishes in front of Hill's Corps over the occupation of a house. Hill's artillery first took part in it, it was said, by his order. It was most unwise, as it consumed uselessly a large amount of his ammunition, the lack of which was much felt in the subsequent fighting. Not a single gun of our corps fired a shot, nor did the enemy in our front. Dot when the firing died out, entire quiet settled upon the field, extending even to the skirmishes in front, and also to the enemy's rear. Whence behind their lines opposing us we had heard all the morning the noise of Johnson's combats. My seventy-five guns had all been carefully located and made ready for an hour, while the infantry brigades were still not yet in their proper positions, and I was waiting for the signal to come from Longstreet, when it occurred to me to send for the nine howitzers under Richardson, that they might lead in the advance for a few hundred yards before coming into action. Only after the cannonade had opened did I learn that the guns had been removed and could not be found. It afterward appeared that Pendleton had withdrawn four of the guns, and that Richardson with the other five, finding himself in the line of the Federal fire during Hill's cannonade, had moved off to find cover. I made no complaint, believing that had these guns gone forward with the infantry they must have been left upon the field and perhaps have attracted a counter-stroke after the repulse of Pickett's charge. Meanwhile, some half hour or more before the cannonade began, I was startled by the receipt of a note from Longstreet as follows, Colonel, if the artillery fire does not have the effect to drive off the enemy or greatly demoralize him, so as to make our effort pretty certain, I would prefer that you should not advise Pickett to make the charge. I shall rely a great deal upon your judgment to determine the matter and shall expect you to let Jen. Pickett know when the moment offers. Until that moment, though I fully recognized the strength of the enemy's position, I had not doubted that we would carry it, in my confidence that Lee was ordering it. But here was a proposition that I should decide the question. Overwhelming reasons against the assault at once seemed to stare me in the face. Jen. Wright of Anderson's division was standing with me. I showed him the letter and expressed my views. He advised me to write them to Longstreet, which I did as follows, General, I will only be able to judge of the effect of our fire on the enemy by his return fire, as his infantry is little exposed to view and the smoke will obscure the field. If as I infer from your note, there is any alternative to this attack, it should be carefully considered before opening our fire, for it will take all the artillery ammunition we have left to test this one, and if result is unfavorable we will have none left for another effort. And even if this is entirely successful, it can only be so at a very bloody cost. To this note, Longstreet soon replied as follows, Colonel. The intention is to advance the infantry if the artillery has the desired effect of driving the enemies off, or having other effects such as to warrant us in making the attack. When that moment arrives advise Jen. Pick it and of course advance such artillery as you can use in aiding the attack. Evidently the cannonade was to be allowed to begin. Then the responsibility would be upon me to decide whether or not Pickett should charge. If not, we must return to that to replenish ammunition, and the campaign would be a failure. I knew that our guns could not drive off the enemy, but I had a vague help that with Ewell's and Hill's cooperation something might happen, though I knew little either of their positions, their opportunities, or their orders. I asked Wright, what do you think of it? Is it as hard to get there as it looks? He answered, the trouble is not in going there. I went there with my brigade yesterday. There is a place where you can get breath and reform. The trouble is to stay there after you get there, for the whole Yankee army is there in a bunch. I failed to fully appreciate all that this might mean. The question seemed merely one of support, which was peculiarly the province of Jen. Lee. I had seen several of Hill's brigades forming to support Pickett, and had heard a rumor that Lee had spoken of a united attack by the whole army. I determined to see Pickett and get an idea of his feelings. 
I did so, and finding him both cheerful and sanguine, I felt that if the artillery fear opened, Pickett must make the charge, but that Longstreet should know my views, so I wrote him as follows, General, when our fire is at its best, I will advise Jen. Pickett to advance. It must have been with bitter disappointment that Longstreet saw the failure of his hope to avert a useless slaughter, for he was fully convinced of its hopelessness. Yet even he could have scarcely realized, until the event showed, how entirely unprepared were Hill and Yule to render aid to his assault and to take prompt advantage of other temporary success. None of their guns had been posted with a view to cooperative fire, nor to follow the charge and much of their ammunition had been prematurely wasted. And although Pickett's assault, when made, actually carried the enemy's guns, nowhere was there the slightest preparation to come to his assistance. The burden of the whole task fell upon the ten brigades employed. The other twenty-seven brigades and fifty-six fresh guns were but widely scattered spectators. It was just 1 p.m. by my watch when the signal guns were fired and the cannonade opened. The enemy replied rather slowly at first, though soon with increasing rapidity. Having determined that Pickett should charge, I felt impatient to launch him as soon as I could see that our fire was accomplishing anything. I guessed that a half hour would elapse between my sending him the order and his column reaching close quarters. I dared not presume on using more ammunition than one hour's firing would consume for we were far from supplies and had already fought for two days. So I determined to send Pickett the order at the very first favorable sign and not later than after thirty minutes firing. At the end of twenty minutes no favorable development had occurred. More guns had been added to the Federal line than at the beginning, and its whole length, about two miles, was blazing like a volcano. It seemed madness to order a column in the middle of a hot July day to undertake an advance of three-fourths of a mile over open ground against the center of that line. But something had to be done. I wrote the following note and dispatched it to Pickett at 1.25, General, if you are to advance at all, you must come at once or we will not be able to support you as we ought. But the enemy's fire has not slackened materially and there are still eighteen guns firing from the cemetery. I had hardly sent this note when there was a decided falling off in the enemy's fire, and as I watched I saw the guns limbered up and withdrawn. We frequently withdrew from fighting federal guns in order to save our ammunition for their infantry. The enemy had never heretofore practiced such economy. After waiting a few minutes and seeing that no fresh guns replaced those withdrawn, I felt sure that the enemy was feeling the punishment, and at 1.40 I sent a note to Pickett as follows, for God's sake come quick. The eighteen guns have gone. Come quick or my ammunition will not let me support you properly. This was followed by two verbal messages to the same effect by an officer and sergeant from the nearest guns. The eighteen guns had occupied the point at which our charge was to be directed. I had been incorrectly told it was the cemetery. Soon only a few scattered federal guns were in action, and still Pickett's line had not come forward, though scarcely three hundred yards behind my guns. I afterward learned what had followed the sending of my first note. It reached Pickett in Longstreet's presence. He read it and handed it to Longstreet. Longstreet read and stood silent. Pickett said, General, shall I advance? Longstreet knew that it must be done, but was unwilling to speak the words. He turned in his saddle and looked away. Pickett saluted and said, I am going to move forward, sir, and galloped off. Longstreet, leaving his staff, rode out alone and joined me on the left flank of the guns. It was doubtless 1.50 or later but I did not look at my watch again. I had grown very impatient to see Pickett, fearing ammunition would run short, when Longstreet joined me. I explained the situation. He spoke sharply, go and stop Pickett where he is and replenish your ammunition. I answered, we can't do that, sir. The train has but little. It would take an hour to distribute it, and meanwhile the enemy would improve the time. Longstreet seemed to stand irresolute, we were both dismounted, and then spoke slowly and with great emotion, I do not want to make this charge. 
I do not see how it can succeed. I would not make it now but that Jen. Lee has ordered it and is expecting it. I felt that he was inviting a word of acquiescence on my part and that if given he would again order, stop pick it where he is. But I was too conscious of my own youth and inexperience to express any opinion not directly asked. So I remained silent while Longstreet fought his battle out alone and obeyed his orders. The suspense was brief and was ended by the emergence from the wood behind us of Garnet riding in front of his brigade. I had served on the plains with him and Armistead in 1858, and I now met him for the first time since Longstreet's Suffolk campaign. He saluted and I mounted and rode with him while his brigade swept through our guns. Then I rode down the line of guns asking what each gun had left. Many had canister only. These and all having but few shell were ordered to stand fast. Those with a moderate amount of suitable ammunition were ordered to limber up and advance. During the cannonade the reserve ordnance train had been moved from the position first occupied, and caissons sent to it had not returned. Only about one gun in four could be ordered forward from the center but from the right Major Haskell took five from Gardens and Flanners batteries, and Major Ishulman, of the Washington Artillery, sent four somewhat to Haskell's left. Dot returning to the center I joined the few guns advancing from the batteries there, and moved forward to a swell of ground just west of the Emmitsburg Road, whence we opened upon troops advancing to attack the right flank of Pickett's division. Schulman and Haskell to the left front of the Peach Orchard soon also opened fire. The charging brigades were now close in front of the Federal lines and the musketry was heavy. Dot as we watched, we saw them close in upon the enemy in smoke and dust, and we ceased firing and waited their result. It was soon manifest in a gradual diminution of the fire and in a stream of fugitives coming to the rear pursued by some fire but not as much, it seemed to me. As might have been expected. Dot after perhaps twenty minutes, during which the firing had about ceased, to my surprise there came forward from the rear Wilcox's fine Alabama brigade, which had been with us at Chancellorsville, and, just sixty days before, had won the affair at Salem Church. It had been sent to reinforce Pickett, but was not in the column. Now, when all was over, the single brigade was moving forward alone and there was no one there with authority to halt it. They were about 1,200 strong and on their left were about 250, the remnant of Perry's Florida Brigade. It was at once both absurd and tragic. They advanced several hundred yards beyond our guns, under a sharp fire. Then they halted and opened fire from some undergrowth and brushwood along a small ravine. Federal infantry soon moved out to attack their left. When Perry fell back past our guns, Wilcox moved by his right flank and making a circuit regained our lines at the Peach Orchard. His loss in this charge was 204 killed and wounded. Perry's loss was about proportional, with some prisoners in addition. While Wilcox's brigade was making its charge, Jen. Lee rode up and joined me. He was entirely alone, which could scarcely have happened except by design on his part. We were not firing, but holding position to prevent pursuit by the enemy. I have no doubt that Lee was apprehensive of this, and had come to the front to help rally the fugitives if that happened. He remained with us perhaps an hour and spoke to nearly every man who passed, using expressions such as, don't be discouraged. It was my fault this time. Form your ranks again when you get under cover. All good men must hold together now. I had with me as an aide, Lieutenant Colston, ordnance officer of my battalion. At one time a loud cheering was heard in the federal lines and Lee asked Colston to ride to the front and find out the cause. Colston's horse was unused to the spur and, balking, Colston had a stick handed him and used it. Lee said, oh, don't do that. I once had a foolish horse and I found gentle measures so much the best. Colston presently reported that the Federals were cheering an officer riding along their line. Lee remarked that he had thought it possible that Johnson's division in the Federal rear might have gained some success. Evidently he was not yet informed that Johnson, about noon, had withdrawn to a defensive position. Kemper was brought by on a litter. 
Li rode up and said, General, I hope you are not badly hurt. Kemper replied, Yes, General, I'm afraid they have got me this time. Li pressed his hand, saying, I trust not. I trust not. Col. Fremantle, of Her Majesty's Cold Stream Guards, had also joined the party. We sat on horseback on the slope behind the guns where we could see over the crest, but the group of horses was not visible to the enemy. When all the fugitives had passed and there was still no sign of counter stroke, Lee rode off. I continued to hold my line of guns with few changes until after dark. There were some advances by Federal skirmish lines, which we kept in check with our guns, sometimes having to use canister sharply. But the Federal guns did not interfere, for which we were duly grateful. During the afternoon, I quietly withdrew guns, one at a time, sending them to be refitted, and by 10 o'clock, our whole line had been retired about to the position from which the attack began on the 2D. Now that we have reached the turning point of our campaign, we may revert to some incidents of note in the progress of the battle. In speaking of our neglect to enfilade the Federal lines, it was stated that quite by accident a few rounds were fired during the cannonade which happened to enfilade a part of Cemetery Hill. In the Philadelphia Weekly Times of May 31, 1877, Col. Osborne, Chief of Artillery, 11th Corps, describes the cannonade, in which he commanded a little over 60 guns and mentions this incident as follows, the fire from our west front had progressed 15 to 20 minutes when several guns opened on us from the ridge beyond East Cemetery Hill. The line of fire from these last batteries, and the line of fire from the batteries on our west front, was such as to leave the town between the two lines of fire. These last guns opened directly on the right flank of my line of batteries. The gunners got our range at almost the first shot. Passing low over Wainwright's guns they caught us square inches flank and with the elevation perfect. It was admirable shooting. They raked the whole line of batteries, killed and wounded the men and horses, and blew up the caissons rapidly. I saw one shell go through six horses standing broadside. To meet this new fire I drew from the batteries facing west the 20-pound Parrot battery of Captain Taft and wheeling it half round to the right brought it to bear on them. I also drew from the reserve one battery and placed it in position on Taft's right. Fortunately for us these batteries, placed in the new line, at once secured the exact range of their immediate adversaries. In a few minutes the enemy's fire almost ceased, and when it again opened, and while the fire was progressing, it was irregular and wild. They did not again get our range as they had it before we replied. Gen. Howard in the Atlantic Monthly, July, 1876, writing of this occasion, says, One regiment of Steinwiz was fearfully cut to pieces with a shell. It doubtless received an enfilading shot from the firing here described. The official reports enable us to identify this firing as done at a range of 2,500 yards by three rifled guns of Milledge's battery of Nelson's battalion of Ewell's reserve artillery. Nelson had three batteries carrying 13 guns, and the 48 rounds fired by Milledge were the only shots fired by the battalion during the campaign. It was not, however, Nelson's fault, but his superiors. His report says, about 12 m. I was ordered to draw the attention of the enemy's batteries from our infantry, in connection with Captain Graham, commanding Rockbridge artillery, and fired about 20 or 25 rounds from a point to the left and somewhat in advance of Captain Graham's position. On Friday night I encamped about one half mile in rear of my position on that day. The Ordnance Report of the 2D Corps identifies the guns and gives the rounds fired as 48. Mention has been made of the five guns advanced by Major Haskell from the Beach Orchard, and the four from the Washington Artillery a little to their left. These guns moved so far outside of Pickett's charge that they were able to fire obliquely upon the Federals opposing it. Haskell on the extreme right was even able to enfilade portions of the Federal reinforcements the fighting here was almost hand to hand. The following account is given by Col. 
rice of the 19th mass. Colon 1, the men in grey were doing all that was possible to keep off the mixed bodies of men, who were moving upon them swiftly and without hesitation, keeping up so close and continuous a fire that at last its effects became terrible. The grove was fairly jammed with pickets men, in all positions, lying and kneeling. Back from the edge were many standing and firing over those in front. By the side of several who were firing, lying down or kneeling, were others with their hands up in token of surrender. In particular I noticed two men, not a musket length away, one aiming so that I could look into his musket barrel, the other, lying on his back, coolly ramming home a cartridge. A little farther on was one on his knees waving something white in both hands. Every foot of ground was occupied by men engaged in mortal combat who were in every possible position which can be taken while under arms or lying wounded or dead. A confederate battery near the beach orchard commenced firing. A cannon shot tore a horrible passage through the dense crowd of men in blue, who were gathering outside the trees. Instantly another shot followed and fairly cut a road through the mass. The official report of Col. Abbot of the Twentieth Mass. Thus describes the same scene, the enemy poured in a severe musketry fire, and at the clump of trees they burst also several shells, so that our loss was very heavy, more than half the enlisted men of the regiment being killed or disabled, while there remained but three out of thirteen officers. The enfilading shots described by Col. Rice doubtless came from the batteries under command of Major Haskell. No official report was made, but I quote from a personal letter of Major Haskell some years later, just before Pickett's division charged, you rode up and after inquiring what ammunition I had, you ordered me to move forward with five guns, part of which were taken from each battery. We advanced about 300 to 500 yards when I saw a large mass of infantry to our left front beginning to deploy, apparently to strike the right flank of Pickett's division. I at once opened fire on this infantry, which almost immediately scattered or withdrew, unmasking a large number of guns. Gen. Hunt told me after the war there were over twenty. In a very few minutes these guns had disabled several of mine, killing and wounding quite a number of men and horses. Our ammunition being exhausted, I ordered such guns as could be moved to withdraw ordering Garden and Flanner to return as quickly as possible with litters for the wounded, and teams and limbers for the disabled guns. This they did, getting everything out. The four guns under Captain Miller and Lieutenant Battle fared nearly as badly. Major Ishulman, seeing that they were being rapidly cut up, withdrew them, but two of the guns, three of the teams, a lieutenant, and several men were put hors de combat in the movement. But one official report from Pickett's division has been published, that of Garnett's brigade, by Major C. S. Payton, 19th V., who was the only field officer of the division not killed or wounded. Pickett wrote a report which reflected unjustly upon the brigades of Hill's Corps, among which the break first occurred. Lee returned the report, asking Pickett to modify it, which Pickett delayed and finally neglected to do. I quote from Peyton's report, dated July 9, as follows, Notwithstanding the long and severe marches made by the troops of this brigade, they reached the field about 9 a.m. in high spirits and in good condition. At about 12 m. we were ordered to take position behind the crest of the hill, on which the artillery under Col. Alexander was planted where we lay during the most terrific cannonading, which opened at 1.30 p.m., and was kept up without intermission for one hour. During the shelling we lost about twenty killed and wounded. Among the killed was Lieutenant Col. Ellis of the 19th V. At 2.30 p.m. the artillery fire having to some extent abated, the order to advance was given, first by Gen. Pickett in person, and repeated by Gen. Garnet with promptness, apparent cheerfulness, and alacrity. The brigade moved forward at quick time. The ground was open, but little broken, and from 800 to 1000 yards from the crest whence we started to the enemy's line. The brigade moved in good order, keeping up its line almost perfectly, 
notwithstanding it had to climb three high post and rail fences, behind the last of which the enemy's skirmishers were first met, and immediately driven in. Moving on, we soon met the advanced line of the enemy, lying concealed in the grass on the slope about 100 yards in front of his second line, which consisted of a stone wall, about breast high, running nearly parallel to and about 30 paces from the crest of the hill which was lined with their artillery. The first line referred to above, after offering some resistance, was completely routed, and driven in confusion back to the stone wall. Here we captured some prisoners, which were ordered to the rear without a guard. Having routed the enemy here, Gen. Garnet ordered the brigade forward, which it promptly obeyed, loading and firing as it advanced. Up to this time we had suffered but little from the enemy's batteries, which apparently had been much crippled previous to our advance, with the exception of one posted on the mountain, about one mile to our right, which enfiladed nearly our entire line with fearful effect, sometimes as many as ten men being killed and wounded by the bursting of a single shell. From the point it had first routed the enemy, the brigade moved rapidly toward the stone wall under a galling fire both from artillery and infantry, the artillery using grape and canister. We were now within about 75 paces of the wall, unsupported on the right and left. Gen. Kemper being some 50 or 60 yards behind and to the right, and Gen. Armistead coming up in our rear. Gen. Kemper's line was discovered to be lapping on ours, when, deeming it advisable to have the line extended on the right, to prevent being flanked, a staff officer rode back to the general to request him to incline to the right. Gen. Kemper not being present, perhaps wounded at the time, Captain Fry of his staff immediately began his exertions to carry out the request, but in consequence of the eagerness of the men in pressing forward, it was impossible to have the order carried out. Our line, much shattered, still kept up the advance until within about twenty paces of the wall, when, for a moment, it recoiled under the terrific fire that poured into our ranks both from their batteries and from their sheltered infantry. At this moment Gen. Kemper came up on the right and Gen. Armistead in rear, when the three lines, joining in concert, rushed forward with unyielding determination and an apparent spirit of laudable rivalry to plant the southern banner on the walls of the enemy. His strongest and last lines were instantly gained, the Confederate battle flag waved over his defences, and the fighting over the wall became hand to hand and of the most desperate character. But, more than half having already fallen, our line was found too weak to rout the enemy. We hoped for a support on the left, which had started simultaneously with ourselves, but hoped in vain. Yet a small remnant remained in desperate struggle, receiving a fire in front, on the right and on the left, many even climbing over the wall, and fighting the enemy in his own trenches until entirely surrounded, and those who were not killed or wounded were captured, with the exception of about 300 who came off slowly, but greatly scattered, the identity of every regiment being entirely lost, and every regimental commander killed or wounded. The brigade went into action with 1,287 men and about 140 officers, as shown by the report of the previous evening, and sustained a loss, as the list of casualties will show, of 941 killed, wounded, and missing, and it is feared, from all the information received, that the majority, those reported missing, are either killed or wounded. There was scarcely an officer or man in the command whose attention was not attracted by the cool and handsome bearing of Gen. Garnet, who, totally devoid of excitement or rashness, rode immediately in rear of his advancing line, endeavouring by his personal efforts, and by the aid of his staff, to keep his line well closed and dressed. He was shot from his horse while near the centre of the brigade, within about twenty-five paces of the stone wall. The conduct of Captain M. P. Spessard of the 28th V. was particularly conspicuous. His son fell mortally wounded at his side, he stopped but for a moment to look on his dying son, gave him his canteen of water, and pressed on, with his company, to the wall, which he climbed, 
and fought the enemy with his sword in their own trenches until his sword was wrested from his hands by two Yankees, he finally made his escape in safety. All accounts of the charge agree that its failure began when the advance had covered about half the distance to the Federal line. At that point the left flank of Pettigrew began to crumble away and the crumbling extended along the line to the right as they continued to advance until two-thirds of the line was gone, before the remainder, beginning at Fry's brigade, was finally absorbed in the collision with the enemy. That result was inevitable. Under the conditions it should have been foreseen. The Federal line on our left overlapped our line by nearly a half mile. It was crowded with guns and their oblique fire upon the unsupported left could be endured but for a short period, particularly, as several fences crossed their line of advance, causing constant disturbance of their ranks. The artillery of the 3D Corps, firing from Seminary Ridge, which had been vainly expected to silence this portion of the enemy's line, was now itself practically silent, on account of its imprudent expenditure in the duel about 11 a.m. Lee's report says, our artillery, having nearly exhausted their ammunition in the protracted cannonade that preceded the advance of the infantry, were unable to reply or render the necessary support to the attacking party. Owing to this fact, which was unknown to me when the assault took place, the enemy was enabled to throw a strong force of infantry against our left, already wavering under a concentrated fire of artillery from the ridge in front and from Cemetery Hill on the left. It finally gave way, and the right, after penetrating the enemy's lines, entering his advanced works and capturing some of his artillery, was attacked simultaneously in front and on both flanks, and driven back with heavy loss. Evidently the reliance for the support of our left flank had been the fire of the 82 guns from Seminary Ridge. It was as over-sanguine as that expressed by Col. Long in the morning conference on the right, and it failed to note that the enemy might hold guns in reserve. This was done on the present occasion. Hunt, the Federal Chief of Artillery, had withdrawn many guns to await the charge which he knew was coming. The crumbling away of Pettigrew's left precipitated the advance of Wilcox. Pickett, who was riding with his staff in rear of his division, saw that the brigades on the left were breaking and sent two aides to endeavor to rally them which they were unable to do. A third was sent at the same moment to Long Street to say that the position in front would be taken, but that reinforcements would be required to hold it. Long Street, in reply, directed Pickett to order up Wilcox, and Pickett sent three messengers in succession to be sure that the order was promptly acted upon. As the fugitives from Pettigrew's division came back, Wright's brigade of Anderson's division was moved forward a few hundred yards to cover their retreat. Later, after Wilcox had fallen back, by Lee's order, Wright was moved across to the rear in support of Wilcox, in case the enemy should make an advance, which at times seemed probable during the entire afternoon. It must be ever held a colossal mistake that Meade did not organize a counterstroke as soon as he discovered that the Confederate attack had been repulsed. He lost here an opportunity as great as McClellan lost at Sharpsburg. Our ammunition was so low, and our diminished forces were, at the moment, so widely dispersed along our unwisely extended line, that an advance by a single fresh corps, the 6th, for instance, could have cut us in two. Meade might at least have felt that he had nothing to lose and everything to gain by making the effort. Longstreet felt that the lines held by Hood and McClers were unwisely advanced for the changed conditions, and, during the afternoon, he quietly withdrew these divisions to the rear of the Emmitsburg Road. During the process of the withdrawal, the enemy advanced McCandless's brigade of the V Corps into the neutral ground between the lines where it accidentally encountered the 15th Georgia of Benning's brigade. This by mistake had been marched to the front, when it was intended to be moved to the rear. The regiment, though only numbering about 250, took a position and opened fire, expecting reinforcements. It was quickly outflanked and only with difficulty and by severe fighting did it extricate itself losing 101 men. During the morning there were cavalry affairs upon each of our flanks. Upon our left, Stuart advanced, 
and a severe combat ensued with Gregg's division and Custer's brigade. The result was a draw, each side claiming what it held at the close as a victory. Upon our right, Kilpatrick reports that at 8 a.m. he received orders to move to the left of the Federal line and attack the enemy's right and rear with his whole command, Custer's and Farnsworth's brigades, and the regular brigade, Merritt's. By some mistake, surely a fortunate one for the Confederates, Custer's brigade had already been sent to Gregg's division, on the other flank. Our right was at first merely picketed by 100 cavalry on the extreme flank, while, nearer the position of our infantry, was a strong line of skirmishers with Batchman's and Riley's batteries in support. Had Kilpatrick come with three brigades upon our right flank, he could not have failed to discover an immense opportunity open to him. Behind the mask of our videttes were wide fields stretching along the valleys of Willoughby Run and Marsh Creek for miles to the north and west, containing all our trains practically unguarded. The bulk of our cavalry was engaging Gregg's division about two miles east of Gettysburg. Once through our skirmish line, Kilpatrick would have had great scope before any adequate force could be brought against him. As it was, we had a narrow escape. Merritt's dismounted men had found the flank of our videttes, and were driving them rapidly to the rear, when Anderson's brigade was brought to the rescue, and Merritt was driven back. Meanwhile, Kilpatrick had ordered Farnsworth to charge through our long line of infantry pickets extending from the Emmitsburg Road to the right flank of our infantry line on the lower slope of Big Round Top. Farnsworth at first remonstrated, but then made the charge gallantly, with about 300 men of the 1st W. V. and the 1st VT. They rode through the Texan skirmish line but found themselves surrounded with no escape but to make a circuit and return, broken into squads by the fire of infantry and artillery, and by the natural obstacles of the ground. Farnsworth fell with five mortal wounds. The total killed and wounded in the charge were 65.1 The report of the Federal Chief of Artillery gives interesting details. The supply of ammunition carried with that army was 270 rounds per gun. The Confederate Army carried for the campaign about 150 rounds per gun. Hunt reports an expenditure in action of 32,781 rounds, an average of 106 per gun for 310 guns, excluding the cavalry. Ewell's Corps reports 5,851 rounds expended, and Hill's Corps 7,112 rounds. No report was made of Longstreet's ammunition, but his 83 guns were all engaged, while Ewell and Hill each engaged only 65. Ewell averaged about 90 rounds per gun engaged, and Hill about 110. Longstreet's 83 guns doubtless averaged as much as Hill's, which would make about 9,000 for the battle. This gives an aggregate for the army of about 22,000 or 103 rounds per gun for 213 guns engaged, excluding cavalry. The killed and wounded, not including the missing, in the Federal Reserve Artillery, 108 guns all engaged, numbered 230, an average per gun of 2.1. In Longstreet's Corps the total was 271, for 83 guns an average per gun of 2.6. In Ewell's the total was 132, an average per gun engaged 2. In Hill's the total was 128 and average per gun engaged 2. The destruction of artillery horses was very great, but figures are given only for Hill's core. This reported 190 killed in action, 80 captured, 187 abandoned on the road, and 200 condemned as broken down, a total of 627 lost in the campaign, with 77 guns. Serving the 26 guns of Alexander's battalion, 138 men and 116 horses, or over 5 men and 4 horses per gun, were killed or wounded. The greater part of this loss was from artillery fire and its severity shows that the ground occupied was unfavorable and afforded little shelter. An anxious inventory of the ammunition left on hand was made during that afternoon, and much relief was felt that enough for one day's fight was found. During the afternoon of the 3D, 
Lee determined upon immediate retreat to Va. Such an end to our invasion had, indeed, been inevitable from its beginning, but the difficulties were now greatly increased. Fortunately, Meade was not in aggressive mood, and Lee decided to give his trains one day's start of his troops. Many federal writers have sought to excuse Meade's failures to improve the opportunities offered him, one after the other, on the 3d, 4th, and 5th, and 11th, 12th, and 13th of July. It is needless to balance pros and cons. An axiom of the game of war is to attack whenever a large stake may be won by success, and but small loss incurred by repulse. Then the game is worth the candle, and the game must be played. It is the hardest of all games to a general new to the responsibility of chief command. Under cover of the night, Lee took a defensive line upon Seminary Ridge with its right flank retired to Willoughby Run. Here he stood all day of the 4th, apparently inviting attack, but fortunate in remaining unmolested. Imbadan's cavalry had joined him on the 3d, 2100 strong, with a six gun battery. During the night of the 3d, Imbadan had been directed to organize most of our vehicles into a single train, and to conduct it without a halt to Williamsport. Here it would stop only to feed, and would then ford the Potomac and move without a halt to Winchester. Imbadan's force, with a few more guns, would guard the front and flanks of the column, which would be about 17 miles long. A brigade of Stuart's cavalry, with a battery, would guard the rear. Lee's medical director was charged to see that all the wounded who could bear the journey were carried in the empty wagons and ambulances. What this journey was to mean to the wounded, none seemed to have imagined before starting, or they would have greatly preferred to become prisoners. Every vehicle appeared to be loaded to its capacity. It was about 4 p.m. on the 4th before the head of the train was put in motion from Cash Town. Meanwhile, what would have seemed a visitation of the wrath of God had come upon us. Had we not preferred the theory which has been previously referred to, that storms may be generated by heavy firings. Now there came suddenly, out of the clear sky of the day before, one of the heaviest train falls I have ever seen. Probably four inches of water fell within twelve hours, and it was sure to make the Potomac unfordable for a week. Emberdon, in Battles and Leaders, gives the following description, shortly after noon on the 4th. The very windows of heaven seemed to have opened. The rain fell in blinding sheets. The meadows were soon overflowed, and fences gave way before the raging streams. During the storm, wagons, ambulances, and artillery carriages by hundreds, nay, by thousands, were assembling in the fields along the road from Gettysburg to Cashtown in one confused and apparently inextricable mass. As the afternoon wore on, there was no abatement of the storm. Canvas was no protection against its fury, and the wounded men, lying upon the naked boards of the wagon bodies were drenched, horses and mules were blinded and maddened by the wind and water, and became almost unmanageable. My personal recollections of the occasion are vivid. About 5 p.m., my somewhat battered battalion drew into a meadow adjoining the Fairfield Pike with orders to watch the passing column of troops and take its place in the column immediately behind the 3D Corps, when it passed. This might be, we were told, in an hour or two. There was good grass in the meadow and the horses needed food, but the need to move promptly when the time came prevented unhitching. By good fortune, four of us got possession of an old door upon which we could sit, laying it flat on an old some fifty yards from the road. On that door we sat or lay in the rain all night, every half hour taking turns in walking out to the road to see what command was passing. At daylight the rain ceased to fall, but the sky remained threatening. About 6 a.m., we took our place in the column, and marched nineteen hours until 1 a.m. that night. Then we bivouacked until four near Monterey Springs on the Blue Ridge. We then marched again for fourteen hours, and bivouacked about six p.m. two or three miles beyond Hagerstown. Ewell's Corps, moving behind ours, did not leave the vicinity of Gettysburg until about noon on the 5th. The wagon train under Imboden moved on roads to our right, via Greenwood to Williamsport. 
it made better speed than our column of infantry and artillery, but at a cost of human suffering which it is terrible to contemplate. Some of the wounded were taken from the wagons dead at Williamsport, and many who were expected to recover died from the effects of the journey. Among these, it was said, were Gens, Pender and Sems, neither of whom had been thought mortally wounded. Imburden gives a harrowing account of the movement of the train, as follows, After dark I set out from Cashtown to gain the head of the column during the night. My orders had been peremptory that there should be no halt for any cause whatever. If an accident should happen to any vehicle, it was immediately to be put out of the road and abandoned. The column moved rapidly, considering the rough roads and the darkness, and from almost every wagon issued heart-rending wails of agony. For four hours I hurried forward on my way to the front, and in all that time I was never out of hearing of the groans and cries of the wounded and dying. Scarcely one in a hundred had received adequate surgical aid, owing to the demands on the hard-working surgeons from still worse cases which had to be left behind. Many of the wounded in the wagons had been without food for thirty-six hours. Their torn and bloody clothing, matted and hardened, was rasping the tender, inflamed, and still oozing wounds. Very few of the wagons had even a layer of straw in them and all were without springs. The road was rough and rocky from the heavy washings of the preceding day. The jolting was enough to have killed strong men if long exposed to it. From nearly every wagon as the teams trotted on, urged by whip and shout, came such cries and shrieks as these, O oh God! Why can't I die? My God! Will no one have mercy and kill me? Stop! Oh! For God's sake stop just for one minute! take me out and leave me to die by the roadside. I am dying. I am dying. My poor wife, my dear children. What will become of you? Dot. No help could be rendered to any of the sufferers. No heed could be given to any of their appeals. Mercy and duty to the many forbade the loss of a moment in the vain effort then and there to comply with the prayers of the few. On. On. We must move on. The storm continued and the darkness was appalling. There was no time to fill even a canteen of water for a dying man, for, except the drivers and the guards, all were wounded and utterly helpless in that vast procession of misery. When daylight came, the head of the column had reached Green Castle, having traversed about thirty miles, and it still had fifteen to go to reach Williamsport. Here began a succession of small attacks of the long train by citizens, and small detachments of federal cavalry, scouting in the country. At one point some citizens cut the spokes of a dozen wagons, but a guard sent back, arrested and took them off as prisoners of war. At another point about a hundred wagons were captured. The head of the column reached Williamsport in the afternoon and during the night the balance came up. Here it met two regiments of Johnson's division, returning from Staunton where they had escorted the prisoners taken at Winchester on the advance. Imburden required every family in the town to cook provisions for the wounded, under pain of having its kitchen occupied. The river was in flood and impassable except by two small ferry boats. Next morning he learned of the approach of five federal brigades of cavalry, about seven thousand men, with eighteen guns. The flanks of the city fortunately rested upon Greeks leaving only the north front to be defended. He armed about eight hundred teamsters and convalescents, and with the two regiments of infantry and his dismounted cavalry he marched about so as to create the impression of a large force. He put in the line all of his guns and brought over some ammunition in the ferry boats. A sharp fight ensued, the teamsters acquitting themselves handsomely. The enemy was driven back and held off until the approach of Stuart's cavalry in the afternoon caused the Federal cavalry to withdraw. As a precaution against such freshets, Lee had maintained a pontoon bridge at Falling Waters. But it was weakly guarded, and on June 5, a small raiding party, sent by French from Frederick, had broken it, and destroyed some of its boats, fortunately not all. The retreat of the army was, therefore, brought to a standstill just when 48 hours more would have placed it beyond pursuit. 
we were already nearly out of provisions, and now the army was about to be penned upon the river bank, and subjected to an attack at his leisure by me. All diligence was used to relieve the situation. The ferryboats were in use by day and by night carrying over, first, our wounded, and next 5,000 federal prisoners brought from Gettysburg. These were safely escorted on to Staunton by Imboden with a single regiment of infantry. Warehouses upon the canal were torn down, and from the timber new pontoon boats were being built to repair the bridge at falling waters. Meanwhile, the engineers selected and fortified a line of battle upon which we would make a last stand. A fairly good line was found with its right flank on the Potomac near Downsville, passing by St. James College and resting its left on the Conococic. Longstreet's corps held its right flank, Hill the center, and Ewell the left. On the 10th, Meade was approaching rapidly, driving in our advanced guards. An unfortunate affair occurred at Funkstown, where Anderson's Georgia Brigade, called upon to assist our cavalry, was so badly directed by them that a federal battery enfiladed the line, and a battery of our own horse artillery by mistake also fired into it. The brigade suffered 126 casualties. On the 11th, the army was ordered into position upon the selected line, Lee in person overlooking the placing of Longstreet's corps. I never before, and never afterward, saw him as I thought visibly anxious over an approaching action but I did upon this occasion. No one can say what might have been the result of a federal attack, for, although our supply of ammunition was low, we were on the defensive, and the temper of the troops was excellent for a desperate resistance. Meade's report indicates easy acquiescence in our retreat from Gettysburg. While the 6th Corps followed us to the vicinity of Fairfield on the 5th, picking up stragglers, the rest of the army remained on the battlefield for two days, employed in succoring the wounded and burying the dead. A third day was lost halting a day at Middletown to procure necessary supplies and to bring up the trains. Under ordinary circumstances Lee might now have been across the Potomac, but there were further rains on the 7th and 8th, and Lee's escape was exceedingly narrow. On the 13th, both his bridge and the ford near Williamsport were passable and orders were issued to make the crossing during that night. The river had fallen to a stage barely permitting infantry to ford, but about dark it again began to rise. Ewell's corps was ordered to cross by the ford. Longstreet, followed by Hill, was to cross by the pontoon bridge. Caissons were ordered to start from the lines at 5 p.m the infantry and artillery at dark. Meade might have attacked on the 12th but contented himself with reconnaissance. As a result of the reconnaissance of the 12th, he assembled his corps commanders and proposed a demonstration in force on the 13th by the whole army, to be converted into an attack if any opening was found. The opinion of a majority of his leading officers was so adverse to the proposition that Meade allowed himself to be persuaded, thus giving Lee the last day needed. Later in the day he repented and issued orders for a general advance on the 14th. It was made just a day too late. Lee had left only two guns stalled in the mud, and a few hundred stragglers broken down by the night march, short in distance, but rarely equal for its discomfort and fatigue. Another rainstorm had set in before dusk, and it kept up nearly all night. It was the dark period of the moon and the blackness of the night was phenomenal. The route to the bridge was over small farm roads, rough, narrow, and hilly. Already from the incessant rains they were in bad condition, and now, under the long procession of heavy wheels, churning in the mud, they became canals of slush in which many vehicles were hopelessly stalled. My command, between sunset and sunrise, was only able to cover about three miles, seldom moving more than a few yards at a time. Large bonfires on the banks were kept up to light the entrance upon the bridge, but in spite of them a wagon loaded with wounded ran off into the river. After daylight the weather cleared and better progress was made, the last of Hill's Corps crossing about 1 p.m. During the morning it was followed by the enemy who skirmished with our rear guard and picked up stragglers. In one of these skirmishes, a small body of Federal cavalry was allowed to approach within 200 yards of Heth's division under Pettigrew, 
who supposed them to be our own cavalry bringing up the rear. These, however, had passed without giving notice that they were the last. A Major Weber, of the 6th Michigan CAF, seeing but a small portion of the Confederate line, charged it with about 40 men. Weber was killed and nine tenths of his command shot down, but one of a few pistol shots which they fired gave a mortal wound to Jen. Pettigrew. He had been wounded in the hand on the 3D, and was unable to manage his horse, which reared and fell with him. In the act of rising, the fatal shot struck him. Ewell's corps reached Williamsport by the Hagerstown Turnpike and commenced fording the river by midnight. The artillery with an escort of one brigade was sent to cross the pontoon bridge. Rhodes's report describes the fording of the Potomac, as follows, My division waded the river just above the aqueduct over the mouth of the Conococig. The operation, was a perilous one. It was very dark, raining, and excessively muddy. The men had to wade through the aqueduct, down the steep bank of soft and slippery mud in which numbers lost their shoes and down in which many fell. The water was cold, deep, and rising, the lights on either side of the river were dim, just affording enough light to mark the places of entrance and exit. The cartridge boxes of the men had to be placed around their necks, some small men had to be carried over by their comrades, the water was up to the armpits of a full-sized man. All the circumstances attending this crossing combined to make it an affair, not only involving great hardship, but one of great danger to the men and company officers, but be it said to the honor of these brave fellows, they encountered it not only promptly but actually with cheers and laughter. We crossed without loss except of some 25,000 or 30,000 rounds of ammunition unavoidably wetted and spoiled. After crossing, I marched a short distance beyond falling waters and then bivouacked, and there ended the par. Campaign. It is not necessary to follow the march of the army from the Potomac via Front Royal and Culpeper to the line of the Rapidan, which it finally occupied. It is notable that Lee had not proposed to entirely withdraw from an aggressive attitude when he crossed the Potomac. His report states that he intended to cross the Blue Ridge into Loudonco where he might oppose Meade's crossing into Va, but that the Shenandoah was found to be impassable. While waiting for it to subside, the enemy crossed below and seized the passes he had designed to use. Not only this, but Meade also moved along the eastern slope, threatening to cut Lee off from Gordonsville and the railroad. Longstreet was pushed ahead and barely succeeded in crossing the Shenandoah in time to prevent the enemy from occupying Manassas and Chester Gaps through which Longstreet moved to Culpeper by July 24. Hill's corps soon followed, and Ewell, moving farther up the valley, crossed at Thornton's Gap. All were finally united behind the Rapidan on August 4, while the cavalry, under Stuart, held Culpeper, and the enemy held the line of the Rappahannock. The following tables of casualties furnish the best comparative indications of the amount of fighting which fell to the lot of different organizations. It is notable that six Confederate brigades were not severely engaged, and the 6th Federal Corps was scarcely engaged at all. The totals given are from the official returns of both armies, but the Confederate returns are known to be very incomplete. The best estimate of actual Confederate losses has been made by Livermore in numbers and losses in the Civil War. It is about 50% greater for the killed and wounded, and is attached here to. Confederate casualties. Gettysburg. Approximate by Brigade S. Confederate casualties. Gettysburg. Approximate by Brigade S. Confederate casualties. Gettysburg. Approximate by Brigade's Federal casualties. Gettysburg B Divisions Federal Casualties. Gettysburg B Divisions 1 Pender had been mortally wounded in the artillery duel of Hill's Corps during the afternoon of the 2D.1 B. And L. 387.1 Confederate eyewitnesses declared that Farnsworth, having fallen mortally wounded, was summoned to surrender, but refused and shot himself. His shoulder straps and papers were brought into our lines and the story told by reliable witnesses during the afternoon. Federal accounts, however, 
claim that the wounded officer who shot himself was not Farnsworth but a Captain Cushman who was left for dead on the field, but recovered and was killed in a later battle. Chapter 6 Battle of Chickamauga Position of the Confederacy after Gettysburg and Vicksburg. Reinforcements of Bragg. The armies before the Battle of Chickamauga. The Order of Battle. Engagement of the 19th. Battle of the 20th. Rosecrans is order to Wood. Longstreet's advance. The casualties. Thomas at Chattanooga. The Battle of Warhatchie. Bragg's position. Battle of Chattanooga or Missionary Ridge. Positions of the armies. The attack on the ridge. Bragg's retreat. The Knoxville campaign. Longstreet's semicolon S expedition. Fort Sanders and its garrison. Storming the fort. The retreat. Casualties of the campaign. Having rested at Culpeper from July 24 to 31, and then crossed the Rapidan to Orange Sea. H, where we could receive supplies by rail, Lee's army now recuperated rapidly from its exhaustion by the campaign of Gettysburg. There remained nearly five months of open weather before winter. The prospects of the Confederacy had been sadly altered by our failures at Gettysburg and Vicksburg. Grant would now be able to bring against us in Georgia Rosecrans reinforced by the army which had taken Vicksburg. To remain idle was to give the enemy time to do this. Once more the necessity was upon us to devise some offensive which might bring on a battle with approximately equal chances. Lee, accordingly, urged forward the building up of his own army with the design of an early aggressive movement against Meade. It must be admitted that the opportunity for such was slight. The enemy's fortified lines about Alexandria were too near, as was proven later, when in November an advance was actually attempted. But the Confederacy still held unimpaired the advantage of the interior lines, already spoken of as open to them in May, and then urged by Longstreet both upon Secretary Seddon and Lee. These still offered the sole opportunity ever presented the South for a great strategic victory. Already, however, Movements of the enemy were on foot which, in a few weeks, would enable them to close the shorter route from Richmond to Chattanooga via Knoxville, and leave us only the much longer and less favorable line via Weldon, Wilmington, and Augusta. Unfortunately, no one but Longstreet seems to have appreciated this, and he was very slow in again taking up the matter and urging it. It resulted that the movement, when attempted, was too late to utilize the short Knoxville line and that only five small brigades of infantry were transferred to the west in time to take any part in the hard-fought Battle of Chickamauga. This was consequently but another bloody and fruitless victory to be followed by a terrible defeat in a few weeks when the enemy's reinforcements had joined. It is first to tell of the dilatory consideration and slow acceptance of the proposed strategy which should have been decided upon even before Lee's army was again south of the Potomac, and every subsequent movement planned to facilitate it. It was not until about August 15, two weeks after the army was safe behind the Rapidan, that Longstreet again called the attention of Secchi said to the tremendous threatenings of the situation, and pointed out the one hope of escape which he could suggest. There seems to have been no reply. A few days later, in conversation with Lee, Longstreet again expressed his views. Lee was unwilling to consider going west in person, but approved the sending of Longstreet, and even spoke of his being given independent command there, if the War Department could be brought to approve. About August 23, Lee was called to Richmond, and was detained there by President Davis for nearly two weeks. During this time, Consent was given that Longstreet should go to reinforce Bragg against Rosecrans, but with only Hood's and McClellan's divisions, nine brigades, and my battalion of 26 guns. It was proposed to send this force from Louisa C. H. by rail to Chattanooga, via Bristol and Knoxville, a distance of but 540 miles and it was hoped that the movement could be made within four days. There was too little appreciation of the importance of time in the enterprise proposed, and it was not until September 9 that the first train came to Louisa C. H. to begin the transportation. On that day 2,000 Confederates under Gen. Frazier, 
who had been unwisely held at Cumberland Gap and allowed to be surrounded by a superior force, surrendered without a fight. Already Burnside had occupied Knoxville, leaving us only the long line via Petersburg, Wilmington, Augusta, and Atlanta, about 925 miles, with imperfect connections through some cities and some changes of gauge. The infantry was given precedence, and my battalion was marched to Petersburg, where it took trains about 4 p.m., Thursday, September 17th. At 2 a.m., Sunday, the 20th, we reached Wilmington, 225 miles in 58 hours. Here we changed cars and ferried the river, leaving at 2 p.m. The Battle of Chickamauga was being fought upon the 19th and 20th, only five of our nine brigades having arrived in time to participate. We reached Kingsville, S.C., 192 miles in 28 hours, changed trains in six hours, and got to Augusta, 140 miles, at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, the 22d. Leaving August to at 7 p.m., we reached Atlanta, 171 miles, at 2 p.m., Wednesday. Leaving at 4 a.m., Thursday, we were carried 115 miles and landed at Ringgold Station, 12 miles from the battlefield, at 2 a.m. on Friday, September 25th. Our journey by rail had been 843 miles and had consumed 7 days and 10 hours, or 178 hours. It could scarcely be considered rapid transit, yet under the circumstances it was really a very creditable feat for our railroad service under the attendant circumstances. We found ourselves restricted to the use of one long roundabout line of single track road of light construction, much of it of the stringer track of those days a 16-pound rail on stringers, with very moderate equipment and of different gauges, for the entire service at the time of a great battle of the principal armies of the Confederacy. The task would have taxed a double-tracked road with modern equipment. Its efficient performance was simply impossible, and the incomplete success we were able to obtain by getting five brigades of long streets infantry upon the field, without any of his artillery, shows the soundness of our strategy and is an earnest of what might have been accomplished, had a campaign upon our short interior lines been inaugurated in May, under Lee in person, instead of the unfortunate invasion of Pa. Indeed, it must be said of the battle itself, that the force upon the field was ample to have reaped the full fruits of victory, had its management been judicious. The story of the details, presently to be told is but another story of excellent fighting made vain by inefficient handling of an army hastily brought together, poorly organized, and badly commanded. It will be seen that the battle was opened by two divisions attacking the whole army of the enemy in a fortified position, the attack being made in a single line without supports at hand. They are defeated and put out of action for the day. Two more divisions try and fare little better. A fifth, in reserve sends in one brigade without result, four are not engaged. The morning is gone and the battle of the right wing is over. That of the left wing has scarcely begun. It advances, finds by accident a gap in the enemy's line, and drives off three divisions of the enemy. The left wing fights the rest of the enemy's army, three-fourths of it, until near dark, when both wings unite and drive the enemy off the field, darkness covering his retreat. It is the old familiar story of piecemeal attacks. On the arrival of Longstreet, Bragg's army would comprise five corps and a reserve division, organized as shown below. No exact returns of the total present for duty exist, but instead are given Livermore's estimates of the effective strength. One army of ten, Gen. Bragg. September the 19th to the 20th, 1863 Army of ten, Gen. Bragg, September the 19th to the 20th, 1863 Unlike the armies in Va, which had never considered themselves defeated, our Western army had never gained a decided victory. Naturally, therefore, Lee enjoyed both the affection and confidence of his men, while there was an absence of much sentiment toward Bragg. It did not, however, at all affect the quality of the fighting as shown by the casualties suffered at Chickamauga, 
which were 25% by the Confederates in killed and wounded, exclusive of the missing. Neither in armament, equipment, or organization was the Western Army in even nearly as good shape as the Army of Northern Virginia. About one third of the infantry was still armed only with the smoothbore musket, caliber .69. Only a few batteries of the artillery were formed into battalions, and their ammunition was all of inferior quality. Much has been said in the accounts of prior battles of the insufficient and unskilled staff service in the Army of Northern Virginia, even after many active campaigns. The Western armies generally had had far less opportunities to learn from experience, and fewer resigned ex army officers from the old U.S. Army among them, to organize and train their raw material. Several of Bragg's divisions had been recently brought together and were strangers to each other. Nearly all were unfamiliar with the country in which they found themselves, which was unusually wooded and hilly. Bragg, himself, was lacking in quick appreciation of features of topography. The organization of the Federal Army, with its strength present for duty before the battle, is given below, and also Livermore's estimate of the effective strength. Army of the Cumberland, Gen. Rosecrans, September the 19th to the 20th, 63 Comparing the two armies, we see that while Bragg's effective total, 66,326, is largely greater than Rosecrans, 58,222, it is due to Bragg's excess in cavalry, 6,182, which arm had little opportunity in the battle upon either side. Of infantry and artillery, Rosecrans had an excess of 1853 men and 30 guns, besides the superiority of his small arms and rifled artillery over the inferior equipment of the Confederates. It is well recognized that the defensive role is the least hazardous, and, on this campaign, Rosecrans, although on the strategic offensive, gladly seized the tactical defensive when Bragg incautiously gave him the privilege. Bragg's daily experience in the handling of his army should have warned him that it was not a military machine which could be relied upon to execute orders strictly, or to be alert to seize passing opportunities, and it is safe to say that its power for offense was scarcely 50% of what the same force would have developed upon the defensive. The position at Chattanooga held by Bragg at the beginning of the campaign was entirely untenable, as Rosecrans's line of approach, along the Nashville and Chattanooga RR, reaching the Tennessee River at Stevenson, threatened Bragg's communications for 40 miles south, and he was forced to fall back without a battle and take position where he might guard his communications. He withdrew from Chattanooga on September 8, and, moving south about 22 miles, disposed his forces in the vicinity of Lafayette and held the gaps in Pigeon Mountain, a spur of the Great Plateau of Lookout Mountain, running northeast, with McLemore's Cove between the two. Rosecrans was misled by Bragg's easy abandonment of Chattanooga into the belief that his retreat would be continued at least as far as Dalton, and perhaps to Rome. So, with little delay or caution, the federal troops were pushed forward in rapid pursuit. As the country was semi mountainous, well wooded, and but sparsely settled, neither commander proved able to keep himself fully informed of his adversary's movements. Each lost, therefore, possible opportunities of attacking isolated portions of his adversary with a superior force. The most important of these was lost by Bragg, who, on September 10 and 11, might have crushed in McLemore's Cove, parts of Thomas's and McCook's corps. Orders were issued for attacks, but there was no supervision of the necessary preparatory movements, and various obstacles intervened, until the enemy discovered his danger and made his escape. Bragg, in his official report, placed the principal blame for this failure upon Gen. Hindman, and preferred charges against him, which, upon further investigation, he subsequently withdrew. There can be no doubt that upon this occasion an opportunity was lost to the Confederates which might have won the campaign. But the loss was due entirely to the misfortune of inadequate organization, and lack of the trained staff, which alone can make an efficient army of any assemblage of troops. Of course, rumors of the sending of Longstreet with two divisions to reinforce Bragg, were sure to, and did, 
reach the enemy by many channels and from many sources. Even from the lines along the Rapidan, there were deserters and Negro servants who were well informed about all considerable movements. At Richmond and Petersburg, at Wilmington, Charleston, and Atlanta, the enemy, doubtless, maintained spies, and the coming of the reinforcements from Lee was no secret among Bragg's brigades, even long before their arrival. One would suppose, too, that the wisdom of such strategy would be so apparent that it would be easily guessed, on hearing that any movement was on foot. It is, therefore, worthy of note that the Federal War Department, where reports and rumors from all sources were brought together and studied, even as late as September 11, was inclined to believe that Bragg was reinforcing Lee. It was not convinced to the contrary until September 15. Before that, Rosecrans had discovered the proximity of Bragg's army and had hastened to concentrate his scattered divisions, some of which, mistaking the roads, made marches of fifty miles. The concentration took place in the valley of Chickamauga Creek, about twelve miles south of Chattanooga on the western slope of Missionary Ridge. Bragg, meanwhile, realizing something of his opportunities, made more than one effort to strike in detail some of the nearest federal divisions, but was unable to succeed. It was only on the night of the 17th that he finally issued an order for an advance in force upon the next day. Having waited so long, he had best have waited longer. Already he had given Rosecrans just the time needed to concentrate his entire army. Even a day sooner might have caught portions of it out of position and much exposed. But when the action opened on the 19th, not only was the whole Federal Army in hand, but most of it had fairly well entrenched itself. There was now no reason to hasten an attack, and there were two reasons for delay. First, by taking a threatening position, and using his superior force of cavalry upon Rosecrans's rear, he might have forced the Federals to attack, and Bragg's army, as has been said, was twice as powerful for defense as for offense. Second, he was now receiving reinforcements, averaging nearly a brigade a day. On the 19th, only Hood with three of Longstreet's veteran brigades had reached the field. Longstreet, in person with two more, arrived in time to take part on the 20th. McClers with four more brigades of infantry and 26 guns of the reserve artillery were close behind and were enough to have turned the evenly balanced scale in the battle. On September 15, Rosecrans's army was west of the Chickamauga, and had its right extended south beyond the left of Bragg's army. Bragg's right, at the same time, east of the Chickamauga extended north beyond Rosecrans's left. Either army, changing front to its left, might thus have turned the other's flank with great advantage, but neither was quite prepared to act promptly. Rosecrans, however, on the 17th, appreciated his own danger and began to extend his left and to draw down his right, practically moving his whole army to the left. This movement was continued during the night of the 18th and on the morning of the 19th. Before Bragg was prepared to open his attack, Rosecrans's left had occupied the strong ground chosen for it to rest upon, on Kelly's farm, about nine miles south of Chattanooga. From this point, the line extended to the Chickamauga at Lee and Gordon's Mill, about four miles, with the divisions in the following order from left to right Colon Brannan, Baird, Reynolds, Palmer, Van Cleve, Wood, with Nigley's division in reserve, and the three divisions of McCook's Corps, Davis, Johnson, and Sheridan, massed near Crawfish Spring, nearby on the right. At Rossville, Six miles from Chattanooga and about three north of Kelly's farm, was Granger's Reserve Corps, of three brigades, holding the very important gap at that point in Missionary Ridge. Bragg's order of battle was of the progressive or echelon type, and prescribed that the attack should be begun by his right column under Hood, which should cross at Reed's Bridge, and, turning to the left oblique, should sweep up the Chickamauga and be reinforced as it proceeded by Walker's and Buckner's Corps, crossing by Alexander's Bridge and Deadford's Ford. Meanwhile Polk, at Lee and Gordon's Mill, should press the enemy, bearing to the right where resistance was met, 
until a crossing was made at or between the Mill and Dalton's or Tedford's Ford. Hill's corps would watch the left flank and cross and attack the enemy's right if he attempted to reinforce his center. The cavalry would protect the flanks, Wheeler on the left and Forrest on the right. Cooking was ordered to be done at the trains, and cooked rations forwarded to the troops. This order seems simple, well conceived, and apparently as well adapted to surrounding conditions as it could have been made, but its execution, as will be seen, departed widely from the course prescribed. The right column under Hood, charged with the opening of the battle, was composed of three brigades of Hoods and three of Bushra Johnsons. In reaching their assigned positions, there was much delay to all of the columns, due to the bad and narrow roads through the forest, and, in addition, Hood's column was opposed by the enemy's cavalry, and had a preliminary skirmish at Peavine Church. At Reed's Bridge, and also at Alexander's, it was necessary to force the crossing, and both bridges were so injured by the enemy that fords somewhere in the vicinity had to be used to cross the stream. These delays consumed the whole of the 18th, and, at nightfall, Hood's six brigades and Walker's five bivouacked on the west side of the Chickamauga about a mile and a half in front of the Rossville and Lafayette Road, upon which Rosecrans began to arrive and take position before daylight on the 19th. Buckner's Corps, at Tedford's Ford, having been directed to delay until Hood and Walker were across, had, after a slight skirmish, gotten possession of both banks of the river at Tedford's, and also at Dalton's, a half mile to the left. Polk's corps and hills occupied the day in moving from the vicinity of Lafayette to their prescribed positions opposite the enemy's right. At dawn on the 19th, the division of Buckner began crossing at Tedford's and Dalton's, but, before they were ready to attack, the initiative was seized by the Federals, under the impression that only a single Confederate brigade was in front of them. Croxton's brigade, supported by the other two brigades of Brannan's division, was ordered to advance. This brought on the battle, which was waged all day with severe losses on each side, but with material success on neither. The entire Federal army was engaged, except two brigades. Of the Confederates, the brigades of Anderson, Dees, Manigault, Helm, Adams, Stuvel, Gracie, Trigg, Kelly, Gershaw, and Humphreys were not engaged. The fighting was desultory and without concert of action. From 7 a.m. until noon, there was a gap of about two miles between the 14th and 21st Federal Corps, which, had the Confederates discovered it, might have given them the victory. The fighting was kept up until dark. Longstreet arrived on the field at 11 p.m., having arrived at Catoosa Station about 4, and ridden without a guide, narrowly missing riding into the enemy. The battle was ordered to be renewed at daylight, but under a different organization. The army was now divided into two wings, the right under Polk, and the left under Longstreet. To Polk's wing was assigned Cheatham's division of his corps, and the corps of Hill and Walker with the cavalry under Forrest on the right. To Longstreet, Bragg gave the division of Hindman of Polk's corps, Johnson's division, Buckner's corps, and the five brigades of Hood's and McClure's divisions, with the cavalry under Wheeler on their left. This organization was adopted, because the troops were already approximately in the positions assigned, but it involved further subdivision of the command without any increase of staff and led to an unfortunate delay of some hours in opening the battle. This was to be begun by Hill's Corps at daylight. Sunrise was at 5.45. The orders were given by Bragg to Polk about midnight, but never reached Hill until 7.30 in the morning. The locations of the different commanders were not known to each other. When the orders to attack arrived, there were essential preparations still to be made, as the troops were not in position and two hours were consumed in getting them even approximately so. These hours were very precious to the enemy. All during the night, the noise of his axes had been heard felling trees and building breastworks of logs, and this work was kept up until the Federal right, under Thomas, occupied a veritable citadel, from which assaults by infantry alone could scarcely dislodge him. His divisions were in the following order from left to right. Baird of the 14th Corps, 
Johnson of the 20th, Palmer of the 21st, Reynolds of the 14th. These divisions occupied the breastworks above described, which ran north and south and were terminated at each end by wings extending well to the rear. Next on the right was Brannan's division of the 14th, and then Nigley's, of the same. Then came Sheridan and Davis of the 20th, and then Wood and Van Cleve of the 21st in reserve. At 9.30 a.m., Breckenridge moved to the attack and was soon followed by Cleburne. These two divisions were unfortunately placed in a single line and without any supports in the rear. They advanced in the following order from right to left, Adams, Stuvel, Helm, Polk, Wood, Deschler. The two right brigades of Adams and Stuvel were found to entirely overlap the enemy's line, and they pushed on slowly, and gradually swung to the left and came into collision with the retired portion of the enemy's line. Meanwhile, the center of Helm's brigade had struck the enemy's fortified line, and, after a severe fight in which Helm was killed, it was repulsed. The brigades of Adams and Stuvel were now entirely isolated, but maintained their aggressive until Adams was himself wounded and captured, when they were withdrawn, and the three brigades cut no further figure in the battle until late in the afternoon. Had Cleburne's division been behind this division in support, or even had their advance been simultaneous, there might have been a different story to tell. Its three brigades, Polk, Wood, and Deschler, were also in single line and advanced a little after the repulse of Helm. Polk and the right flank of Woods met the same fire which had repulsed Helm. Wood and Deschler advanced farther before they received it, but they were all driven back with heavy losses, which included Deschler himself. The contest was kept up for a long time, and was reinforced by the five brigades of Walker's division, who were brought up from the rear and put in at various points without making any serious impression. These brigades constituted the whole command of Polk in charge of the left wing, except the division of Cheatham which contained five brigades. Why neither Bragg or Polk put them in until after 6 p.m. is not explained. One would imagine that they would have been called upon before giving up the whole plan of the battle, which was now done. Originally, it had been designed to break the left flank of the enemy and then sweep him to the right. Now the effort will be to break the right flank and sweep to the left. And in this the right wing of the army will take no more part than the left wing has taken in the battle of the morning, and Cheatham's division will practically take none at all. About 11 a.m., Bragg finding the attack on the enemy's left making no progress, sent a staff officer down the lines with orders to every division commander to move upon the enemy immediately. The order was first delivered to Stuart's division of Buckner's corps. This formed two lines deep and two brigades front, with the aid of Wood's brigade of Cleburne's division on its right. The four brigades, Brown and Wood followed by Clayton and Bate, advanced together. The enemy were driven by this charge some 200 yards and lost a battery of guns. But here the impulse was gone and the advance stopped. Meanwhile, Longstreet had appealed to Bragg for permission to attack with his entire wing, and, consent being given, had formed Johnson's division with Fulton and McNair in front, with Gregg in the second line, and with Hood's division in a third line. Hindman's division formed on the left and about 11.30 a general advance was essayed. Preston's division was in reserve on the extreme left. It is now time to look in the federal ranks and see what was taking place there. Although the attack was only made at 9.30, and by only 12 brigades, and was resisted by Thomas with 12 brigades in fortified lines, yet, at 10.10 a.m., we find Garfield, Rosecrans's adjutant, writing to McCook to be prepared to support the left flank, at all hazards even if the right is drawn wholly to the present left. At 10.30 he called for help, and Sheridan's division was ordered to him. At 10.45, upon a further call, Van Cleve's division was also ordered to support him with all dispatch. Igley's division had withdrawn from its position in line to support Baird, and had been replaced by Wood's division making the order of the divisions, Baird, Johnson, Palmer, Reynolds, Brannan, Wood, Davis, Sheridan. 
About this time another message from Thomas reached Rosecrans that he was heavily pressed, and the aide who brought it informed Rosecrans that Brennan was out of line and Reynolds's right was exposed. On this Rosecrans dictated a message to Wood, the general commanding directs that you close up on Reynolds as fast as possible and support him. This order changed the issue of the battle. Reynolds's division was slightly echelined with Brannan's, but no one other than Reynolds considered it worthy of note. When Wood obeyed his order and reached the ground, Brannan was found to already occupy it, and Thomas sent Wood on to the support of Baird. Reynolds had blundered in his complaint, and Rosecrans had blundered in acting on it without reference to Thomas. On receipt of the order, Wood, leaving his skirmishers in front, started his division at a double quick to the left passing in rear of Brannan's division to reach the right of Reynolds. He had advanced but little more than a brigade length when Johnson's Confederate division, supported by Hood and Hindman, burst through the forest in front and fell upon the movement. Had this movement of Wood's division been foreseen by the Confederates and prepared for, it could not have happened more opportunely for them. Longstreet has been given great credit for it, which, however, he never claimed. It was entirely accidental and unforeseen, but in a very brief period it threw the entire left flank of the enemy in a panic. Longstreet's advance cut off the rear of Buell's brigade of Wood's division, and two brigades of Sheridan's advancing to fill the gap being opened behind Wood. These brigades did not make enough resistance to check the Confederates, whose triple lines could be seen advancing and who now followed the fugitives. Hindman's brigades, diverging to the left, routed the division of Davis and captured 27 guns and over 1,000 prisoners. Rosecrans, McCook, and Crittenden were all caught and involved in the confusion of a retreat which soon became a panic. It was not, however, pursued and might have halted and been reformed within a mile of the field without seeing the enemy. The retreat, however, was continued to Chattanooga. A severe check was sustained by Manigault, who attacked Wilder's brigade. This brigade had two regiments armed with Spencer repeating rifles, and the 29th ill. Serving with it on this occasion, carried the same arm. They occupied a very favorable position on a steep ridge and their fire at close quarters was very severe and drove back the first advance. Then, finding themselves isolated, they presently withdrew from the field. About this time, Longstreet was sent for by Bragg, who was some distance in rear of Longstreet's present position. The change in the order of battle was explained to Bragg and the route of two divisions of the enemy, and he was requested to draw the forces from the right wing to unite with the left, and move behind Thomas, where a gap of great extent had been opened, and drive him out of his fortified position. Bragg, however, was discouraged, and said there was no fight left in the right wing. Cheatham's division had not been engaged. Longstreet's account of the interview states, he, Bragg, did not wait, nor did he express approval or disapproval of the operations of the left wing, but rode for his headquarters at Reed's Bridge. There was nothing for the left wing to do but to work along as best it could. A pause in the fighting now ensued which the Federals employed in forming a new line for their center and right with the troops remaining on the field, comma Baird, Johnson, Palmer, and Reynolds, comma whose positions had not been changed, and Brannan, with fragments of Wood, Nigley, and Van Cleve. With these troops a short and very strong line was formed scarcely a mile in extent from right to left, and occupying favorable ground in the forest which gave it protection from artillery fire. In plan the right wing of this line covered two reenterant angles located on commanding ridges, from which they were able to deliver a plunging fire by volley, the ranks alternating with little exposure. During the afternoon they were reinforced by two brigades of Granger's division coming up from Rossville. Practically about two-thirds of the army, say 30,000 men under Thomas, here held together in a strong position and stood practically back to back while he repelled a series of desperate charges by the brigades of Anderson, Dees and Manigault, Gracie, Trigger and Kelly, Gregg, McNair and Fulton, and the five brigades of Longstreet, Gershaw, Humphreys, Law, Robertson and Benning, about 25,000. 
not more than half of these brigades were engaged at any one time. The bayonet was sometimes used, and men were killed with clubbed muskets. This was kept up from 2 to 6 p.m., during which time the infantry fire was incessant and tremendous. About 5 p.m. Longstreet succeeded in getting 11 guns under Williams into position, whence their fire could take in flank and rear the positions of Thomas's four left divisions, but the distance was about 900 yards, and the effect was not immediate. About 6 p.m. the Confederates on the right flank, who had lain quiet since noon, recovering from their severe punishment in the morning, prepared to make a general advance. About the same time, Thomas had taken warning from the artillery fire now coming in on his flank and rear and made preparations to withdraw his command. He had also received orders from Rosecrans to withdraw to Rossville, but had delayed to execute them until the last moment. It had now come, and had he delayed longer his losses would have been great. As it was, they were comparatively light. At some points there were severe struggles and at others there was little resistance but everywhere his lines were occupied and the triumphant Confederates celebrated their victory with such cheering as is said never to have been heard before. The table of casualties shows the heaviest percentages of the war. Deducting the missing, many of whom were prisoners, and also the losses of the cavalry, which were light, the killed and wounded among the infantry and artillery were 14,871 out of 47,520 or over 31% among the Confederates. Casualties Army of 10, Chickamauga, September 19th to 20th, 1863 Casualties Army of 10, Chickamauga, September 19th to 20th, 1863 Casualties Army of the Cumberland, Chickamauga, September 19th to 20th, 1863 Among the Federal Infantry and Artillery the killed and wounded were 11,243 out of 55,799, or an average of about 21%. No returns are given of the Confederate losses in the cavalry, but they were very light in the Federal cavalry, only 32 killed and 136 wounded, and there is no reason to suppose the many heavier among the Confederates. Apparently the forest paralyzed the cavalry of both armies. Very many of the reports of the Confederate brigadiers state the number of men engaged, and these statements, excluding cooking details, ambulance men, and stragglers, are more exact than the official returns, and are used in estimating the percentages of killed and wounded. In Gist's and Hood's divisions only no figures are given and here estimates have been made in round numbers. There is much discrepancy in the reports of the two commanders as to the guns, small arms, and prisoners taken. Bragg reports 51 guns and 15,000 stand of small arms. Rosecrans admits but 36 guns and 8,450 small arms, which is more probably correct. The Confederates were in the habit of exchanging their inferior guns and small arms on the field for the better ones of the enemy, leaving the old in their places. Some of these found on the field were by mistake assumed to be captured. A list of the 51 reported captured is given in the reports with the manufacturer's marks, and of these 15 appear as of Confederate make. Of prisoners, Bragg reports 8,000 while Rosecrans admits but 4,750. No accurate returns were made of the prisoners captured. The numbers were largely guesswork, the same prisoners being often claimed by more than one command. There is no reason to doubt the accuracy of Rosecrans's report. It gives, also, some interesting statistics of the ammunition expended which was but 7,325 rounds of artillery and 2,650,000 of infantry. The wooded character of the field is shown in the comparatively small amount of artillery ammunition which is said to have been 12,625 less than was expended at Stone River and is less than one-fourth of the federal expenditure at Gettysburg. On the morning of the 21st the army under Thomas was in position on Missionary Ridge, about Rossville, five miles in rear of the field of the day before. Here it took position and awaited attack all day, but none was made. 
Longstreet reports that he advised crossing the Tennessee River and moving upon Rosecrans's communications, and that Bragg approved and ordered Pugh's wing to take the lead, while his wing cared for the wounded and policed the field. The army, however, was in such confusion and need of ammunition that it was dark before the rear of Pugh's corps was stretched out upon the road, and Longstreet's march was postponed until the 22d. During the night, Thomas withdrew into the city which was already partially fortified, and was now easily made impregnable. Bragg followed on the 22d and took position in front of him, Longstreet's scheme of moving across the Tennessee River on Rosecrans's communications he deemed impracticable and dropped it. The town was not invested closely, but position was taken on Missionary Ridge and Lookout Mountain, about three miles out, with the intention of compelling the evacuation of Chattanooga by cutting it off from its base of supplies at Stevenson, Alabama. The shortest and best road came via Jasper, crossed the river at Kelly's Ferry, and, recrossing at Brown's Ferry, found itself directly opposite Chattanooga on the north side of the river, about 40 miles from Stevenson. But this road could not be used. Below Kelly's Ferry it skirted the river and was commanded by small arms from the south side. This compelled the enemy to cross Walden's Ridge to get by, adding many miles to their journey over exceedingly rough country. The importance of holding strongly the country between the two ferries, Kelly's and Brown's, seems never to have been appreciated by either Bragg or Longstreet, who had charge of the left wing of the army. The duty was confided to a single small brigade. Laws, of Hood's division, which was sent around the toe of Lookout Mountain for the purpose. A full division at least should have guarded so important a point, and one so exposed. One the opportunity to blockade the wagon traffic was not at once understood by the Confederates, and it was October 11th before it was fully enforced. After that date, wagons were often eight days in bringing a load from Stevenson, and reduced rations were issued to the Federals. Wheeler's cavalry in a raid had destroyed most of the transportation of the 14th Corps, but was itself nearly destroyed by the opportunity of plundering the wagons. Couriers reported that from Bridgeport to the foot of the mountains the mud is up to the horses' bellies. On the 6th Rosecrans reported the possession of the river is a sign qua non to the holding of Chattanooga. Reconnaissances and preparations were made, and on the night of the 27th a flotilla of pontoons carrying about 1,500 men under Hazen, was floated down and landed at Brown's Ferry. On the north side a force was marched by land to meet them, and a pontoon bridge was built. By morning a brigade with artillery was established and fortifying itself in a strong position on the southern bank. Before Bragg could concentrate enough to attack them, Hooker appeared, coming from Bridgeport with the 11th and 12th Corps of the Army of the Potomac. These had been hurried out to reinforce Rosecrans, when the Federals realized that Longstreet had reinforced Bragg. This, of course, put an end to the contemplated attack, but, with very questionable judgment, Bragg ordered a night attack upon a portion of Geary's division of the 12th Corps, about 1,500 strong with four guns which had encamped at a point called Warhatchee. This was about three miles from Brown's Ferry, where Hooker, with the remainder of his force, had united with the force under Hayes and dot the Battle of Warhatchee night attacks are specially valuable against troops who have been defeated and are retreating. They are of little value under any other circumstances. The war, too, had now reached a stage where men had become impossible to replace in the Confederate ranks. Nothing could be more injudicious than to sacrifice them, even for a success, which would have no effect upon the campaign. That was the case in this instance. Near at hand, the Federals had double or treble the force of the Confederates, and the camp to be attacked was two miles within the Federal lines. The attack must be made, the fruit of it be gathered, and withdrawal accomplished before the light of dawn, for with the dawn, or even before it, an overwhelming force of the enemy would cut off the withdrawal. The only troops available for the attack were four brigades of Hood's division, under Jenkins, which had been brought around the high toe of Lookout Mountain. This road was exposed to batteries on the north side of the river and could only be used at night. 
three of the brigades, Law, Benning, and Robertson, had suffered severely, both at Gettysburg and Chickamauga, and scarcely averaged 700 men each. These brigades were ordered to cross Lookout Creek, and seize the road between Hooker's camp near Brown's Ferry and the camp of Geary to be attacked. The remaining brigade was Jenkins's own, now under Bratton, and was about 1800 strong. Law, with two regiments, had opposed Hazen's landing on the 27th, and skirmished on the 28th with the advance of the 11th and 12th Corps under Hooker, but had now withdrawn across Lookout Creek. From the mountains above, a fine view was afforded of the valley with Hooker's camp at the north end, and Geary's three miles behind it. Jenkins had been summoned before sundown to view it and get some idea of the topography. He returned after dark and joining Law discussed the enterprise, which Law strongly advised against. The orders, however, were peremptory and there was no superior at hand to appeal to. The moon was about full, and soon after dark Law moved with his brigade across the bridge and, after some time spent in exploration, took position on a ridge nearly parallel to the road between Brown's Ferry and Warhatchie, and some 50 to 150 yards distant. It was about two miles below the camp of Geary's division, and less than a mile above the encampments of the 11th and 12th Corps. The Texas Brigade reporting to law. He placed two of its regiments on his left and one on his right, and sent the 4th Regiment to hold the bridge in his rear. Benning's brigade was sent to ambush the road farther ahead. This effort to hold the road against efforts to reinforce Geary might have been much more effective had Law thrown his brigades boldly across the road, with perhaps two brigades in his front line supported by the third in a second line. He probably failed to adopt this policy only because he was too conscious of his weakness. His retreat was more assured and easier from the position which he took. And, in view of the risks attendant on the venture, and the small chances of success, it may have been the more prudent course. In the placing of Law's command, there had been a few picket shots about 10 o'clock, which had caused Geary's command to be put under arms and to be unusually alert. Soon after midnight, their own picket challenged and was shot down, upon which the camp was alarmed, all lights extinguished and the troops formed in line. The weather was somewhat cloudy, making the moonlight fitful. Jenkins endeavored to restrain his men from firing as they deployed before the camp, but it was in vain, and gradually the regiments extending on each side overlapped the Federal line and awaited an attack on the Federal rear by Lieutenant Col. T. M. Logan, with a force of sharpshooters, who had passed around to the rear. Their attack was to be a signal for a general charge. About an hour had now elapsed. It was just at this juncture that Jenkins gave orders to withdraw. Law had notified him that the enemy had passed his position, which was a mistake. The road had been open all the while, but no troops had passed. On the opening of the attack upon Geary, there had been a general alarm in all the camps below, and several brigades had been ordered to go to his relief. The 1st Brigade passing Law's ambush received volleys which, in the darkness, did little harm but threw their lines into confusion. Forming then parallel to the road, the Federals charged Law's position, but were at first repulsed. Reforming, and extending their lines, Steinway's division made a second attempt, but Smith's brigade, which struck Law's front, was again repulsed with heavy loss. The men, however, did not on this occasion fall back to the foot of the hill, but rallied in the darkness of the woods, near at hand, until a part of the 136th NY, which had overlapped Law's front, had appeared in his rear. The attack being then renewed was successful all along the line, and Law fell back toward the bridge, not being pursued. Robertson, who had had eight casualties, and Benning, who had had none, also withdrew as the retreat of law compelled. Meantime, in the confusion of the night a column of two federal brigades, ordered to go direct to Geary's help, had halted without orders, and was overlooked for nearly two hours. Owing to this oversight, and the non-pursuit of law, 
both he and Jenkins were able to cross the bridge before daylight. No artillery was used by the Confederates, but Knapps's battery of four guns, with Geary, was severely engaged at close quarters, expending 224 rounds and losing three killed and 19 wounded. Geary's total casualties were colon 34 killed, 174 wounded, 8 missing total 216. These all occurred in Green's and Cobham's brigades about 1,600 strong. The federal casualties in the brigades opposing law were colon 45 killed, 150 wounded, 7 missing, total 204. These occurred principally in Tyndale's and Orland Smith's brigades. The aggregate was 420. The Confederate casualties reported are as follows colon law, 3 killed, 19 wounded, 30 missing, total 52. Jenkins, 31 killed, 286 wounded, 39 missing, total 356. Aggregate 408. The character of the attack by Jenkins's brigade, and of the defense by Greens and Cobham's, aided by the battery, had been excellent. The casualties were heavy, and included many officers distinguished among their comrades for conduct. Nothing less could have been expected, and nothing materially more could be hoped for, and such considerations should have forbidden this adventure. The guarding of the rear by law proved a success, though due to a federal mistake, not to his disposition. Only about half his force was engaged. It repulsed two attacks but was swept away by the third. The enemy, however, made no advance and a free road, left open until after daylight, provided an escape for all four brigades from one of the most foolhardy adventures of the war. A court of inquiry in the 11th Corps was held, which found that Krzyzanowski's brigade had halted without authority and against the orders of the division commander when under orders to go to Geary's assistance. These operations left Rosecrans with free communications by the shortest and best roads, and at liberty to receive all the reinforcements coming to him. Besides the 11th and 12th Corps, under Hooker, already near at hand, it was known that Grant was bringing up a large force under Sherman from Memphis, and it was clear that within 30 days a force would be concentrated against us sufficient to overwhelm us. Rosecrans had now converted Chattanooga into a citadel, impregnable to assault by storm, within which he could confidently await the accumulation of whatever force was needed. The burden of the attack was upon us. We must promptly take the aggressive, and meet and defeat, either Grant and Sherman approaching from the west, or Burnside, near at hand and threatening on the east, and be able then to reconcentrate our army against the other adversaries. President Davis had recently paid a visit to the army, which, it was known, was dissatisfied with Bragg as a commander, but after some investigation had decided to sustain him. Bragg, accordingly, had the decision of the question what should be done. On November 30, he issued orders for Longstreet's Corps, with Wheeler's cavalry, to attack Burnside's Corps at Knoxville which was to be assailed at the same time by a force of perhaps 4,000 men on ransom, coming from southwest Virginia. With the remainder of his army, Bragg proposed to hold his present lines, in front of Chattanooga, during the absence of Longstreet's division. As these lines occupied a concave front of fully eight miles against an enemy concentrated within four, they were necessarily weak and unable to quickly reinforce threatened points. Longstreet pointed out their disadvantages and urged a withdrawal of the remainder of the army to a strong defensive position behind the Chickamauga River, and that his own force for the attack of Burnside at Knoxville should be increased to 20,000 men, to ensure quick and easy work, and save any dependence upon the hypothetical force from southwest Virginia. Bragg, however, overruled all suggestions, and Longstreet was put in motion on November 4 for Knoxville with Wheeler's two divisions, four brigades, of cavalry. The result was what might have been expected, and we may anticipate and record it, briefly, before following Longstreet in his adventure against Knoxville. The Battle of Chattanooga or Mission e Ridge on October 22nd Grant had reached Chattanooga and superseded Rosecrans. 
By November 20 he had concentrated at Chattanooga about 65,000 infantry and artillery present for duty, and provided siege artillery for the forts about Chattanooga. Bragg, meanwhile, had further reduced his force by sending Bushrod Johnson with two brigades, 2,500 men, to Knoxville, who joined Longstreet just too late to be of any service. This had reduced his force to about 40,000 infantry present for duty, greatly handicapped by their position in the Long Concave exterior line. On November 22 Grant took the aggressive and set on foot attacks upon Bragg's extreme right and left flanks. On the morning of the 24th Hooker turned the extreme left flank at Warhatchee, in the valley of Lookout Creek, by climbing the slope of Lookout Mountain to the foot of the palisade. This palisade is a precipice dividing the top of the mountain from the slopes forming its toe. These were held by one brigade of Bragg's infantry who were advanced some distance down the slope. Advancing along the foot of the precipice he took the Confederate positions on the toe of the mountain in reverse. They were also exposed to artillery fire from the front across the river and were thus surely driven out, about as fast as Hooker's men could pick their way along the steep slopes at the foot of the precipice, which bounded the mountain on the west. Ten miles away on the right flank, Chickamauga Creek emptied into the Tennessee by two mouths, and, in the eastern mouth of the creek, Grant had concealed a number of pontoons, and behind the hills north of the river was Sherman with over three divisions. On the morning of November 24 a bridge was built across the Tennessee and 12,000 men were brought across and made a lodgment on the east end of Missionary Ridge, before Bragg was aware of it. At sunrise, on the 25th, both Hooker and Sherman were ordered to attack. When Hooker advanced it was discovered that during the night of the 24th, the Confederate forces had abandoned Lookout Mountain and withdrawn all of their men across Chattanooga Creek, burning the bridge. Hooker followed in pursuit with three divisions, Oster Horses, Crofts, and Geary's, about 10,000 men. About four hours were lost in rebuilding the bridge. Beyond it, only a feeble resistance was developed near Rossville on the western extremity of Missionary Ridge by two regiments of Stewart's division. Stevenson's division, which had held Lookout Mountain, had been transferred during the night to the extreme right to oppose Sherman. Hooker placed Osterhaus on the right of the ridge, Croft on the ridge, which being narrow he occupied with three lines, and Geary on the left or front of the ridge. In this formation he advanced almost unopposed and with slight loss until he connected about sundown with Johnson's division of the 14th Corps which had formed a part of Thomas's attack upon the center in the afternoon, as will presently be described. Sherman had had the entire day of the 24th practically unmolested to establish himself on the northern extremity of Missionary Ridge, and reinforcements from Chattanooga had reached him in the afternoon. Soon after sunrise on the 25th he moved to the attack. A wide depression in the ridge separated the portion of it which he occupied from that held by Bragg. Here, during the afternoon and night, Hardy had entrenched Cleburne's division and prepared to make a desperate stand. Sherman's men, fresh from Vicksburg, attacked with great vigor, and being repulsed, renewed the attack several times with no better success. Sherman, in his report, denies that they were repulsed, but says, not so. The real attacking columns of Gen. Course, Col. Loomis, and Gen. Smith were not repulsed. They engaged in a close struggle all day, persistently, stubbornly, and well. This is one way of stating it. Their charges were all driven back, with losses more or less severe, to the nearest places affording cover. From these they kept up musketry fire, with little loss or execution, all the rest of the day. Some reinforcements sent on the flanks did similarly and before three o'clock in the afternoon Sherman's whole force had been fought to a standstill, and Cleburne held his position intact and with very little fighting the rest of the day. But Grant's third attack, the one upon the center, was yet to be made. It was to be upon Missionary Ridge and the topography requires some description. The ridge is here an average of some two hundred feet high, with steep slopes, averaging on each side fully five hundred yards wide. 
many ravines and swales intersect the surface, which had been wooded but was now recently cleared, leaving many stumps. When the position was first occupied, a line of breastworks had been built at the foot of the slopes, between one and a half and two miles from the federal lines. Later some unfinished breastworks were erected halfway up the hill. The Confederate engineers now seemed at a loss to decide exactly where to make their final stand, and only at the last did they decide to make it at the proper place, at the top of the hill. But with it they made the fatal mistake of dividing their forces, already too small, and putting one half in their skirmish line, at the bottom of the hill, and the other half at the top. Very few of the Confederate reports of this battle have been preserved, but many interesting details are given in papers, left by Gen. Manigault of SC, who commanded a brigade in Hindman's division. The construction of the works was only begun on the 23d, with a very insufficient supply of tools. The ground was hard and rocky, and when the assault was made on the 25th, the trenches were but half completed and only afforded protection to the lower part of the body. The Confederate engineer who laid it out had orders to locate the line upon the highest ground, and blindly obeyed. At many places this left numerous approaches, up ravines and swales, entirely covered from the fire of the breastworks. Manigault persuaded the engineer, who complained of having too much to do, to allow him to lay out his own line and at such places he located the line below the crest so as to sweep the whole approach. Brigades to the right and left did not do this, and there were many places where an assaulting column could approach within a short distance without receiving any fire. The fatal mistake of dividing the force seems to have been decided on during the night of the 24th, for it was not done until the morning of the 25th. One half of each brigade was then sent to the line at the foot of the hill and the remainder to the line at the top. This disposition of forces was made in all the troops on the ridge, and the number available gave, in each position, only a single rank, with the men about one pace apart. Private instructions were given the superior officers, if attacked by more than a single line of battle, to await the enemy's approach within two hundred yards, then to deliver their fire, and retire to the works above. This was an injudicious order as will be seen, impracticable of successful execution after the enemy had gotten that near in such large force. About noon the enemy began to form in masses in front of our center, about two miles away. About two o'clock these masses deployed and formed two lines of battle, with a front of at least two and a half miles. After completing their arrangements these moved within a mile of our lower works and halted. Behind these two lines a reserve force apparently equal in number to one of them, was disposed at intervals in close columns of regiments, and followed them some three hundred yards in rear. The whole array was preceded by a powerful line of skirmishers deployed at half distances. One could not but be struck with the order and regularity of the movements and the ease with which the Federals preserved their lines. The sight was a grand and impressive one the like of which had never been seen before by anyone who witnessed it. Manigault writes, I felt no fear for the result, even though the arrangements to repel the attack were not such as I liked, neither did I know at the time that a column of the enemy was at that moment on our left flank and rear, or that our army numbered so few men. I think, however, that I noticed some nervousness among my men as they beheld this grand military spectacle, and I heard remarks which showed that some uneasiness existed, and that they magnified the host in their view to at least double their number. The reference made to the column of the enemy at that moment on our left flank and rear is to the three divisions under Hooker, advancing from Rossville on both sides of Missionary Ridge. They were due to reach the field about sundown. For some time after the last halt of the enemy, there was an ominous silence over the whole field, except for an occasional distant cannon shot. Sherman's battle, from one to two miles to the right, had been fought out. Hooker was marching cautiously unopposed, and, by a sort of tacit understanding, even the skirmishers in front paused in contemplation of the coming storm. The attack on the Confederate center was assigned to Thomas, who had been in readiness all the morning, but was still delayed by Grant, 
who hesitated to order it until either Sherman had turned our right flank or Hooker had turned our left. Hooker was delayed and does not seem to have been heard from. Sherman had been fought to a standstill, but thinking that he saw reinforcements moving from the Confederate center against Sherman, Grant directed Thomas to give the signal. It was a dozen guns, fired by the enemy, and was followed by the opening of their whole line, and soon after by our own guns from Missionary Ridge directed at the dark masses of their troops. The effect of a plunging fire, however, from our high elevation, was distinctly less than it would have been upon a plain, and when the enemy's lines were set in motion, which soon followed, it was apparent, at a glance, that our artillery was utterly inadequate to the task of stopping the great force before us. Meanwhile one half of the whole Confederate force was under secret orders to retreat when the enemy arrived within 200 yards, and the enemy's generals were themselves under orders from Grant not to advance beyond our skirmish line. Manigault thus describes what took place, when the enemy had arrived within about 200 yards our men gave their volley, and a well-directed and fatal one it proved, but then followed a scene of confusion rarely witnessed, and only equaled at a later hour on that day. The order had been issued to retire, but many did not hear it, owing to the reports of their own pieces and the deafening roar of artillery. Others supposed their comrades flying and refused to do likewise, some feared to retire up the hill, exposed to a heavy fire in their ear, feeling certain, as their movements must be slow, that they would be killed or wounded before reaching their friends above. All order was lost, and each striving to save himself took the shortest direction for the summit. The enemy seeing the confusion and retreat moved up their first line at a double quick and came over the breastworks, but I could see some of our brave fellows firing into the enemy's faces and at last falling overpowered. The troops from below at last reached the works exhausted and breathless, the greater portion so demoralized that they rushed to the rear to place the ridge itself between them and the enemy. It required the utmost efforts of myself and other officers to prevent this, which we finally succeeded in doing. Many fell, broken down from overexertion, and became deathly sick or fainted. I noticed some instances of slight hemorrhage, and it was fifteen minutes before the nervous systems of those men were so restored as to be able to draw a trigger with steadiness. In the meantime, Grant had observed the battle from his commanding position in the rear. As above said, he thought he had seen Bragg detaching troops from his center, opposite Thomas and sending them to reinforce the right opposite Sherman, and many federal reports, ever since, have fallen into the same error. But all are wrong. Sherman had been fought to a standstill, and Cleburne had no need for reinforcements. Also, Thomas's preparations could be seen too plainly. So the elaborate strategy, which had sent Sherman to turn Bragg's right, came to naught at the fighting point. Grant had seen, with much satisfaction, the Confederate lower line of entrenchments in the possession of his forces. But, as he looked, he was surprised to see, at a number of points, that his men had not halted as he had ordered, but were beginning to climb the slope and advance against the fortified line at the crest. He asked angrily, who ordered those men up the hill? And, when all present disclaimed it, said, someone will suffer for it if it turns out badly. But the men themselves, having reached the designated position, were able to take a more practical view of it than the general himself at a distance. It would be impossible for the troops to remain in the new position under the fire of the Confederate line at the top of the hill. There was nothing to do but to follow the fugitives and endeavor to mingle with them. As the pursuers advanced, they soon appreciated the fact that the ravines and swales afforded more or less protection from fire, and the whole line soon divided and concentrated itself on about six separate lines of advance. Not one of these was on the front held by Manigault's brigade. Every attempted advance here had been met with fire, before which it either fell back to cover, or disappeared to the right or left. Next on the left was Patton Anderson's brigade of Mississippians and next on the right was Dewey's brigade of Alabamians. A large number of Federals soon found shelter behind some overhanging rocks in Dewey's front within twenty yards of his line of battle. 
Manigault turned a gun upon them and they were driven from view, but beyond a turn of the rock, they got a lodgment in large numbers, so that the division commander called for and took Manigault's largest regiment to reinforce these. Meanwhile an officer from the left reported that the enemy had broken the miss. Brigade, and, going to the left to get a view, Manigault saw the Federals in possession of the miss, battery and the brigade retreating in disorder. The Federals soon turned the captured guns upon his line, enfilading a portion of it, and about the same time the Alabamians on the right also gave way. His own men on the flanks were still fighting well, but the center, the part being enfiladed, even now wavering, would soon melt away. A ridge some 500 yards to the rear offered favorable ground for a rally, and, seeing that all was lost and to check the fugitives impossible, he commanded a retreat directing the officers to rally the men upon that ridge. A rapid run for it was successfully made, with some loss under a heavy fire, but about two-thirds of what was left of the brigade were rallied on the ridge, and were soon joined by the remnants of the Alabama and Miss. Brigades. Manigault saved two of his guns, but two were captured. The enemy seemed contented with his success and did not pursue and the firing ceased all along the line except at the extreme right, where Cleburne and the troops opposing Sherman still held their ground until withdrawn after dark. Considering how utterly the center of his line was rooted, Bragg made a surprisingly good retreat, the enemy not pursuing vigorously. Bragg crossed the Chickamauga that night, destroying the bridges behind him. On the 26th, he retreated to Ringgold where on the 27th he repulsed a pursuing force which then retired. The army then withdrew to Dalton, where, five days later, Bragg, at his own request, was relieved of the command. He lost his campaign primarily when he allowed Rosecrans to reopen the short line of his communications. Sending Longstreet to Knoxville while holding such advanced lines cannot be excused or palliated. It was a monumental failure to appreciate the glaring weakness of his position. His men never really fought except against Sherman on his extreme right, and there they were victorious and retreated unmolested after night. He was simply marched out from his position on lookout, and he would have been also marched off of Missionary Ridge by Hooker, had not Grant grown impatient. The unwise division of his forces had put it in Grant's power to defeat him by marching with at least 50% less than the usual fighting. Bragg's casualties were but 361 killed and 2,160 wounded, about the average of a single corps or one sixth of those at Chickamauga. But he lost 40 guns. Grant's losses were also but small, on Lookout Mountain and on Missionary Ridge. They were heaviest where Sherman attacked Cleburne's and Breckenridge's divisions, but even the where the fighting was prolonged most of the day, there were no such casualties as there had been at Chickamauga. Grant's total was 753 killed, 4,722 wounded, 349 missing. Total 5,824. Livermore estimates the forces engaged on each side as follows: Cole on the Knoxville campaign on November 3rd, as has been told, Longstreet was ordered to march against Burnside and E. Tennessee, with McClaws and Hood's divisions of infantry, Alexander's and Lydon's battalions of artillery, of 23 and 12 guns, and five brigades of cavalry under Wheeler with 12 guns. This force numbered about 15,000, of which about 5,000 were cavalry and 10,000 infantry and artillery. Cooperation was promised from Southwest Va. by a force of about 4,000 under ransom, but it was too late in starting, and its infantry and artillery only reached Longstreet on his retreat northward after the siege of Knoxville. 